Welcome to Module 1, the introduction. We will start and first talk about what AWS certifications are currently available and also cover what is the recommended order if you choose to stick with AWS for a longer time. We will next cover the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Exam Official Exam Blueprint and highlight important information related to the exam. By the end of this module, you will also have your very own AWS free tier account created, ready to be used when we will progress through hands-on labs during the course. We will wrap up module 1 after installing a few applications on your Mac or Windows operating system PC that will come up real handy later in the course. With that said, let's get started. Alright, the rest of the course is quite hands-on, so you will need an AWS account. Please open a browser and navigate to aws.amazon.com slash free and we will go through the registration process right now. You are now on the AWS free tier account landing page. Just click on create a free account. So first thing first, create an AWS account. You will need to fill in all of the email, password, confirm password details and give your AWS account a name. After that, just click on continue. Next in the process is the contact information page. You will need to choose between professional and personal account type. So select professional if you intend to use this AWS account within your company, educational institution or organization, otherwise select personal. For this uh, training you will need to create a personal account, no need for professional. Fill in the name, phone number, full address and then agree with the terms by clicking this box. When you're done, please click on create account and continue. Next is the payment information page. Just in case you go over the AWS free tier limits, AWS should be able to charge you somehow. So that's why they are asking now the credit card number details. Please go ahead and fill in all of the details and when you're done, click on secure submit. Next, let's confirm our identity. As you can see, before you can use your AWS account, you must verify your phone number. When you continue, the AWS automated system will contact you with a verification code. So fill in the cell phone number and then go for the verification AWS is asking for. Great, your identity has been verified successfully. Please click on continue. Now you would need to select a support plan. AWS offers a selection of support plans to meet your needs. Choose the support plan that best aligns with your AWS usage. Now for this course, the basic plan, which is free actually, it's everything that we need. So now please click on free. Excellent. So the registration process was successfully completed. We can now just click on sign in to the console and we will get our first look to the AWS management console. Congratulations, well done, you are now in the AWS Management Council. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will install some additional software on your Mac. Now if you are a Windows user you may just skip this section and move on to the next one which is absolutely dedicated to Windows operating system users. Now you will see that throughout the course we will deploy some test web servers which are actually EC2 instances in AWS, so virtual machines. And we will use the terminal app. This is the built-in app that comes by default with your macOS operating system. Now, once we deploy the VM instances, so the EC2 instances, we will build different web pages in these web servers and we will use some kind of a text editor, either using the default one or more advanced one like TextMate and Text Wrangler. Let's now go ahead and install TextMate application. So again, one of the options is TextMate from Macromates. If you go to macromates.com, you will be able then to download TextMate 2.0 as of today. And let's do that right now. Now here it is, I'm using TextMate. And let's make a short comparison as opposed to the by default text edit application. As you can see, this will be, for example, the, um, the index.html, so the file in order to define our first web server on AWS. If you're using the default application, text edit, 
there is nothing here making it special. On the other hand, the TextMate is a more advanced application that can really differentiate between uh, your, your code. So for example, the HTML body and the header are with different colors, as you can see, as opposed to the, the text that defines the web page. As I just mentioned, when connecting to any EC2 instance on AWS, you don't need to install any additional software. We will use Terminal app, which comes by default with your macOS operating system. So just click on it, it will open and it is now ready to use. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we are going to prepare your Windows PC for the rest of the course. Let's now talk about authentication. So usually when we hear authentication, we think of username and password. And one good example is when you authenticate in your email account. You provide your username, which maybe is your, um, your email address. And also you provide your password and then you are able to access your emails. Now with your AWS EC2 instances, as you will see in the course, authentication is done a bit differently. Indeed, you are going to use a username, but for the password, you are going to use a file. This is called the key pair file. If you are going to use PuTTY, a software program that we will install shortly, then you will need to use uh, the key pair file in a PPK format. Now, let's talk about Amazon EC2 uh, authentication process. So Amazon EC2 uses public key cryptography to encrypt and decrypt login information. Let's talk about this now. So the public key to encrypt a piece of data is being used, which means that as the name implies, the key is public. Anyone can encrypt data and send it to you. On the other hand, you as the recipient, you have the private key, which is different from the public key, and only you can decrypt the data and actually read what's inside the packet. The public and private keys are known as a key pair. So this is why it's called a key pair, because there are actually two keys used in the authentication process. The public key again is used for encrypting the data and the recipient is going to use the private key to decrypt the data and read the clear text. Now, for the Windows operating system tools, we are going to use uh, PuTTY, also Mobile Xterm, and for the text editor, Notepad++. We are going to create a keeper in AWS and we are going to export it. And by default, when you export it, it comes in the PEM format. If for the rest of the course you are going to use PuTTY, and I will show you right away what it is, then you will need to uh, change the, the keeper file from the PEM format to the PPK format. And we are going to use this PuTTY or Mobile Xterm, which is my, my favorite one, in order to authenticate, to get access into the EC2 instances. Now, what is it uh, with this SSH? This is a new term. And if you're new in the IT world, then SSH means secure shell. And it is a protocol that allows you to securely access resources, so servers, VMs, machines, uh, that are remote at quite a distance to you. It may be like uh, in your same on-premises uh, company data center, or a thousand kilometers away. Now for the text editor, the most common one or uh, the, the most spread one is Notepad++ and this is for, for Windows. And this again, it's the same for the code that we are going to build. And by the way, do not worry about the code building the web pages that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm going to provide you all the code uh, necessary. So no coding experience necessary here. But again, it's a more advanced text editor and it, it will differentiate between the actual code and a regular text that you, uh, you're going to put there in your files. So now let's go ahead and do the installation of this software. So here I am on my Windows machine in, uh, in Google Chrome. Let's now type for PuTTY and go for the download PuTTY and you can download PuTTY here. It will land you this page. Most probably you have a 64-bit machine. So click on PuTTY 64-bit. And here is the, uh, the PuTTY software is being downloaded. Now the next one is Notepad++. And just click on download. And then go for the big green download button. 
and the last one Mobix term. Click on download and go for the home edition which is free. Click on download now. Then go for the installer edition and that's it. Now please go ahead and install all these uh, software packages. I will not waste your time. Please do it on your own. It's absolutely simple. You know that already. And we will continue now with the generation of the AWS key pair. All right, so I am now in AWS Management Console. And before we start and create the actual key pair, there is one thing to note. In the next module, we will talk about regions, availability zones, and edge locations. But for now, please note that uh, at the top right corner, you can select on what region you want to work in. And region for now means data centers in a specific geographical region of the world. So choose one region and then let's create the, uh, the AWS key pair. But please note that the key pair is only available for that specific region. So for example, if I now create the key pair in order to authenticate in, uh, in EC2 instances in US East, then I'll have to create another uh, key pair if I want to use it um, for, I don't know, Asia Pacific or uh, for EU Frankfurt, something like that. So I'm leaving the default which is the, the oldest region in AWS, the North Virginia. I'm leaving this one here. And now let's go to services and let's go to compute and EC2. So Elastic Compute Cloud. Now in here, we will go on the left and under network and security, please go to key pairs. We will now click on create key pair and we will give it a name. In my case, I will call it XAS and I'll click on create. As you can see, the PEM file has been downloaded and it is available to use. So now what we need to do is convert the XAS PEM file into something .ppk. So let's go now into start and scroll down to party. Let's find party, here it is. And if you expand it, you have multiple icons here, but you want to go with the party gen, so party generator. First, we will need to load our private key file in PM format. And if we go to downloads, we have to select here all files. And then in my case, isas.pem successfully imported the foreign key. Great. Now we would like to save the private key. Yes. I'm, I'm absolutely sure I want to save this without a passphrase. Okay, yes. And this is PPK and the file name, I will say the same, XS. And I will save it. As you can see, a new file appears now with a little server here. And this is the PPK file. And the type, it's party private key file. So this is what you're going to use, coming back to what I was um, mentioning, mentioning earlier. When authenticating to any EC2 instance, you're going to use the username and instead of a password, you will use this party private key file if you're going to use party. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Official Exam Blueprint. Let's now talk a little bit about the exam. So the exam format, you receive multiple choice, multiple answer questions. The exam time is 90 minutes and the exam cost is 100 US dollars. You can schedule the exam at either person view or PSI exam centers around the world. As you can see, I haven't uh, noted anything related to the number of questions because this can vary, but you should expect something around 65 questions in the exam. Now the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner landing page, you can find at this URL, https aws.amazon.com slash certification slash certified cloud practitioner. And we will cover now exam guide and we will also go through the sample questions. Very, very important. So I'll click on it and it will open right now. So this is the information we have covered already, the exam overview. And then here you have the exam resources. Let's now take a look first at the exam guide. 
So you have here the introduction and also the exam code. This will be important when scheduling the exam. And in terms of uh, exam preparation, you all provided uh, some trainings here, which they do cost and they are not uh, cheap. And very important, massively important, it's uh, absolutely critical to your future success when going for the exam, is the AWS white papers, either in Kindle and PDF format. Anyway, you will be provided these AWS um, white papers uh, access to download them. You will find them in the course at the right moment. Um, but if you don't like it to, I don't know, to read, because some of us really do not like to, to uh, read documentation, but the, let's say we are more into watching video content like you're doing now, do not worry, honestly, all of the white papers will be covered in the course extensively, so you're really in good hands. Now, continuing on the exam content, I was mentioning that there are two types of questions, multiple choice, which means you have to choose one correct response and three are incorrect, so one out of four, or the second type is multiple response and you will choose two out of five options. Very important also is the passing score. So as you can see here, the passing score is 70% or 700 out of total 1000. Going further, you can also take a look at the content outline. So there are four domains covered uh, in the exam and also in the preparation in the course. Domain one, cloud concepts, which is 28%, security, 24%, technology, 36 and the last one, billing and pricing, 12%. If you also want to take a look uh, deeper at what uh, each of the domain will cover, you can take a look right here. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about is this one, the sample questions. Now, going through the sample questions is absolutely important, uh, massively important again, I would say, because you will understand what is the AWS wording. So. How do they really ask when they need to ask something? Do, do they, I don't know, let's say use uh, some kind of weird or not so common wording? Is it straightforward? So you have to get used to this type of questions and answers that you will provide. Also, going through sample questions is one thing. This is 10 questions. Another thing that you might want to do before uh, showing up at, uh, at the exam, the real exam, is to go through the practice tests. So this is like uh, 30 min uh, 30 not minutes but 30 questions available or something like that 25 to, to 30 questions and these are actually real exam questions that will appear in your exam. It doesn't mean that you will have the same questions but anyway you will get custom used to how AWS um, will throw questions at you. Now understanding the question is critical and let's go through one or two examples. So the first sample question, is this one. Why is AWS more economical than traditional data centers for applications with varying compute workloads? So more economical, this means it's related to billing and pricing and also varying compute workloads. So this means that the application is now, for example, requesting high compute power and then in uh, 10 minutes is requesting low compute power and so on. So the uh, options, option A, Amazon EC2 costs are billed on a monthly basis. This is a true fact. Customers retain full administrative access to their Amazon EC2 instances. This is also true. You have full access and full control on your Amazon EC2 instances or VM machines. Option C, Amazon EC2 instances can be launched on demand when needed. This is also true and customers can permanently run enough instances to handle peak workloads. So yes, all of the options from A to D are true, but you have to relate your options to your question. So the question was again, which one is most cost effective uh, when you have an application with varying compute workloads? And honestly, you should go with option C. Amazon EC2 instances can be launched on demand when needed which means that we will be covering the billing and pricing uh, in a separate module. You will understand more. But answer C or option C is the one that uh, you would want to choose because you have this flexibility, elasticity with EC2 instances 
and yes you can launch them whenever you need or the application demands it so for this one uh, option c is what you want to choose now the second question which aws service would simplify migration of a database to aws this is a great example of why we would uh, need to go and you to understand and retain the information uh, in, uh, in a couple of modules from now with AWS services overview. So the majority of the questions uh, will be delivered like this one. You would need to know what the AWS, uh, in this case, let's say storage gateway does or database migration service does and just choose the right service that will uh, accomplish your goal or your business need. So this concludes our discussion on the exam blueprint. Again, you can go on the Cloud Practitioner landing page and take a look uh, what the information is covered here as well. But really don't worry, everything that you need to know and everything that it is in the blueprint will be covered in depth so that you will be comfortable and you will pass with flying colors. Thank you and see you in the next section. So as of today, there are 10 certifications available. We will be covering in this course AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner. Now the next level of certifications is the associate one. So Solutions Architect Associate, Developer Associate, SysOps Administrator Associate will represent, uh, let's say, the foundation of your AWS certifications uh, progress. Now if you finish with this one, uh, probably you would like to go to the specialty exams. So these are kind of newer and the last one on the list is machine learning specialty. This is quite new. So anyway, AWS certified security specialty, big data specialty, advanced networking specialty and last one, as I said, machine learning specialty. Now, if you are, let's say up to this point, you definitely want to go to the last level of certifications. So this is the professional one, DevOps engineer professional and the master exam to say so, Solutions Architect Professional. So you will start now with the Certified Cloud Practitioner. Let's see what AWS says in regards to this certification. So this certification provides individuals in a larger variety of cloud and technology roles with a way to validate their AWS cloud knowledge and enhance their professional credibility. Now, honestly, this is a high level overview of AWS services uh, certification. You are not, uh, let's say, tested on how the services uh, really work and uh, anyway, let's say more advanced functionalities of the AWS services. So typically you will get questions like, what does this service do? Or um, you have to accomplish this task. What of the services uh, from, the, from the list that will help you to accomplish that and, and so on. So this is the foundational AWS certification and it's not that technical. It is a great place to start for anyone. Either you are technical or not, you should probably start with the Certified Cloud Practitioner if you want to be uh, in the AWS game. Now let's go over the AWS Associate Level Certifications. First one, AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate. So this certification validates your ability to effectively demonstrate knowledge of how to architect and deploy secure and robust applications on AWS technologies. This is probably the best AWS cert to continue with after the practitioner exam. And this certification adds uh, some emphasis on uh, the following AWS, let's call them core services because uh, they are core. There are some miscellaneous or anyway, not that important, but this one, uh, these ones that you see here are very important. IAM, so Identity and Access Management, EC2, the very, very most important service on AWS. So Elastic Compute Cloud, VPC, the Virtual Private Cloud, S3, the storage service, RDS, Relational Database Service, and SQS for uh, queuing services. Now this exam assesses your ability to architect on AWS and probably it's the most uh, valuable in terms of market demand as of today. If you get this exam, you'll be in a very good position. Next uh, certification on our list is the Developer Associate. This certification validates proficiency in developing, deploying and debugging cloud-based applications using AWS. 
Now this is the best next AWS certification to continue with and actually this is the simplest one, the easiest one from all of the associate exams. This certification adds emphasis on some of uh, AWS services, for example, DynamoDB, Elastic Beanstalk, SQS, SNS, but really not very deep. Many topics overlap with the Solutions Architect Associate exam, and you will see that when preparing for the developer exam, it is really not that big of a stretch from the Solutions Architect Associate exam. Now, next one is the SysOps Administrator Associate. This certification validates your technical expertise in deployment, management, and operations on the AWS platform. Honestly, this is the toughest associate AWS certification, but still, it's an associate. Many topics overlap with the associate um, solutions architect associate exam and also the developer exam. Probably in a couple of weeks, um, if you put the necessary effort, you'll get the SysOps administrator associate exam as well. Now focus on Identity and Access Management, or IAM, VPC, Virtual Private Cloud, Elastic Compute Cloud, CloudWatch, S3, and some other miscellaneous services. Now this concludes the AWS Associate Level Certifications, and we'll now move on to Specialty Certification Exams. The first one that you should go, uh, or you may want to go, is the Security one. This certification validates your technical expertise in securing the AWS platform. Some of the exam milestones would be um, AWS data protection mechanisms, data encryption methods, secure internet protocols, AWS security services and features, but also taking the decisions with regards to cost, security and complexity of deployment. For this exam, there is a focus on services like identity and access management, KMS, Key Management Service, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, VPC, but also WEF, so Web Application Firewall. Next on our list is the Certified Big Data Specialty. This certification validates your technical expertise in designing and implementing AWS services to derive from value from data. So, as the name implies, uh, this, is, um, this exam focuses on, on core AWS Big Data services and you will design and maintain big data and leverage tools to automate data analysis. Focus on services like Elastic MapReduce, Redshift, Kinesis, but also some, as you may consider when seeing them in the exam, unrelated topics like KMS, Machine Learning, IoT, and some other ones. But anyway, this is for big data. Now, Advanced Networking Specialty. It's, um, let's say, as of today, the, the most uh, challenging one from the specialty, uh, specialty track. This certification validates your technical expertise in designing and implementing AWS and hybrid IT architectures at scale. So on-premises, public cloud, and the mix, which is the hybrid IT architectures. Some of the exam milestones design and maintain network architecture for all AWS services implement core AWS services in accordance to basic architecture best practices, but also automation, so automate networking tasks. Focus on services like VPC, Virtual Private Cloud, routing, either static, dynamic, BGP in this case, Direct Connect, DNS, which is Route 53 for AWS. Now the last one in the specialty track is the AWS Certified Machine Learning. This certification validates your technical expertise in building, training, tuning, and deploying machine learning or ML models using AWS Cloud. Some of the exam milestones design and implement scalable, cost optimized, reliable, and secure machine learning solutions. Choose the right machine learning approach in order to solve a specific topic or business problem. Focus on services like machine learning, Comprehend, DeepLens, Lex and some others. This concludes the specialty exams and we will now cover the last two professional level certifications from AWS. AWS Certified DevOps Engineer Professional Level. This certification validates your technical expertise in provisioning, operating and managing distributed application systems on the AWS platform. You will see some of the exam milestones are managing, implementing, and automating security controls, compliance, governance processes. You will also learn to deploy and manage monitoring, metrics, and logging AWS, 
but also implementing highly scalable, available and self-healing systems in AWS. So if something breaks, the system has to heal by itself with no human interaction. Many topics overlap with the Solutions Architect professional exam, which is next. Now this certification validates your advanced technical skills and experience in designing distributed applications and system on the AWS platform. This is the broadest AWS certification and it is the most valuable too. You will design and deploy dynamically scalable, highly available, fault tolerant and reliable applications on AWS, migrate workloads to AWS from on-premises to the cloud and also implement cost saving architectures. Now what do I mean by this one? Not all AWS services are tested in the exam. So you will be tested if you go for the professional exam for most important, uh, let's say, services in depth, but not, let's say, up to 100%. So it is the most uh, challenging one. You'll have to, to study quite a bit for this, but it definitely pays off. Now for the last one, the recommended path. So we are starting here at the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner. My recommendation is to go to the Solutions Architect Associate exam and then move on to developer and the sysops uh, administrator once you're done with the uh, foundation so the cloud practitioner and all of the associate exams should you choose to move further i advise you to go to the specialty exams start with the security exam then move on to big data advanced networking and the last one machine learning should you choose to go further well you should start with the devops engineer professional and last one, most important, the master exam, Solutions Architect Professional Exam. Thank you and see you in the next section. Well done. This concludes Module 1 Course Introduction. The Module Completion section at the end of every module in the course includes a summary of topics covered in the respective module and critical exam hints, what I call hot topics. Topics that you need to know 100% when you sit the real cloud practitioner exam. Please make sure you cover module completion sections at the end of each module throughout the course. With that said, please join me in our next module, module two, AWS Cloud Introduction. Welcome to Module 2, Introduction to AWS Cloud Computing. This module provides an introduction to AWS Cloud Computing. We will start and talk first about what is cloud computing and then I will introduce you what are the current cloud computing models and the different cloud computing deployment models. Working in AWS brings great value to any business, from startups to large enterprises. So next we will discuss about the six advantages of running your applications in AWS Cloud. By the end of this module, you will also have a good understanding on AWS global infrastructure and be able to describe what are availability zones, regions and edge locations. We will wrap up module 2 after going through AWS management interfaces and understanding more what are the options to interact with AWS Cloud Platform. With that said, let's get started. In this section, we will go through an introduction to AWS Cloud Computing. So what is Cloud Computing? Cloud Computing is the on-demand delivery of compute power, database storage, applications, and other IT resources through a cloud services platform via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. Amazon AWS Cloud Services Platform provides rapid access to flexible and low-cost IT resources. So I did mention pay as you go pricing. Well, this means that you pay only for what you use and when you use it. Let's now concentrate on applications and data centers. Applications and services are typically run on servers, which are comprised of CPU or the processor, RAM or memory, 
and storage, hard drive or SSD, where HDD is the legacy version and SSD or solid state drive is the new version of hard drives. Now when I refer to applications, I'm referring to let's say email or web servers, like um, you're running your company's uh, website on a web server, right? Databases that can uh, serve the web server, maybe you have a database of your clients, an FTP server, so file transfer protocol, and so on. So how can you run these services? You can either run in your company DC or data center, or you can literally rent the compute power and move it into the cloud. This is what it is. This is what cloud computing is. You literally rent what you need. You rent the compute, the storage power, and you pay as you go. Now running services in AWS Cloud now. With cloud computing, you don't need to make large upfront investments in hardware and spend a lot of time provisioning the hardware. You provision exactly the right type and size of computing resources you need to power and run your services. You can run, let's say, one server or tens of thousands of servers in minutes as you need almost instantly and only pay for what you use. With AWS, you can stop guessing. Let's now go through a real-world example on how AWS can help you and your business. Imagine that you are the CEO of Example.com Corporation and you're running an online business. You have an online mar marketplace of thousands of products. In order to run the business, you are running the Example.com website on your own infrastructure, so on your own servers in your data center. Currently, you have three servers running in your DC. So let's consider that two of them are web servers and the third one represents your database. Now it's November time and you are going to run a big campaign for Black Friday. Fortunately, this is a well-run campaign, so well done to the marketing department. Now, unfortunately, the web traffic hitting your servers, your web servers, has doubled and you even registered peaks with three times more traffic than in an usual month of the year. Now this has led to bad performance and really bad user experience that resulted in your company losing money. Now next year you decide to invest more in your data center and you buy two more servers having now four web servers. Once you launch this year's Black Friday campaign everything runs smoothly, excellent user experience, not even one complaint registered. Now after this great and successful campaign, you realize that for the rest of the year, you don't need the additional two servers that you bought in January this year. And now this is a great example of bad investment. Let's consider now that you're running your business in AWS Cloud with Amazon EC2, so Elastic Compute Cloud, and for example one database using a DynamoDB. Now once you launch the Black Friday campaign you start experiencing traffic increase hitting your EC2 instances. This time using AWS autoscaling technology two more servers are deployed automatically by AWS and potentially even more one server um, database server so a DynamoDB. Now excellent user experience for your clients no upfront cost for you and no initial investment. Once the Black Friday campaign is over, traffic returns to usual values and AWS automatically will shut down the servers that are no longer needed. Your AWS infrastructure as you can see is elastic and can automatically adapt to changes of your business. Your AWS infrastructure is scalable and it is able to scale up or down depending on your business and dynamic workloads that you may encounter at different times. And one last thing, with AWS you only pay as you go and pay as you and your business grows. And this is really fantastic. Let's now talk about different cloud computing models. There are three major types of cloud services available. YAS or Infrastructure as a Service. PaaS or Platform as a Service and SaaS, Software as a Service. The differences between them consist of, let's say, functionality and very important 
tasks, ownership and flexibility. So who's in charge with what and what is your flexibility with um, your favorite choice? Yes, pass or says. Now let's have an example. So working on your own premises data center is the same as doing the maintenance of your personal car. Also, if you want a better, more powerful car, you then have to buy a new one, right? When you lease a car, then you choose the car that you want and drive it whenever and wherever you want, but now the car isn't yours. If you want a more powerful car, then just lease another one that suits your desire and needs. And this is the same as YAS or infrastructure as a service. You can rent compute power, storage and other AWS services as you wish and run them when you want to. Now if you need to run a more powerful machine, you can upgrade it on the fly or just in a couple of minutes. Now when you get a taxi, you don't drive it yourself, but still you can go where you want. This is the same as platform as a service or pass. The last flavor is SaaS. So when you use SaaS, it's like traveling by bus. The bus has a pre-assigned route and can't be changed. You uh, share the ride with other passengers. So this is just an application. You either choose to uh, use it, like it is, or just leave it. Let's now talk about uh, every each of the, uh, the versions or the options. So infrastructure as a service or yes contains the basic building blocks for cloud IT and typically provides access to networking features, computers and data storage space. YAS provides the highest level of flexibility and management control over the infrastructure. So you can literally do whatever you want with your virtual machines. And the best example here for YAS is Amazon EC2, Elastic Compute Cloud. Now platform as a service or PaaS removes the need for your organization to manage the underlying infrastructure, so hardware and operating systems, and allows you to focus on the deployment and management of your applications. This helps you to become, uh, I don't know, let's say more efficient, as you don't need to worry about resource procurement, so basically also waiting for it, waiting for the, for the equipment, capacity planning, software maintenance or patching. And uh, the PaaS service in AWS is Lambda. And Lambda is really, really fantastic. We will talk more about it in the upcoming modules. The last one, Software as a Service or SaaS, provides you a complete product that is run and managed by the service provider. So with SaaS, you don't have to think about how the service is maintained or how the underlying infrastructure is managed. You only need to think about how you will use the app. Really, how you will use the app, what uh, it does and um, does it help you to, to run your business. So a common example of a SaaS application is a web-based email, for example, Gmail. Now let's talk about cloud computing deployment models. So what are the possibilities? Three cloud deployment models are currently available. The first one on premises is when you run everything in your own data center. So this is also called the private cloud. Hybrid is when you run some, some of your applications in your data center and some in the AWS public cloud. The last one is literally cloud. You run all your applications in AWS public cloud. So let's talk now about on-premises. Also known as private cloud, resources are deployed in your on-premises data center using virtualization and resource management tools. Now, when I say virtualization, let's think of VMware, also from Microsoft is the Hyper-V and the open source version OpenStack. Private cloud option offers the ability to provide dedicated resources, not split between users or end customers. So only your applications will sit on the actual hardware. Well, as opposed to the public cloud where you will have a hardware, let's say a piece of hardware, a server. And on that specific server, your applications are run and maybe some others, uh, some other, uh, let's say, customers or end customers are run also. Uh, in the private cloud, you have your own equipment and it is dedicated. Only you run your applications there. You have full control over your infrastructure 
and you are responsible, which is also important, for management and operating system patching. So applying fixes or let's say patches to bug fixes. Now hybrid. The hybrid deployment can be an intermediate step while you are on your way to fully migrating to the AWS cloud. A hybrid deployment is a way to connect infrastructure and applications between cloud-based resources and existing resources that are not located in the cloud. So simply put, it's just a mix between on-premises and cloud only. The most common method of hybrid deployment is between the cloud and your existing on-premises infrastructure in order to extend or grow your organization's infrastructure. So what most companies do, they first run in a hybrid, uh, let's say, deployment model, where the, at first they put, lay, let's say, their testing infrastructure, DevOps or something like that in the cloud and they stick to on-premises for the rest for the rest of their applications and services. The last option, the AWS cloud, the application is deployed in the, in the cloud and all the components of the application are run in the cloud. Applications in the cloud have either been created in the cloud or have been migrated from an existing infrastructure to take advantage of the cloud benefits. Now also in terms of uh, terminology, Migrating an application from on-premises to cloud is typically, typically called lift and shift and this refers to taking the application as it is without modifying it and running it on cloud native resources. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will go over the six advantages of AWS cloud computing. We will talk about trade capital expense for variable expense benefit from massive economies of scale, stop guessing about capacity, increase speed and agility, stop spending money running and maintaining data centers, and going global in minutes. So the first advantage is trade capital expense for variable expense. Now instead of having to invest heavily in data centers and servers before you know how you're going to use them, you can pay only when you consume computing resources and pay only for how much you consume. There is no upfront commitment and you, and you only pay as you use. For example, Samsung Corporation saved 34 million US dollars by using Amazon and building the Smart Hub app. Benefit from massive economies of scale. By using cloud computing, you can achieve a lower variable cost than you can get on your own because usage from hundreds of thousands of customers is aggregated in the cloud providers such as aws can achieve higher economies of scale which translates into lower pay-as-you-go prices for you the end customer stop guessing about capacity eliminate guessing on your infrastructure capacity needs remember the black friday example earlier right while guessing, you often end up either sitting on expensive idle resources or dealing with limited capacity, which is like bad experience for the end user. You can access as much or as little capacity as you need and scale up and down as required. Increase speed and agility. With AWS, you reduce the time to make IT resources available to your developers, for example, from weeks to just minutes. This results in a dramatic increase in agility for the organization since the cost and time it takes to experiment and develop is significantly lower. Let's think of the time to production to say for a new server. You order the server, then you wait for it to come, then you take it, you unpack it, you rack it in your data center, then you configure it and in a couple of days, weeks maybe, it's online. Really, stop spending money running and maintaining your data centers. With AWS, you can focus on projects that differentiate your business and not the infrastructure. Let AWS take care of the infrastructure. AWS will take care of the actual room, so the data center, power, so redundant power to say so, cooling, racks, servers, cabling, storage, networking and security equipment, and guards. And, and actually some others too, but these are the, the main ones. 
you really need to focus on your business and not on the data center itself. Now going global in minutes, with AWS you easily deploy your application in multiple regions around the world with just a few clicks. This means you can provide lower latency and a better experience for your customers at a minimal cost. And when I say global reach, I'm referring to regions and availability zones and low latency. This is achieved through edge locations. Now, these topics will be covered next. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we are going to talk about the AWS global infrastructure, region, availability zones, and edge locations. AWS global infrastructure's building blocks are the regions, availability zones, and edge locations, but we will also briefly touch on regional edge caches. Let's briefly touch on each of these components in order to understand what they are and what is the real value they bring to the customer. We will start with the AWS Availability Zone. An Availability Zone represents one or more discrete data centers, each data center with redundant power, networking and connectivity housed in separate facilities. Now what's the real benefit for the end customer? Well, running your applications or services in multiple availability zones, you can easily achieve high availability, fault tolerance and scalability. And this is not possible if you are going to run your applications in a single on-premises data center. So for example, if the data center will fail, then your application will not be functional, will not work. While if you are going to run your application in multiple availability zones, or maybe also multiple regions, and we will talk uh, in a couple of minutes, then uh, if one availability zone fails, your application will continue to run because it is deployed in another or maybe multiple availability zones. Now, specifically for the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, please uh, note that one availability zone equals one data center. As you can see on the screen now, there are uh, multiple, let's say, buildings, let's say three and plus one, yeah, four buildings. These buildings represent each of them a data center so an availability zone is comprised by one or more data center but for the exam there is a high possibility that you get this kind of question so what is an availability availability zone yes it is a data center now what's really inside a box so inside a data center as you can see in the picture in a real data center you will find a lot a lot of servers networking storage security and balancer equipments so really a lot of stuff that AWS can take care of and you will just have to focus on your real business. Now let's also talk about the region. So uh, what is an AWS region? An AWS region is a physical location in the world that consists of multiple availability zones. And this means two or more. All AWS regions are completely isolated one from each other which brings highest standards, fault tolerance and stability. Now regions are isolated one from each other, okay. Availability zones are isolated one from each other, but the availability zones in the same region are connected through low latency links. Actually low latency and really, really high bandwidth links. And again, inside an AWS region, you'll have two or more AZs. We will now go through an example. So in AWS Management Console, in the top right corner, you can select on what region you want to deploy your services. I'm now talking about the US, uh, the US East North Virginia, which currently has the most AWS um, AZs or availability zones uh, in it. So US East 1A, 1B, C, D, E and F. Now, as I mentioned just a bit earlier, an, a region has multiple availability zones, two or more, and they are connected through low latency and high speed links, which happens for US North Virginia as well. Now, what's the current inventory? So 61 availability zones are available and 20 regions as of now. Planned for 2019, 15 more AZs and five more regions in Bahrain, Cape Town, Hong Kong, Jakarta and Milan. 
So if you want to know more about the global infrastructure, you can follow this link awsamazon.com about AWS and global infrastructure. Now let's talk about edge locations and how they can really help you as an end customer. Amazon CloudFront is a fast content delivery network, which is called also a CDN. So a CDN service that securely delivers data, videos, applications to customers globally with low latency and high transfer speeds. Now about the CloudFront network, Amazon CloudFront uses a global network of 166 points of presence, which means 155 edge locations and 11 regional edge caches in 65 cities across 29 countries. Again, more information at aws.amazon.com slash cloudfront slash features. Now, let's go through an example of CDN. Uh, again, an edge location is simply an AWS endpoint that will cache content locally. So let's say that there is a user that comes online in the Seattle region and it will request a file from a distance, far distance, let's say Amazon S3 bucket in Melbourne. It will request the file. The file will be delivered from the Amazon S3 bucket from Melbourne through Amazon um, Content Delivery Network and in the end the file will be presented to the user. The thing is that now the file is available in Seattle at Seattle Edge location. Why is this important? Now because another new user or group of users when they request the same file, the request will hit the AWS network but now the file will be served locally which means really low latency, a higher speed and a better user experience. More information is available following the URL and I'm referring to edge locations. And if you go uh, to this link, if you navigate there, you'll find information about the edge locations and also the regional edge caches that we will briefly touch next for each of uh, the, the main geographical regions. So for example, for EMEA, Europe, Middle East and Africa, there is a complete list of the edge locations. So in Amsterdam, there are two edge locations, Berlin 2, Cape Town 1, Copenhagen 1, Dubai 1, Dublin 1, Frankfurt from Germany 8 and so on. So again, more information if you follow awsamazon.com about AWS and global infrastructure URL. Now there is a big difference between an edge location and the regional edge cache. And I want now to go through, um, let's say a comparison and then through an example. CloudFront helps you deliver your web content faster to your end users, thus providing a better user experience. So that's uh, very simple. CloudFront Edge locations bring the web content closer to your, viewer, to, to your viewers sorry, and make sure that popular content can be served quickly. CloudFront regional edge caches really help when the content is not popular enough to stay at the CloudFront Edge location and improve delivery performance for that content. I'm sure you'll understand more once we, uh, we go through this example. So a user opens, uh, let's say, his laptop or her laptop and will try to navigate to website.com. This request will be routed through AWS DNS service, which is called Route 53, to an Edge location. Now the edge location will question itself, well, do I have this content that is being requested? Do I have it locally? Is it cached here locally? And if it is, then it will be delivered straight away to the user. Now, if the content is not available, then the edge location will ask a regional edge cache. And that's the difference. It will send the request. And if the content is available at a regional edge cache, then the content will be delivered to the edge location and the edge location will deliver the content requested to the user. Now, what's going to happen if the edge location and the regional edge cache really do not have the content cached uh, locally? Well, the edge location will literally ask the web server for the HTML files, for example, and the Amazon S3 bucket in order to, um, let's say, receive the, the files. 
So it will ask the web server and the Amazon S3 bucket if the content is um, is there on uh, on a statically uh, basis on an S3 bucket, and the AWS cloud will deliver the, the the requested files to the edge location and also to the regional edge cache. And of course, in the end, the the content will be delivered to the end user. And that's pretty much all that you need to know about edge locations and regional edge caches. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will go through the different AWS management interfaces in order to understand how can we interact with the cloud platform. AWS provides three distinct options in order to interact with the AWS cloud platform and these are the management console, the command line interface or CLI and the AWS software development kits or simply just SDKs. Let's start now with the Management Console. The AWS Management Console is a graphical user interface for accessing a wide range of AWS cloud services and managing compute, storage and other cloud resources. The Management Console is a web application that comprises and refers to a broad collection of service consoles for managing AWS services. Now, in order to access that, you have to navigate to HTTPS console aws.amazon.com and we actually did it when we created your free tier account in module 1. Now, here is a screenshot of how does the management console look and specifically now I am in the VPC menu. At the top, you have the navigation bar and very, very important is the region selection. So this should be probably one of the first things that you do before you start deploying services in AWS. You have to select your region. So where do you want to install all of the services? And the selection is very, very much related to where is the, the vast majority of your users. So for example, if the majority of your users are in the US, it wouldn't make too much sense to select a region like uh, somewhere in Asia, you know. Now on the left you have the navigation pane and there is also a little uh, orange bar that will highlight the current menu selection. Now the next option that we can use in order to interact with AWS is the command line interface or simply CLI. The AWS command line interface is a unified tool to manage your AWS services. With just one tool to download and configure you can control multiple AWS services from the command line and automate them through scripts, which is absolutely fantastic and it helps a lot in large environments. After AWS CLI tool installation, you can begin making calls to your services from the command line. Now here is an example. So I'm logged into the CLI and I will type AWS EC2 describe instances. This will return the information on all of my EC2 instances that I have defined in my account. This could also be done in the management console, so in the web user interface, but now we are referring to a different type, a different method, and this is the CLI. Now another command, AWS EC2 start instances, and then you provide the, um, the ID of the instance. It will just start the machine, the EC2 instance. And last example, AWS S3 LS or list S3 and then the name of the S3 bucket. This lists the contents of your S3 buckets in a directory based listing. So very, very simple and pretty much self-explanatory. Now the last method is the SDKs, so the software development kits. So what are these SDKs? You may have heard this terminology, it's pretty common nowadays. Now a software development kit or an SDK is really nothing more than a set of tools that allow developers to create software or applications for a specific platform, operating system, computer system, or maybe a device. Now using SDK, you can access and manage AWS services with your preferred development language or platform. And the offering from AWS is really, really large. If you want, you can go to Amazon, aws.amazon.com slash tools and you will see um, what's now on your screen. So let's, let's read it. Simplify using AWS services in your application with an API tailored to your programming language or platform. 
so we can uh, play with the with the, um, let's say with the AWS if we already know Java or .NET or Node.js or PHP, Python, Ruby, browser, Go, C++ and so on. I think now it's a good idea also to have an example with Python. Why? Because Python is popular and I like it very very much. So for Python you have to install Boto. Boto is the Amazon Web Services SDK for Python. It enables Python developers to create, configure and manage AWS services such as Elastic Compute Cloud, Simple Storage Service and others too. Now the example below shows how to describe one or more EC2 instances using describe instances uh, syntax. So it may not look so uh, friendly to you, it's really about programming languages and learning how to program but anyway Python if you're not familiar with programming it's a really really good start for you as opposed to different other programming languages that may seem uh, let's say more complicated in the beginning so the syntax import boto3 ec2 equals boto3 client and we have here ec2 the response will be ec2 dot our argument describe instances and then we want to print this describe instances meaning the result so what are my ec2 instances in my aws account do not worry about it this is really not uh, so much necessary now you just have to know what are the methods and honestly from these three we will play the most with the management console and we will do some examples also in the cli in the upcoming modules thank you and see you in the next section Before we wrap up module 2, let's now go through a quick recap on the most important topics and exam hints covered in this module. We started our discussion with AWS Cloud Computing. So Cloud Computing is the on-demand delivery of compute power, database storage, applications and other IT resources through a cloud services platform via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. Think of Cloud Computing as renting the hardware with no initial investment, but pay as you go and as you grow. Next, we have talked about cloud computing models. You should know the three cloud computing models. Infrastructure as a service is the first one, platform as a service second, and software as a service or SaaS the third one. Infrastructure as a service or YaaS contains the basic building blocks for cloud IT and typically provides access to networking features, computers, and data storage space. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 is the, the AWS service that fits in this category. Platform as a Service or PaaS removes the need for your organization to manage the underlying infrastructure, hardware and operating systems and allows you to focus on the deployment and management of your applications. AWS Lambda, an awesome AWS service and we will talk about it in a later module. Software as a Service provides you a complete product that is run and managed by the service provider. Think of Gmail, your application, your SaaS application that you probably use um, daily. Now, Cloud Computing Deployment Models, this is different. There are three Cloud Deployment Models that are currently available. On-premises, which means that you will run everything in your own data center. Hybrid, which means you run some of your applications in your data center and some in the AWS public cloud and the last category is just cloud where you run all your applications in the AWS public cloud. So on-premises everything uh, on-premises everything in your own data center, cloud everything in cloud in public cloud and hybrid it's a mix of those on-premises and cloud. Make sure that you know the six advantages of AWS cloud computing when you sit the real exam. So these advantages as we have talked about are trade capital expense for variable expense, benefit from massive economies of scale, stop guessing about capacity, increase speed and agility, stop spending money running and maintaining data centers, and go global in minutes. Next we have talked about the global infrastructure, regions, availability zones and edge locations. An availability zone represents one or more discrete data centers, each data center with redundant power, networking and connectivity, housed in separate facilities. 
An AWS region is a physical location in the world that consists of multiple availability zones. And we have said here that there are at least two AZs in a region. Edge locations are AWS endpoints that cache content locally and regional edge caches store even more cache locally. The last topic, AWS management interfaces. AWS provides three distinct options in order to interact with the AWS cloud platform and retain all of them, uh, please, for the exam. AWS Management Console, AWS Command Line Interface or CLI, and AWS Software Development Kits or SDKs. Now, with that said, please join me in our next module, Module 3, AWS Services High Level Overview. Welcome to Module 4, AWS Core Services, The Backbone. This module covers AWS Core Services relevant to the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam highlighted in the official exam blueprint. We will start by creating a billing alarm for your AWS account so that you are aware of any charges incurred by your AWS services spending and we will continue with Identity and Access Management or IAM and Virtual Private Clouds Topics or VPC. For every topic covered in this module, we will first lay down the foundation from a theoretical perspective and then we will jump to AWS Management Council or AWS CLI for hands-on labs. By the end of this module, you will have a good understanding and also gain hands-on experience with services like Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2, Security Groups or SGs, Elastic Block Store or EBS and uh, Amazon Simple Storage Service or S3. We will wrap up module 4 after going through a fast recap on all topics covered in this module and exam hints relevant for the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. With that said, let's get started. In this section we will create a billing alarm for your AWS account. So now remember in module 1 we have created your AWS free tier account which means that now you have 12 months access to AWS. But also there are some limits there in terms of how much you can use a specific service. Remember for EC2 there were some kind of uh, 700 and something uh, hours that, that you can use EC2 and so on. Now the idea is that we will create a billing alarm so that if you're going to use in your AWS account services that go over the free tier limit, then you'll have to pay, all right, that's fine, but I want to know uh, for every month what uh, is my current spending, and if I go over a specific threshold or value that we will set just now, then I want to receive an email from AWS. So let's switch over to the console and take a look at creating a billing alarm for your AWS account. All right, so here I am logged in to the AWS Management Console. The first thing that you need to do is go over to your account. So at the top right corner, just click on your uh, username there and go to my account. Then you have to go to Billing Preferences. And here you have to enable the Receive Billing Alerts. So just as it says, turn on this feature to monitor your AWS usage charges and recurring fees automatically, making it easier to track and manage your AWS spending. Great. So enable this one and then just click on save preferences. In my case, because I have enabled uh, some time ago, the thing is that you cannot disable billing. So yet that's why I cannot enable it now so that you can see it. Anyway, click it and uh, this way you will enable billing alerts, click on save preferences and that's it. All right, so we have enabled receiving billing alerts. Now let's create the actual alarm. So services and under management and governance, please go to CloudWatch, click on CloudWatch. And now we want to create an alert. So under alarms, I will click on create alarm. Select a metric to alar alarm on and uh, our metric is USD, so dollars clicking on all metrics and then total estimated charge I will just click on USD and select metric now I'll click on new list and let's say here 
in my case my email and let's say $25 so when my total AWS charges for the month exceed this value so just put here whatever fits uh, your needs or best fits your needs then I will send an email to this specific uh, email address and that's it just click on create alarm and now you will be sent an email in order to confirm uh, this uh, this data so check your email inbox for a message with the subject AWS notification subscription confirmation just confirm this um, this email I will do it later and that's it now you have a complete billing alarm that will alarm you when the, your AWS spending let's say goes over in my case 25 US dollars thank you and see you in the next section in this section we will cover identity access management basics AWS identity and access management or just IAM or also known as IAM is a web service that helps you securely control access to AWS resources you use identity and access management to control who is authenticated, which means signed in, authorized, which means what permissions will be allowed or just given to the authenticated operator, and also what resources can then um, access. The key in understanding IAM is represented by these two concepts, as you'll see in just a moment, authentication and authorization. So let's dig more on the subject. In order to understand this IAM concept, which is really, really massively important in AWS, we need to define and understand the following concepts. And there are four, user, group, role, and policy document. The first three, user, group, and role, are related to authentication, and the policy document is related to only authorization. So let's, let's now just continue with it. A user is a permanent name operator. So what is that? It can be a human, it can be a machine, or another AWS service. A group is a collection of users and usually contains multiple users, right? This is a simple name, plain English. A user can belong to multiple groups. Now a role, which may seem a little bit more complicated, it, it's an operator too. So it is just another authentication method, just like uh, a user. A role can be as well a human or another AWS service. So you may say, okay, stop. So what is really the difference between a user or user and group and a role? And this is the key. Now user and groups, which is, uh, let's say a collection of users, authentication credentials for those two are permanent. So once defined, this do not change and they are like uh, available since start to end so they not change they're permanent but for the role authentication credentials are temporary and let's have uh, a short example on on user groups and role so let's say we have an ec2 instance that will just create a snapshot so a backup of all data and would like to store this snapshot in amazon s3 so simple storage service in order to do that, the EC2 instance, once it authenticates, needs to have the right permissions, which means that a policy document will also be attached there uh, to, to permit um, a storage of, of, of a file, of multiple files, of incremental snapshots, and so on. Now, with a user and group, if I just define on the EC2 instance the username and password, so something static that doesn't change, it means that if the EC2 instance will be hacked, then the hacker will have access to everything in my AWS account. On the other hand, and this is the key also, if I attach a role to the EC2 instance, and in that role I define that the EC2 instance will um, be able or will be allowed to only access S3, then it means that if that EC2 instance will be hacked, it will uh, no longer provide to the to the hacker access to everything in my account only to s3 and i and i can also limit uh, the period that i also define the role so right so it has access to s3 for this period of time so this is uh, something that is really great and it makes the difference again for the user and group authentication credentials are permanent while for the role authentication credentials are temporary 
Now once a user or role is authenticated by AWS, it will be given permissions, which means it will be authorized, based on a policy document or documents that are attached to it. Policy documents, which come in JSON format, can be attached to a user, group or role. If policy is attached to a group, once a user joins the group or is added uh, by the administrator to that group, it will inherit the attached policies. So not only one, but all of the policies. And by the way, JSON comes from JavaScript object notation. So you may ask, how does a policy actually look like? So let's have an example. You have now on the screen a policy uh, that's named administrator access, which by the name means that I will uh, provide full access to AWS services and resources, just like it is written in the description. The big advantage of JSON formatting of these policy documents is that they are really, uh, they, they are, uh, let's say, uh, easy to read and understand. So let's have a look now. The version, it's easy to understand, it's about the document version. Next comes the statement. So the effect is allow or permit. Also the action is asterisk. So this is basically a wildcard, meaning that, okay, I am permitting anything and next one is resource, which again, uh, in the administrator access policy, AWS is using an asterisk, which means again, anything. So come, let's go again from start to, to, to the end. The document version is this one since 2012. I am permitting anything on any AWS resource. And it is um, easy to read, understand, and it totally makes sense because this is the administrator access policy. Now let's have now a quick recap because we have the complete picture. So a principal or operator, again it can be human or another AWS service, makes a request for an action on an AWS resource. And this is what it's, what it's called API call. So coming back to our example, the EC2 instance will call for uh, storing, so put uh, the snapshot into uh, the Amazon S3. First, the user is authenticated based on username and password pair, and this is referred to human access, or access key ID and secret access key. This refers to services, also known as programmatic access for CLI, API, and software development kits. And this is something that you can select when you create your user. You create your user and you can then say, okay, I'm going to grant or permit uh, access um, uh, with username and password, or I can also add programmatic access. Now the user's action will be permitted or authorized based on attached policies, and very, very important, every API call will be recorded in AWS by CloudTrail. So this is something we have covered in the previous module. Thank you, and see you in the next section. In this section, we will configure identity and access management for your account. So following the theoretical lecture just a moment ago, we will create users, groups. We will also enable multi-factor authentication and attach a policy to your account. So let's switch over to the console and take a look at what we need to do right now. All right, so I logged into AWS Management Console. Before we start configuration of identity and access management, please know that currently Northern Virginia, so US East region is selected. This is important because when you click on services and navigate to security, identity and compliance and click on I am, you will see that the region is no longer being selected here. I am does not require region selection. So this is a global AWS service. The goal of this section is to have five green ticks here. The root access keys relate to your um, email address that you used in order to sign in for this uh, particular AWS account. We will now continue and click on activate MFA on your root account. Activate MFA on your AWS root account to add another layer of protection to help keep your account secure. So this is what we want to do, just another layer of security. Clicking on manage MFA, continue to security credentials. And then again, multi-factor authentication, activate MFA. Now we have three options to choose from, and we will use a virtual MFA device, authenticator app installed on your mobile device or computer. So what we will use is Google Authenticator app. So you need to go on your uh, smartphone, either iOS or Google, so Android, 
uh, and install Google Authenticator application. I'll click on continue. So first thing you need to install the Google Authenticator app and then use your virtual MFA app and your device's camera to scan the QR code. So here I am in App Store. I have installed Google Authenticator and I will now click on open and I will begin setup. So clicking on setup, show barcode 520 and then 728. Then I'll have to wait until the second code is being generated. Now I have another one, 388703. 388703. And I'll click on assign MFA. You have successfully assigned virtual MFA. Perfect. So click close. And if I now click on dashboard, now I have two green ticks. That's excellent. Let's continue and create individual IAM users. So clicking on this and manage users. I currently have no identity access management users defined. So I'll click on add user. User one. As I mentioned in the previous section, I can now select what kind of access I want to provide to this user, user one. Programmatic access enables an access key ID and secret access key for AWS API, CLI, SDK, and other development tools. And AWS Management Console access enables a password that allows users to sign in to AWS Management Console. So the second option is uh, mainly for human, let's say, operator in order to uh, to connect to management console while the first one programmatic access is going to be used let's say in roles and when providing access to another AWS service to to access uh, a third one or something like that I will also leave here the auto generated password selection and I will uh, allow users to uh, reset their password anyway I'm requiring password reset so everything is good now let's click on permissions in order to assign permissions to this specific user, I could add user to a group. I could copy permissions from an existing user, which is not the case because this is the first user I'm creating. And I, I can also attach existing policies directly. What I want to do is uh, to create a group. So I will do that right now. So click create group. The group name, because I want this one to be this user to be administrator, uh, let's say with permissions of an administrator, I will just name it administrator access group. Now, why is that? I'm looking here at the administrator access policy. I will just expand it right now. And this is the policy we have to, we have looked at in the JSON format, right? in the previous uh, section so this is permitting or allowing any action to any resource on my aws uh, account so this is right administrator access i'm going to select this so the group is administrator access group i am attaching administrator access json policy to this group which means that user one with which is in this group will inherit all of the permissions uh, of this group and of this policy. I will click on create group. Add user to the group. Yes, this is what I want to do. I could also add some tags. So for example, name. And this is user one department and this is IT admin and so on next I'm going to review everything I have configured and click on create user I'm now being provided access key ID and also um, secret access key and password so again the password is going to be used in order to log in to AWS management console while the access key ID and the secret access key will be used for programmatic access. What I can do now is download CSV and I'll have this, all this information in a CSV file. And I also can send an email to the specific user. Dear Mr. User, these are your credentials in order to use your AWS account. I will not do any of those now. It's not needed. I'll just click on close. And if I go to dashboard, 
now I have four green ticks. The last one in order to, to complete everything in this lab is to apply an IAM password policy. So clicking on it and then manage password policy will give me the option to let's say enforce my password policy. For example, require at least one uppercase letter, lowercase, one number, password expiration if it makes sense to me or not, prevent password reuse, also password expiration requires administrator reset. Anyway, it makes sense for me to have a more complicated password, but this really relates to your company policy or really what you want to do here. So clicking on apply password policy, and then going to dashboard, I can see that now I have everything in green. So what we did, we activated MFA on your root account. We created one user and one group. And also we have given full access or so administrator access permissions to these users by attaching the policy to the group. And the last one, we have applied an IAM password policy. One last thing before we wrap up this section is the IAM user sign-in link and you can take a look here. So if you do not change it or customize it, it, it will be in the format of HTTPS and then your AWS account number and sign in AWS Amazon.com slash console. What you can do is click on customize and replace your AWS account number with something more friendly and then you can just hand over this link to your users to sign into AWS. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover Virtual Private Cloud or VPC basics. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud enables you to launch AWS resources into a virtual network that you define. This virtual network is similar to a traditional network that you would operate in your own data center with the benefits of using the scalable infrastructure of AWS. So literally what you're doing is moving your traditional data center into Amazon Web Services, the public cloud. You can launch your AWS resources such as Amazon EC2 instances into your VPC in order to get started. A virtual private cloud or VPC is a virtual network dedicated to your AWS account. And you will see that when we start the uh, launch VPC wizard, we will have to select what is the IPv4 address range that we want to allocate to this VPC. Now let's go over some basic terminology in terms of uh, IPv4 and also related topics to VPC. A subnet is a range of IP addresses in your VPC. And again, as an example, 10.0.1.0/24 IPv4 address space. Please note that this is a shorter address range, so this is a subnet of the overall virtual private cloud. A route table contains a set of rules called routes that are used to determine where network traffic is directed, so where it will go. An internet gateway allows communication for your instances to the internet. Now, let's see exactly uh, how it looks from a, vi from a visual perspective, what we will next do in this section uh, and in the upcoming sections as well. So, literally what you do is first log in to AWS account and then you will select the region, right? So, for the upcoming sections and uh, the rest of this course, I will use US East 1 Northern Virginia region. Now, after you select your region, you will have to define the VPC, the virtual private cloud. And we will define a VPC with a single public subnet. But wait, so we said that as an example for the single public subnet, subnet we will select 10.0.1.0. And you may already know that this subnet is not a public one, it's a private one. So this, this subnet 10.0.1.0.24 could be allocated anywhere around the world and this is literally a private subnet. And we will see in a moment what makes it really a public one. Next, we will define an EC2 instance and we will allocate a static IP, so something that we literally define, 10.0.1.100. And we could deploy this in one availability zone and the address space for this AZ1 is 10.0.1.0.24. But we can also allocate, or not allocate, but we can also install this EC2 instance for high availability and redundancy reasons in another AZ, so AZ2. And please note that we have 
a different IPv4 address range here 10.0.2.0 slash 24. Now communication between availability zones, so between these two EC2 instances, is performed by what is called a router and this is also managed by Amazon, so by AWS. You don't have to do anything. Communication between EC2 instances happens locally, so inside the VPC, and it is handled by this router. Now communication outside of the VPC is handled by Internet Gateway in this case, or it can be also a NAT Gateway, but this is outside of the scope of the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. So the EC2 instance, I mentioned that it has a route table and in the route table we define destinations. So where will my traffic go? If it goes locally, so inside the VPC 10.0.0.16, it will be handled by the router. But if the traffic needs to leave the VPC and go on to the internet, then it will use the internet gateway. And you can see the green route in the route table 0.0.0.0 and the target is the I gateway, so identity of the gateway. Great, Internet Gateway ID. So basically the Internet Gateway performs two roles. It will NAT the traffic, so it will perform network address translation for the traffic leaving the VPC, for example of the EC2 instance in availability zone 1, and it will then change the source IP address once the packets reach the Internet Gateway from 10.0.1.100 to something public, to a public and a real public IP address as the traffic leaves the Internet. Now when the traffic returns, it will again change the destination this time for the from the public IP address to the real IPv4 private address 10.0.1.100. So the Internet Gateway performs the static NAT one-to-one -one mapping between the public IPv4 address 10.0.1.100 and the um, uh, allocated real IPv4 public address. So this is everything that I wanted to, to talk about from a theoretical perspective. In the next section we will literally start and configure our first Amazon VPC. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will create the virtual private cloud in AWS. So let's switch over to the console and get started. All right, so I have logged into AWS Management Console. And now in order to get started, let's navigate to Services and scroll down to Networking and Content Delivery section and just select VPC. So click on VPC. And before we create our first VPC, let's take a look at what is already configured. So in the VPC sections, if you click on it, you will see that there is already one VPC by default created by, uh, by Amazon. And it has an address range defined here as 172.31.0.0 and this is a slash 16. It also has a main round table and a main route table is the route table associated to every subnet that you define in your VPC. And if you define a specific a custom route table that applies to your, uh, to your subnet, then it will not use one. But if you don't create a custom one, it will use the main route table. All of the subnets will use this one. ACLs and security groups, it's something that we will discuss later in this section. Also, let's click on Internet Gateways. I can see that this internet gateway with this specific ID, the state is attached and it is attached to this VPC, which ends in 9E9. And if I take a look again in my VPCs, this is the VPC, 9E9. So this means that this VPC is a public one, meaning that the subnets here defined in the VPC that are associated or attached to this VPC can connect to the internet through an internet gateway. And I was mentioning in the previous section um, how, it is, how it is that when I define a VPC and I say that this is a VPC with a public subnet attached and that specific subnet it's a private one, what makes it a public one? Well, traffic from any specific subnet that leaves and connects to the internet through an internet gateway, well, it's called a public subnet. Now let's continue and create our own VPC. We can click on create VPC here 
and we will provide it these options or what we need to do also is go to the VPC dashboard and click on launch VPC wizard. We are now being presented four options. VPC with a single public subnet and let's read what it says. Your instances run in a private isolated section of the AWS cloud with direct access to the internet and this is what we want. Network access control lists and security groups, which will be covered later in this module, can be used to provide strict control over inbound and outbound network traffic to your instances. So literally this option creates a slash 16 network, this is for the VPC, with a slash 24 subnet for our public subnet. Public subnet instances will use an elastic IP or public IPs to access the internet. And this is what Elastic IP is, just a real public internet uh, IP for the, uh, for the internet. Now, the other options, VPC with public and private subnets, and please note that also the picture here changes in order to, to provide a meaningful uh, visualization of, uh, of the description. So this, this has two, two subnets, one public and one private. So for example, public for your web servers and the private ones for any databases running in the backend. Another option would be VPC with public and private subnets and also hardware VPN access. So you, you would select this one if you want to connect your uh, AWS uh, private cloud to the corporate data center, so to your on-premises data center. And that would make sense for a hybrid model when you run some of your applications in the cloud and also you run some other applications in your uh, traditional data center. And the last one, VPC with a private subnet only and hardware VPN access. So only some uh, resources are run in the cloud, no connectivity to internet, but you want to connect these resources or these applications to your traditional data center. Anyway, we will go for the first option, VPC with a single public subnet. So I will click on select. Now I have to define the IPv4 block. And I will use the default option here that I am being presented 10.0.0.0 slash 16. And this means the slash 16 notation means that I will have over 65,000 IP addresses available to use. I will also give a name here. So let's say AWS CCP VPC. So this is the VPC name that I am providing for my uh, VPC that I am creating now. The public subnet IPv4 address range will be 10.0, let's say 10.0.1.0 slash 24. Now, as I mentioned in the previous section, I can also select the availability zone. I can leave like no preference and AWS will select one of these six availability zones or I can select mine, US East 1A, it's a good choice, why not? And the subnet, I can give here a name. This is a public subnet, again, this 10.0.1.0, it's literally a private one. So RFC 1918, private IP address uh, space. But it will be public because, so it will become a public one because it will connect to the internet through an internet gateway. And this is the definition of a public subnet. So I will leave the default subnet name here, public subnet. Enable DNS host names, yes, why not? Yes, hardware tenancy default. I will not change anything here. I will just click on create VPC. Creating VPC, route table, subnets, attaching internet gateway and so on. Now if I click on your VPCs, I see that I have two VPCs here. So the AWS CCP certified cloud practitioner VPC and the default one. I have a VPC ID state is available. I can also see the IPv4 address uh, space that's uh, associated with this VPC. I also have a main route table. If I click on it, the selection changes here on the left menu from the your VPCs to route tables. I can also click, this is the summary, I can click on routes and I can see here the 10.0.0.0 slash 16 address range and the target is local. So anything that is going to be routed for this address range, so between EC2 instances will happen locally, will not leave the VPC and it will be performed by a router. Internet gateways, as you can see, I have two. One is attached to the default VPC 
and another one with this specific ID, it's attached to my AWS CCP VPC. And this internet gateway will perform the static NAT, what I was talking about, between the, the private address and the public address. Um, this way allowing traffic from the EC2 instance inside the VPC, inside the availability zone to go over to the internet. And also we, it will permit us from our laptop, from our PC to connect to the EC2 instance because again the internet gateway performs a static one-to-one -one mapping be, between the private and the public IP address. One more thing, elastic IPs. So elastic IPs, we will use these ones. Um, these are real public IPv4 addresses and we can attach elastic IPs to our EC2 instances or we can rely on AWS to allocate one public, real public IPv4 address from a DACP pool. And this is going to happen when we're going to define our EC2 instance in the next two modules. So first we'll talk about from a theoretical perspective and just have a good technical background and foundation. And then as you will see, we will go over and configure it in AWS. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 basics. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud provides scalable computing capacity in the Amazon Web Services or AWS Cloud. AWS Virtual Compute Environments are called instances. So now for the rest of the course, we will use the terminology uh, of instances, so EC2 instances, and try to avoid anything uh, like virtual machines. Amazon Machine Images or AMIs are available to choose from and you will see that there are pretty much pre-configured templates for EC2 instances that you can choose from when you decide to, to launch an EC2 instance in uh, Amazon. Instance types. So now let's cover also some basic terminology. Instance types are different configurations of CPU, memory, storage and networking capacity. Also, Secure login is assured by Amazon, so, so secure login to EC2 instances, and we will use key pairs. You store the private key and AWS stores the public key. These are the basic concepts of PKI or public key infrastructure, uh, let's say uh, terminology, and the way it works with certificates in the PKI world. You can attach storage volumes to your EC2 instances instance storage volumes and this could be ephemeral storage or it could be persistent. Persistent storage volumes for your data are available through Elastic Block Store or EBS and we will cover Amazon EBS volumes in just a couple of sections now. You can store data in multiple locations and we have learned about regions and availability zones. You can define basic security using AWS built-in firewalls and these are called security groups. In a security group, you can define uh, rules like protocol, port, source IPs that permit or deny uh, access to your EC2 instances. And we will also cover this in the upcoming sections in this module. Elastic IP address. This is a static IPv4 public address that you can attach to your EC2 instance. For example, uh, in order to use it for a website. The difference between the elastic IP address and the uh, dynamically public IP address that Amazon will allocate to our EC2 instance is that this elastic IP address, again, it's static, so it will not change if you stop your instance and then start it again. And it makes sense, for example, uh, if you use it for a website, so that uh, the, uh, the IP address stays the same and you don't have any kind of uh, problems in accessing your EC2 instance. You can also create and attach tags or labels to your EC2 instances. Now, when you launch an EC2 instance, you first have to select an AMI. And again, this is the Amazon machine image, which basically represents software selection. So you can start your EC2 instance with a Linux operating system. You can start it with a Windows operating system. And this is one thing that you have to decide on before uh, going further in your EC2 instance initialization. 
all AMIs are categorized as either backed by Amazon EBS or backed by Instance Store. Most probably you would like to go with the first option, Amazon EBS, in order to not lose your data if you reboot your instance. So what I mean is that for AMI with root volume backed by EBS, data is deleted only when the instance terminates, which is not the case for the instance store volumes where data persists only while instance is live. So again, if I stop and then restart the instance or reboot it, if I'm using instance store volumes, then all the data on my EC2 instance is lost and I have to restart my work. The next step is to select the hardware and I'm referring now to instance type. Each instance type offers different compute, memory and storage ca capabilities and they are grouped in instance families based on these capabilities. If you want to learn more about instance types, you can follow this link aws.amazon.com slash ec2 slash instance dash types. Now in this course we will use the free tier ec2 instance type. We don't want uh, to pay while we are preparing for the exam and honestly this is more than enough in order to get started and learn the basics and what you need for the certified cloud practitioner exam. Now also very important, as you will see, we will cover pricing details and pricing information for the core services and also for key services in our next module. So now let's cover pricing model, uh, models for the Amazon EC2. There are four ways that you can pay for Amazon EC2 instances. And this refers to on-demand instances, reserved instances, spot instances and dedicated hosts. With on-demand instances, you pay for compute capacity per hour or per second, depending on which instances you run. The on-demand instances option is basically the option that you uh, go for while you, um, you authenticate to AWS Management Console and you literally start an EC2 instance. So this is the on-demand instances type. The next one is Amazon EC2 Spot Instances. Spot instances allow you to request spare Amazon EC2 computing capacity for up to 90% of the on-demand price. So when Amazon has some more computing capacity left and not being uh, utilized, they just uh, provide you the option to uh, use this, this little space probably uh, to, to, to run your workload. But this is like an auction the price is not fixed and you can set in your Amazon uh, Management Console uh, let's say a threshold, a price threshold and when the Amazon uh, pricing reaches that threshold then you will be allocated resources. So for example I want to be allocated EC2 spot instances if the price is uh, um, at maximum uh, $5 and $5 could be whatever per hour, per week, per depending on what you said there. Now some common use cases for EC2 spot instances, applications that have flexible start and end times. You could not run your website on a spot instance, right? So this, ha this has to run like 24-7 uh, and this, it is not a good option for websites. Applications that are only feasible at very low compute prices. So you could have uh, like a fleet of EC2 instances that you want to run, let's say, big data on. You want to, to run something um, uh, which requires a lot of EC2 instances, but you need to keep the pricing low. So that's why uh, you are choosing spot instances, even if you have to wait for the, for the right time for when the computing capacity is available. Users with urgent computing needs for a lot of additional capacity. So this is just another use case. Another option is the reserved instances. Amazon EC2 reserved instances provide you with a significant discount. So up to 75% compared to the on-demand instance pricing. For applications that have predictable usage, reserved instances can provide significant savings compared to on-demand instances. This choice is best for customers that commit to using EC2 over one three year term in order to reduce their total computing costs. The last option is the dedicated host. 
and this really refers to having one physical server and not splitting or sharing the, um, the hardware with another customer. So that will be dedicated only to you. Dedicated hosts can help you reduce costs by allowing you to use your existing server-bound software licenses ex as an example like Windows Server's license or SQL Server and so on. And this type of instances can also help you meet compliance requirements. Now, in the last section, this is where we left off. So we created a VPC, we have allocated 10.0.0.0.16 as the IPv4 address, uh, address space block and we will now create an EC2 instance in one availability zone. This EC2 instance connects to the internet through an internet gateway and it will also have an IPv4 public IP address. Now this address will help us to connect and uh, this is what we will do through SSH first from a um, Mac Mac PC, then from a Windows PC, and uh, see exactly how we can get, ac get access to the EC2 instance. We will first start in the next section with the deployment of the EC2 instance. At the end of the section, we will connect through uh, SSH from an Apple uh, PC, and then in the next one, we will just connect so that you see how we can do that from a Windows operating system. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will launch our very first Elastic Compute Cloud instance and connect to this instance from a macOS operating system PC. So let's switch over to the console. Alright, so here I am logged in to the AWS Management Console. In order to get started with Elastic Compute Cloud, you would need to go to Services and under Compute category here, please click on EC2. Now, I currently don't have any running instances, so we will now do it together. So click on Launch Instance. And now we are going to, um, to cover all of the steps covered in the theoretical lecture just a moment ago. So first step, you would need to choose an Amazon Machine Image or AMI. And remember, we have talked about the root device type. In this case, it's EBS, so Elastic Block Store which means that everything that you would store, you would um, put there on your uh, volumes in your, in your machine, in your EC2 instance, will not be lost if you, for example, stop the machine and start it again or reboot the machine. And this is good news. Now, in order to continue, please click on Select. And now we have to choose an instance type. And this refers, again, as I mentioned earlier, refers to the hardware configuration. For this course, we will use T2 Micro, and this is free tier eligible, which means that we will not pay for this usage. Now, if you hover over this, uh, this cursor, this, this mouse over, you will see that for the first 12 months following your AWS sign-up date, uh, you will get up to 750 hours of micro instances each month. So we have pretty much enough time to play with. Now other families, as you can see here, this is the general purpose family. General purpose instances provide a balance of compute, memory and network resources, etc, etc. Other families, let's just scroll a little bit. Uh, this is compute optimized. So compute optimized instances have a higher ratio of virtual CPUs to memory than other families and the lowest cost per vCPU among all Amazon EC2 instance types. Others are, for example, graphics optimized, GPU, and this is graphics processing units. Other family, memory optimized with a lot of memory. And we can see here, for example, 768 RAM, so gig, um, gigs of RAM, right? So let's continue now. And here we have memory, and this is in gigabits, uh, uh, gigabytes, sorry about that. So we will continue with the general purpose. It is free and is absolutely enough for our testing. One virtual CPU and one gig of uh, memory of RAM. This is EBS and that's good news. So now let's configure also instance details. We will start with one instance, the network. So now we can select the VPC. We could use the default VPC or we could use the VPC that we have created previously. And we have given a name, AWS CCP VPC. 
Now for the subnet, we could have multiple options here, but, but because we have deployed a VPC with one public subnet, we have here only one option. So there it is. This is also very, very important, auto assign public IP. So in order for this instance to connect to the internet and also for us to be able to access it through the internet and we will use SSH, so secure shell, we have to say here enable. So yes, I want a public IP address to be assigned, auto assigned by AWS to this instance. We could also do different other things that are really not related to the cloud, uh, certified cloud practitioner exam capacity reservation also very interesting i am role so this is something that i could um, i could select here a predefined role a pre-configured i am role for example if this ec2 instance will store the snapshots so the backup in s3 it will need some credentials in order to access s3 and this is where i would put this this i am role shutdown behavior stop or terminate well, if you, if you choose stop, then you have the option to start it at a, at a later time. If you choose terminate, it means you will stop it and everything will be deleted. And some other options as well. In order to uh, have an IP on the ETA, so Ethernet Zero interface, I could leave this blank in order to have uh, an automatically provisioned IP from the 10.0.1.0 network. This is defined in the VPC or I could define it statically here if I want for example to know exactly what would be the um, the IP address for this EC2 instance and that's pretty much uh, everything that you need to know actually more than you need to know for the um, for the CCP exam so certified cloud practitioner moving on to the storage this is the root volume and it is like 8 gigs the volume type remember we have talked about different storage types I can select SSD, general purpose 2, that's fine, or provisioned IOPS or magnetic, which is the, uh, the legacy version or the old version of a hard drive. Anyway, I will leave the default GP2. I could also select here um, the encryption. So if I want to encrypt this, um, this volume, this is what I can select here, either default or I can use other keys that I previously defined, but anyway, I don't want to encrypt the, the volume. I could also add new volumes, but this will be covered in a later section in this module when we will talk about volumes and EBS, Elastic Block Store. We could also add some tags. So for example, when I um, deploy some resources for a project, I can give it a tag. Let's say that the name is AWS CCP and vpc although this is not a vpc i can tag every resource that's related to a project with a specific tag and afterwards i can search um, resources or services that are deployed in aws with that tag and have a complete list now let's configure also security group this is also uh, going to be covered in a later section in this module i can assign a security group um, so I can create a new security group or I can use an existing one. So let me say here security group, I will create a new one and yeah, let's do the same security group, AWS, CCP, VPC. I don't need this uh, description. So the security groups are basically firewalls, built in firewalls, um, default by default from the AWS side. And at this moment, I am permitting SSH, which is TCP and port is 22, from what source? From anywhere. 0000 slash 0 means that I can connect from anywhere around the world through SSH on this EC2 instance. We have the chance now to review. So description, let's say, why not? AWS, CCP, VPC and I will review all my selections. I could also expand these ones and take a look at, at every setting. And I will now click launch. In order to launch this instance, I have to select an existing key pair or create a new key pair. So in the first module in the Windows dedicated uh, section, we have created a key pair called XAS. 
it doesn't matter if you're going to use that one or you're going to create a new keeper one the idea is that you have to select something so in this case let me just use whatever this one xs.com i will acknowledge and i will launch the instance so now everything is being deployed absolutely very very fast as you will see i will click on view instances and now i have the complete look for this specific instance as you can see here i'm under instances and instances menu let's have a quick look very very important i have here the ipv4 public ip automatically assigned 3.85.22.136 now in order to connect to this instance i would have to do uh, one thing so just take it here and follow something that you will see in a moment but i want to see it running so this is running everything is good all right in order to connect to it select it in case you have uh, multiple ones and click on connect and here you have a step-by-step -step, um, let's say guide what you need to do in order to connect to this one so first you need to uh, change the the permissions of this pm file and you would have to change it to 500 then again i'm talking about um, Mac OS operating system users, if you're a Windows user, you can just skip the rest of this section and move to the next one, which will be uh, dedicated 100% for you, Windows operating system users. So now continuing on for Mac users, change the mode of the PM file and then connect to, uh, to, the, um, to the instance with this SSH command minus uh, I. Then you will just paste here the name of your PM file and then the user is ec2 hyphen user at and the complete name or the ip of the ec2 instance so let's just do uh, that right now i will start my terminal all right so i am now logged into the terminal let's see exactly where i am i am in the aws ecp folder great let's take a look with ls or list what are my current pm files the one that i'm using now is this one xscom.pm let me just say ls minus la and for this one i have only this permission read so i will say change mode 400 and the name if i say again ls minus la it should be the same right good now I could connect to the EC2 instance. So the idea is this, SSH minus uh, Y minus I, and then the PM file. And then I would say EC2 hyphen user at, and here you paste the IP address of your EC2 instance. Click on the copy to clipboard, or you could also select it and right click and copy, but it's easier like this. And then go to terminal and paste it there like this and just hit enter so are you sure you want to continue connecting i will just type yes and here i am as you can see here ec2 amazon linux 2 ami so let's do the, some basic testing so if i say if config i want to see my interfaces and i can see the eth0 has the the ip address that i have configured when i was launching the ec2 instance so when i was going through the ec2 instance uh, uh, ec2 launching wizard good do you think that this ec2 instance has connectivity to the internet well obviously i don't have to enter and see the the result of course it has because we have now connected to this instance how am i connecting to the internet through an internet gateway so let's verify this right now all right, so I have this EC2 instance that is running, is running in US East 1A. The type is T2 micro, and I have a public uh, dynamically assigned IPv4 public IP. Now, if you take a look here in the VPC list, we can see that we have two VPCs. In this first VPC, we will see also some route tables. The route tables are two now so one is the main route table that applies to all of the subnets in this vpc and one is what is called a custom route table and if i click on this custom one and take a look at the routes i can see here 
for traffic that is inside of this VPC, I'm using a router. So the, the routing is being done locally. If I want to route traffic to anything else, so out on the internet, for example, I will use an internet gateway. And if I click on this internet gateway, I see that the state is attached. And yes, I'm using the AWS CCP VPC VPC. So this is how everything ties all together. Thank you and see you in the next section. Now in this section, you will learn how to connect to the EC2 instance if you are a Windows operating system user. So this is only for Windows users. If you are a Mac OS operating system, then you can just skip this lecture and move on to the next section. All right, I am now connected on a Windows VM machine. Let's see exactly how we can connect from a Windows operating system to the EC2 instances that we have running in AWS. So we said that there are two options or or at least two options we will uh, we will see in this course and there are more than enough. The first option is PuTTY and this is something that you may have heard of if you've been in the industry or uh, not necessarily on the technical side but you know IT people use it very much when they connect to um, different machines or equipments. So PuTTY will use, let's remember what we have done in the first module, it will not use the PM file but will use the PPK file. And because we have started this VM, uh, this EC2 instance, sorry about that, in Amazon with XS.com PPK file, then it means that in order to connect from this Windows machine, we will need, we'll need to use the same PPK file. So what you need to do in PuTTY for the host name or IP address, let's copy it from the all right from the AWS management console. So either you select it or just copy to clipboard, then go to PuTTY, paste it here. But we, we will not authenticate using a password, we will authenticate using the PPK file. So just expand SSH menu, then also go to authentication. And here is what we need to do. The private key file for authentication is, so let's browse for the file. I'm going to look in the desktop and AWS CCP, and I will select the XS.com PPK file. So I'll open and now click on open. I will click yes. Let me just increase a little bit the fonts so that it's obviously more visible to you. So let's say 16 and apply. So I'm now being asked for username. The username is the same, EC2 hyphen user and just enter. Now if you do this, it's authenticating using a public key, imported open SSH key. Good, and I am now connected to the EC2 instance. Again, I have config, of course, I can ping like AWS or Amazon, not AWS, Amazon.com. So everything is working great. Now, another option in order to connect to EC2 instances is Mobile Xterm, and we have installed this in first module of the course. Now, what you need to do, and let me just say here exit. And I have now successfully disconnected from the EC2 instance. Why this is a good option, the mobile term, is for example, if you have an EC2 instance that you regularly connect to, let's say that you have um, a web server, and we will configure that in the upcoming sections as well. Now, if the IP is static and it won't change, and you regularly connect to that specific IP, maybe you'd like to use something like mobile term. So if I click on session, and then click on SSH. The secure shell is the protocol that we will use for this uh, connection. For the remote host, we put here the IP. And actually, this is not the IP. So let me let me just grab the IP again. So IP. And yes. So so for the remote host, I will put the IP. I do want to specify the username EC2-user. And for the advanced SSH settings. I will go here and yes, I want to use a private key and I will select, but this time, so desktop and AWS CCP, I will use the PM file. And that should be it. Great. If I now click on OK, authenticating, and yes, that's it. I am connected here. 
what you can also do here in um, in mobile Xterm, uh, yeah actually you can do also in putty but it's not that nice and colorful and easy to use with with tabs as you can see here multiple ones you can save the session so that when you connect um, later or I don't know a day after a week after you have it available and you connect through a script you don't have to enter again the um, the IP or the DNS name of the EC2 instance and the password and everything in order to connect to that instance so that's why you're you can use here the mobile XTERM or maybe also you you know about the secure CRT this is another great software and so on thank you and see you in the next section in this section we will configure the EC2 instance to act like a little web server and we will do this in order to highlight the functionalities of security groups which will be covered in the next two sections so now let's switch to AWS Management Console I have logged into AWS Management Console and before we start let's go to EC2 either by clicking EC2 here in the recently visited services or as you know already from the services and then go to EC2 or under compute EC2 so multiple possibilities here now I'm going and clicking on the running instances and please know that I have changed the name into web server. We did say that this is going to be a web server so it makes sense for it to be uh, renamed here. I will copy to clipboard the IPv4 public IP in order to connect on the terminal. Here I am in the terminal. I will now use the syntax already presented so ssh ec2-user at the public IP so paste and then I will use minus I and then the PM file and I should be now connected to the EC2 and yes I am now as a best practice before you start and use any kind of VM or hardware equipment that runs Linux as this uh, EC2 instance does you should update all of the software packages apply all of the, uh, the security patches the latest ones and so on and in order to do this we should type now yum and update and in order for us to not say uh, or confirm every question during the update we can say minus y I'm doing this and it says that you need to be root to perform this command so now I'm logged in as ec2-user but I need let's say the most advanced privileges and these are called root privileges so I can do this by typing sudo su now as you can see the user has changed and I am now logged in as root which means administrator I can do whatever I want on this machine so now let's type again so yum update minus y and now this machine is going to be updated luckily no package is marked for update and that's very good we can just clear the screen by typing clear and enter and now let's do the following we will install a small software a small package on this EC2 instance in order to run uh, to run a web server and this one is called HTTPD so yum install HTTPD and again minus Y now the software is being installed as you can see now it says complete now HTTPD, in case you're new to the Linux world, comes from HTTPD, it's daemon. So a little process that runs in the background. And can we check what is the status of this HTTP daemon or process? We can do this by typing service, HTTPD and status. Now why I'm doing this? Because it says here that it is inactive, so we need to start the process and let's do that right now so service and httpd and start let's start let's uh, not start but check the process again so service httpd status and as you can see now it says active and running great now what we will do is create a little web page we will create the index.html file that any web server is using and we'll put this into a specific folder that is going to present this information to anyone that is going to visit the, the web server uh, on the IP address of it. So now let's see how we can do it. 
First, we'd have to navigate to a different folder. If you use the pwd command, you can see that we are now in home slash ec2-user folder. And we'll now change this to cd var www and slash html. We should now create the, the, um, the index.html file. Now, if you're more advanced in Linux, you can use the traditional VI. If you're a new one, you can, you can use nano or pico or whatever. So pico, let's say index.html. Pico, it's not installed. Let's install it. Yum, install pico minus yes. No package available. Let's see if we have nano. So nano and index.html nano is here great now let's do this we can say html then again we can say body so what's the body of this page and also we can say header h1 and we can type a text here for example this is my what first web server on aws ec2 and why not exclamation mark now we have to close everything that we have opened in the beginning this is pure html so we have to close html body and h1 and we can do this like this so let's start now from the end to the start we'll close h1 then we will close body and then we will close html in order to save the page as you can see at the bottom in the left corner it's ctrl x so ctrl x save modified buffer and i will say yes so go on the y and what's the name it's index.html so just enter if you type now ls which means list i can see the new file if you want to see what's inside just to print the file you can say cat and index.html and i see the the text that we have just typed in right now great now we would like to uh, basically see the web server in order to do this we will take the public ip address i will say paste and enter well i'm telling you it will not load and this is because we do not have the right the right necessary permissions in order to access this website so that's it in the next two, in the next two sections we will address security groups both from a theoretical perspective and more important we will modify the security groups that are currently applied to this instance so that we can access the web server thank you and see you in the next section in this section we will cover the security groups basics aws security groups act as a virtual firewall for your ec2 instances to control inbound and outbound traffic. So really, what do I mean when I say inbound and outbound traffic? Inbound traffic means traffic that is originated from outside of the EC2 instance, for example, from the internet, and it is arriving at the EC2 instance. And outbound traffic is traffic that is leaving from the EC2 instance and is going, for example, again, going to the internet. Security groups enforce security at the instance level and not at the subnet level. Different EC2 instances can have different security groups applied. In a security group, you add rules that control inbound traffic to instances and separate rules that control outbound traffic, so that uh, traffic that is leaving the EC2 instance. Now, here is the AWS Management Console interface, and this is how it looks. So you configure inbound and outbound rules. These are different tabs. You click on add rule and then you go on click and create and that's it. It's very, very simple and you will see just in the next section how we will do it. Now let's continue and talk about the next thing. Security groups basic again. So when you first create a security group, it has no inbound rules. So this means that no traffic is permitted to the EC2 instance. I'm referring now to a newly created security group because there is also a um, default security group like you have seen for the VPC as well. So when defining rules, you can only specify allow rules and no deny rules. So only allow traffic, no traffic that you want to deny. 
Basically, you would define what you want to permit and anything else will be denied or blocked. By default, all outbound traffic is permitted. And now let's just refer to what kind of rules can you actually define in a security group. So you have to define inbound rules and outbound rules if you want to customize it and not rely on the default ones that you have uh, available when you define a new security group or when you use the default one. For inbound rules, you will have to define the protocol, port range or just port number and the source IP address. So where is the traffic coming from? Again, 000 slash 0, so four zeros, this is the, the default IP address that you would use. It means that you will permit, you will permit traffic coming from anywhere on the internet. While for the outbound rules, again, this is what you define where traffic is going to be allowed to travel to. So that is the destination. Again, you can set here the protocol, port range, or just a number, and the destination. 0000 slash 0 means anywhere. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will modify the security group and permit access to the web server. So before we start, let's go through a short recap of what we have done up to, up to now and where we are. So we have created a VPC, we have launched an EC2 instance and now the EC2 instance also has an IPv4 public IP address assigned. So it has internet connectivity and also we can access this um, EC2 instance through SSH from the internet going into the VPC and connecting to the instance. We have logged uh, into the instance through SSH and we have configured it uh, to act as a web server and we have also uh, defined there the index HTML file. Now next we will modify the security group that it is attached to this instance. Uh, we, ha we have actually created the security group when we launched the EC2 instance, right? And we will modify it in order to permit access uh, from uh, the internet through HTTP. So now let's switch over to AWS Management Console. All right, so I have logged into AWS Management Console. And before we actually fix the problem, fix what is wrong, let's analyze a little bit uh, what's the current status. So I mean, uh, I'm going to EC2 now and I want to see what is the security group that it's attached and what are the inbound and outbound rules. So now I am in the EC2 dashboard. And if you look on the left, you have here the network and security, uh, let's say category, and you have security groups. Before going there directly, I wanna go into running instances and take a look at what is configured now and what are the settings applied. So let's see where is the security group right here. So security groups, and I have this security group applied, SG underscore AWS CCP VPC. I can click on it or I can just see the inbound rules here. So clicking on inbound rules, I can see that traffic that is permitted to the EC2 instance. So again, the security group is applied at the security instance level, not at the subnet level. Traffic permitted is current, currently only TCP port 22 or SSH coming from where, coming from whatever we want, coming from anywhere around the world. And the secu security group again is SG underscore AWS CCP VPC. Now in order to permit uh, traffic to this web server, we would need to add some other services here. And let's stop for a little bit and think, so how is the web service running and what is the protocol and port number that web services run on? If we are talking about simple HTTP, then we're using TCP and port 80. If we are talking about the secure HTTP or HTTPS, then we would also need to allow TCP port 443. Now, if I click on the security group, it is the same as if I have clicked here in the network security and security groups, I can see the security group, the VPC, um, the owner, group name, whatever. Now here, I also have description and inbound and outbound rules. I will start with outbound rules. All traffic as it is by default, it is permitted, any protocol, any port range to any destination. Let's now modify the inbound rules. So we will say here edit and I will click add rule. In order to permit web traffic, so HTTP and HTTPS would need to be allowed. HTTP is here and it is 
uh, TCP and 443, any source, that's good. But I will also want to allow HTTP. And I'm not sure if I'm going to find it. Yes, it is. So HTTP and TCP 80 coming from any source. And this is good. Now I will just click save. And now I have an updated list with rules for traffic coming to this specific instance. So these are inbound rules again. What I will do, I will go to instances, grab the public IP address, so copy to clipboard, and I will now move on to a browser and test connectivity to this web server. So I have pasted here the IPv4 public IP address dynamically assigned to this EC2 instance, configured now as a web server through yum install httpd, http daemon. If I click on enter, well, this is it. This is my first web server on AWS EC2. So it is, it is running, the web server was functioning, but we were not permitting traffic through security groups, which again are built-in firewalls by AWS. You don't have to create them. They are, they are available in order to use. And let's take a look again in order to permit traffic to the uh, web server, so HTTP or HTTPS. We don't know usually if it's going to be HTTP or HTTPS, although uh, nowadays the secure version is being used. So to be on the safe side, I uh, definitely think that it should be good that you add both HTTP and HTTPS. And also before we wrap up, please note that when you add a rule for HTTP IPv4, and this is the source, Automatically, automatically it will be added a rule for IPv6, which is colon colon slash zero. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover Elastic Block Store or EBS basics. Amazon Elastic Block Store, EBS, provides block level storage volumes for use with EC2 instances. And this is totally different from what the simple storage service or S3 offers. S3 is good for storing objects, which means files, movies, pictures, documents, whatever, while EBS or Elastic Block Store is storage for volumes. So this is the same as if you would put multiple uh, hard drives or SSD drives into your uh, PC. Well, this is EBS, so multiple volumes on your running uh, EC2 instance. EBS volumes are highly available and reliable storage volumes that can be attached to any running instance that is in the same availability zone. As you will see in the next section when we will do a lab on Amazon EBS, you have to create the volume, the EBS, and you have to deploy that in the same availability zone where your EC2 instance lives. EBS volumes that are attached to an EC2 instance are exposed as storage volumes that persist independently from the life of the instance. And this means that, for example, if you decide at one point that you want to stop or terminate the EC2 instance, you can just detach the Amazon EBS volume and attach one um, at your own will on another EC2 instance. So this is different. The life of the EC2 instance is not the same um, with the life of the volume, the Amazon EBS volume. Amazon EBS provides two volume types, which differ in performance characteristics and price. SSD volumes. Now, this option offers high uh, IOPS, and this refers to input-output operations per second, and the legacy hard drives volumes. Uh, though, so the second option offers throughput over IOPS. So if you need um, performance, then you would go with the first option, SSD for highly and intensive applications, highly, let's say, accessed. If you need storage throughput, then you'd go for hard drives. Now, SSD volumes come in two flavors, and we have seen that just a moment ago when we deployed the EC2 instance. The root volume was general purpose SSD, or GP2. And this is a good option as a balance between price and performance. The second option is provision IOPS SSD, and this is the highest performance SSD volume that you can get in AWS. HDD or hard drive volumes also come in two flavors. Throughput optimized HDD, this is also known as ST1, low cost HDD volume designed for frequently accessed 
throughput intensive workloads. And called HDD SC1, this is the lowest cost hard drive volume design for less frequently accessed workloads. Now for security reasons, data stored on EBS volumes needs to be encrypted. You may decide to encrypt it or not, but this is an option that you can choose. You can launch your EBS volumes as encrypted volumes. Remember that when we went through the launch EC2 wizard, right? We could select that the root volume could be encrypted and we could encrypt that with keys. Either we use default ones or create new keys. If you choose to create an encrypted EBS volume and attach it to your EC2, well, data stored and snapshots are encrypted and this is also known as encryption at rest. So, refers to data not moving, uh, just staying there on the volume. Now, with data encrypted on your EBS volumes, you also ensure security for data in transit. So, data in transit refers to data traveling from one um, location to another from an EBS volume to another EBS volume on another let's say EC2 instance to a file system to Amazon S3 and so on. You can take point-in-time snapshots of data on your Amazon EBS volumes and store them in Amazon S3. Now what, what are snapshots? Snapshots are incremental backups which means that only data on the volume that has changed after your last snapshot is saved. So you do in the beginning a complete snapshot and after that you do incremental backups or incremental snapshots, uh, which means that you will um, copy and make available only data that has changed from the previous complete snapshot. Each snapshot contains all of the information needed to restore your data to a new EBS volume. Let's talk now a little bit about Amazon EBS pricing. This is also important for your cloud uh, exam, so certi certified cloud practitioner exam. Amazon EBS pricing depends on the following. Now first is volumes and you will be charged for the total storage of all EBS volumes per uh, gigabyte per month. In terms of snapshots, total snapshot storage consumed in AWS S3 influences your your bill, your pricing for AWS per month. EBS snapshot copying between regions is also charged. Now, this means that if you copy from um, your US East one to, I don't know, Europe or, or Asia, the snapshot, you will be charged. Now, also as a rule of, a rule of thumb for AWS, data coming into AWS, so inbound is free but data leaving AWS, so outbound, is charged. You will be charged for anything that you take out of AWS. So for example, if you decide at one point to put there all your documents, all your private pictures in, in S3, that's fine, you will not be charged for this. But if you decide at a later moment to take out your data, then you will be charged. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will create an EBS volume and attach it to the EC2 instance. All right, so I have logged into the AWS Management Console. Before we create a new EBS volume, let's examine what we currently have. So if I go to EC2, I have a running instance. And please note that now I have a different IP address. And this is because I stopped the instance between recording and now I've started it again and it has been allocated a new public IP address. Now on the left side, if you look in the menus here and scroll down to Elastic Block Store, just click on Volumes and this is our 8 gigs root volume. Again, this is also EBS volume type that has been created when we launched the EC2 instance. In terms of attachment information, let me just expand this a little bit. It is attached to our web server. So what we need to do now is to create a volume and then attach it to the new uh, EC2 instance to our web server and then also make it usable. And you will see exactly what I mean in a moment. So click on create volume. Now we have to define something like volume type. So this is uh, general purpose SSD, provisioned IOPS, cold hard drive, throughput optimized or magnetic. 
this is something we have talked about in um, in EBS so I will click now GP2 I will leave it like default I will say that the size is 10 gigs and very very important is the availability zone so when you create a new volume it has to be created in the same availability zone where your EC2 instance is living so because I have my EC2 instance in US East 1 I will leave this as default this is not important encryption if I want to encrypt the volume and pretty much that's it so create volume and close now the volume once it is set up it will appear here so now let's wait for it to to be deployed it is in use and this one is available I will just rename it as for example new EBS volume enter it is available now in order for this volume to be used by our EC2 instance we need to attach it to this specific instance this also means that if you decide at one point in order to stop or terminate the EC2 instance but to use that specific EBS volume uh, with another EC2 instance well that's possible so what now with this EC2 instance being with uh, with this new EBS volume sorry about that selected I can go to actions and attach volume now I'll have to select which is the instance I'm going to attach it to so I have only one I will click on web server and now I have to um, select how I would like to uh, define it and this refers to if you correlate it to Windows maybe you're more familiar with Windows you know that you have like C colon slash as the, the first uh, volume there and maybe you also have another partition like uh, D colon slash and another one E colon slash and so on so we have the uh, SDA currently being used by the um, let me just just show you you have here so this is the attachment information this root volume is going to be it is attached to the web server and it is dev slash xvda the new volume also needs to have a path so similar to windows like d colon slash so let's continue now so i'm being i'm selecting the new volume i'm clicking on attach volume i'm selecting where i want to uh, where i want to atta attach this ebs volume and here are the options the currently available options so for Linux devices, I can say anything dev slash SDF through SDP. So I will leave here the default dev as the SDF and click on attach. Very simple. And now the EBS volume state is in use. Now also before we make the EBS volume available to use on the EC2 instance, let us just go through an analogy. So imagine that you have a Windows PC and you have one hard disk inside there and the partition is C colon slash. It makes sense for you to add another hard drive if for example you have no uh, free space and you need some more. So you just go and buy another hard drive. You connect it physically in your PC, in your laptop, tower machine, whatever. And then in order to make it available you have to format it. And maybe you're also familiar with FAT32 or NTFS. Now, if you don't format it, it will not be recognized by the operating system, by Windows. So that's where uh, that's when you do it. You just format it. And also, after you format it, you have to have uh, a letter for this partition. So you cannot have the same letter like C colon slash for both hard drives. And this is similar to mounting in Linux. So if I want to copy a file to this, um, to this Windows PC that has two hard drives, if both partitions or hard drives are going to be mounted or they do uh, are recognized by the, uh, the Windows operating system as C colon slash, then the operating system would not know where to copy the file. While if I have different mounting points or different... Um, letter there in order to define the partition like c colon slash d colon slash and so on then the oper operating system can make some difference between the two and know exactly where you want to copy the new file so the idea is that we will uh, have to format this ebs volume 
and then we'll have to define a mount point and you will see exactly what I mean in a moment. Now what we need to do now is to go to our EC2 dashboard and grab the IPv4 public IP and connect on the terminal. So now let's connect to the EC2 instance SSH minus I and I now have to define the PEM file so the private key and then ec2-user at and the public IPv4 address and yes and yes here I am in the EC2 instance before we actually start any configuration we need to see exactly what is happening now and what is the current status we will use a command like lsblk and this comes from list and blk comes from block so we have two blocks now so lsblk we have two blocks we have the xvda and this is the root volume it is 8 gigs and we have another one xvdf that we have just attached to this ec2 instance the mount point as you can see in the last column for the x uh, for the xvda is slash and this is the um, uh, let's say the root the root point that you can mount on for the xvdf we currently have nothing see here is blank so what we will do now is to define a file system for the xvdf in order to to make it visible for the ec2 instance we will do sudo su and now as you can see the root is here so we have changed from ec2 user to root one which means that we now have full control on this ec2 instance so let me just clear the screen and continue now we can say file minus s and dev and xvda we can see here some uh, information that's fine lsblk we can say this one and as you can see we have here the xfs file system data good now if you do the same for xvdf you can see that nothing is present here so we currently don't have any file system defined on uh, on this new volume so let's define it now we'll do this with make mk fs so this is file system then we will have to define the type minus t and this is xfs the same like the first volume the root one and then we will say what is the actual uh, volume that we want to uh, to define the file system for and this is xvdf great so we have also uh, have gone through uh, through this step now i said that we have to mount this new volume and again as a, as a comparison or as an analogy with windows we have to define a letter for it like d colon slash how we're going to do that we will use the command mount and then we will say what do we want to mount and this is slash dev slash xvdf and we will now have to define the uh, the mounting point and we actually have first to define uh, a folder so mkdir or make directory and we will say this is aws ccp all right so now we have to define the mount point so mount what do we want to mount dev and xvdf and the mount point is what we have defined aws ccp now clear now let's take a look at list block command lsblk and as you can see here for the xvdf uh, let's say partition but the correct uh, terminology is volume we have a mount point and this is slash aws ccp great now let's do some testing so let's create a file let's say nano and the file is aws ccp colon let's say text file dot txt and we'll say this is a text file control x yes uh, yes ls 
where are we now we are in home ec2 user let's list the content of aws ccp and here it is this is the text file.txt we can see the content with cat and aws ccp and the text file and this is the text file so great now it looks like we have a new volume attached lsblk we have X, uh, xvda and this is the root volume both of them are ebs type we have another one xvdf we have defined here the file system which is xfs the same as, as for the first partition the root one and we have we have also defined a mount point now i was mentioning earlier when talking about storage and pricing with aws anything that you lead, you let uh, in the in your aws account in order to leave and you not terminate or just delete will um, will come with some charging some costs for you so now what now what we'll do is the unmount this specific um, this specific volume so the xvdf one then we will detach it from the ec2 instance and then we will uh, we will delete it right so let's do that right now so let's unmount it you mount slash aws ccp good lsblk now we have no mounting point for the second volume xvdf which means that if it's not mounting we can now detach it from the ec2 instance and then actually delete the volume so now let's switch to aws management console we are in instances now let's scroll down and go to elastic block block store category click on volumes we have here two volumes the new ebs volume which is 10 gigs it's the first one so selecting it and then go to actions and say detach volume and yes detach it and now this is the moment that if you want to you could take this volume and attach it to another ec2 instance this is not the case for for us now we will just delete it once once it's available for uh, for deletion so now let's wait in order to change the state from in use to available great the state now is available so what i will do again with this uh, volume being selected going to actions and the delete volume is our option here and yes delete it is now in the state of deleting and once it's done it will not show in this list thank you and see you in the next section in this section we will cover amazon simple storage service or s3 basics amazon s3 or amazon simple storage service provides object storage through a web service interface with amazon s3 you can store and retrieve any amount of data at any time from anywhere on the web so first of all it is a web storage service which means that you can store files videos pictures documents whatever but you cannot store operating system and this is what elastic block store is for in this section we will focus on amazon s3 concepts amazon s3 uh, features and we will wrap up with amazon s3 pricing related information very important for your certified cloud practitioner exam now first let's start with a bucket a bucket is a container for objects stored in amazon s3 every object in s3 is contained in a bucket and here is how the url looks like for any object stored in amazon s3 https colon slash slash then is the service which is s3 bucket name amazon aws.com slash the object name i would like you to think of a bucket as a folder where you can store objects or files we will see that in the next section when we define a bucket bucket names are globally unique which means that you cannot have two buckets in uh, aws all over the world with the same name so they have to be unique in terms of naming objects are the fundamental entities stored in amazon s3 objects consist of object data and metadata object data is the actual data while metadata is just data about data so for example if you upload a file in uh, amazon s3 you could have data about data like you can see on the screen now so when it was last modified what's the storage class does it have any e tags does it have any server side encryption configured and what's the size and so on so data is the actual data while metadata is data about data 
When you create an object, you specify the key name, which uniquely identifies the object in the bucket. Every object in a bucket has exactly one key and as you can see here, it's actually the name. So in this case, I have uploaded picture.png to Amazon S3. You can also see the object URL and the key name is the actual name. So the key equals name. Now let's talk about what Amazon co calls the data consistency model. So please, please pay attention. Now Amazon S3 provides read after write consistency for puts of new objects in your S3 bucket in all regions. This means you can access the object immediately after it was copied in an S3 bucket. Well, let's have an example. If you upload a document to, uh, to an S3 bucket, it will be available for reading, so for displaying the content in another region around the world, just like that, immediately. Now, this is totally different with eventual consistency. Amazon S3 offers eventual consistency for override puts and deletes in all uh, regions. And this means that if you update or delete an object in an S3 bucket, the change will eventually be propagated and visible to everyone. As an example, if you are in Seattle and you just go on and modify an existing object in your S3 bucket, then the change will be visible to users in, uh, let's say, Asia, somewhere, anywhere, um, let's say, far more distant than, than the actual location. The change will be propagated. It will not take like an hour. It will take like one second or something like that. Two seconds, three seconds. So short amount of, of time but the change will eventually be propagated and visible to users in, uh, in, uh, in another region around the world. Now let's talk about storage classes. Very, very important for your exam as well. Amazon S3 offers a range of storage classes for the objects that you store. You choose a class depending on your use case scenario and performance access requirements. And all of these storage classes offer high durability which means that you will not lose your data. Each object in Amazon S3 has a storage class associated with it. As an example, as you can see here now, the storage class is standard for this specific object in S3. Let's talk about the different storage classes that are available in Amazon. The first one is the standard. This is the default storage class when you upload any object to S3 and you do not change the, the default settings. The standard storage class is used for performance sensitive use cases, those that require like millisecond access time and for frequently accessed, uh, accessed data. Now, the next type of, so, of storage classes is the infrequently accessed or um, IA. And we have here two types and these are the standard infrequently accessed and one zone infrequently accessed. Designed for long lived and infre infrequently accessed data, Amazon S3 charges a retrieval fee for these objects, so they are most suitable for infrequently accessed data. This means that if you store data with infrequently accessed, or as you will see just in a moment, with uh, archiving storage classes like, uh, like Glacier, then it will uh, the, the retrieval it will not be um, instantaneous. It will take a couple of seconds, minutes, or hours, depending on the storage class. And you'll also be charged for this, for retrieving data that has been stored for a longer time. The standard infrequently accessed and one zone IA storage classes are suitable for objects larger than 128 kilobytes that you plan to store for at least 30 days. Now let's talk about the standard IA. Amazon S3 stores the object data redundantly across multiple geographically separated AZs, availability zones, Objects are resilient to the loss of an availability zone. So if one AZ fails, then you'll still have access to your data. Well, this is not the case for one zone uh, IA. Amazon S3 stores the object data in only one AZ. However, the data is not resilient to the physical loss of the AZ. So in other words, if the AZ fails, then the data will not be available until the availability zone will be uh, restored and available as well. Another type of storage classes is the data archiving uh, uh, category. We have here two options, Glacier and Deep Archive. 
Glacier. Data stored in this storage class has a minimum storage duration period of 90 days and can be accessed in 1 to 5 minutes using expedited retrieval. Well, the Deep Archive now, minimum storage duration period is 180 days or half a year and a default retrieval time of 12 hours can take right until you have access to your data. And this is the lowest cost storage option in AWS. So let's have a comparison between all of these storage classes. First is the durability. So you have durability like 11 nines, 99.99999, 11 nines in total. This means that your data will not be lost. So it's a low, low probability that you lose anything that you put in S3. In terms of availability, the availability for accessing your data starts from 99.5 for one zone in frequently accessed um, storage class and goes up to 99.99 .99 for almost all of your storage classes. Availability zones. So for the one zone IA, just a small and short recap, the data is stored in one availability zone and for the rest data is stored in a minimum of three availability zones. Some more Amazon S3 features and discussions. Now let's talk about bucket policies. Bucket policies or permissions provide centralized access control to buckets and objects based on a variety of conditions. With bucket policies, you can add or deny permissions across all or even a subset, subset of objects within a bucket. Only the bucket owner is allowed to associate a policy with a bucket. So defining permissions, who can access what. Now, some features, interesting features are transfer acceleration and cross-region replication. Amazon S3 transfer acceleration enables fast, easy and secure transfers of files over long distances between your client and an S3 bucket using Amazon CloudFront's globally distributed edge locations. So let's have an example. A user somewhere in North America decides to upload a file to S3 in an Amazon S3 bucket in Melbourne. So because this is far, far away, it will take some time. And in order to accelerate the, the transfer, you can enable the Amazon S3 transfer acceleration feature, which means that the file would be uh, uploaded into a near bucket. So the, uh, in this case, the Seattle uh, edge location. And after that, the data will be accelerated and transferred fast in Amazon S3 bucket in Melbourne which means that the total time is going to be less, considerably less. If you do some testing in Amazon um, Management Console, you'll see that depending on the far location, it could be even three times faster. Amazon Cross-Region Replication. Cross-Region Replication enables automatic asynchronous copying of objects across buckets in different availability um, uh, zones and regions, to say so. Again, an example, if I decide to replicate all my content in Amazon S3 bucket in Seattle, I enable cross-region replication and once the file reaches the S3 bucket in Seattle, it will be immediately copied to the faraway Amazon S3 bucket. In this case, it's the Melbourne Amazon S3 bucket. So let's now just wrap up this section with Amazon S3 pricing. So first, let's start with an overview. Amazon S3 is AWS object storage service built to store and retrieve any amount of data from anywhere. It is designed to deliver 99.999999 whatever, right? Durability 11.9 storing data for millions of applications. Amazon S3 provides the simplicity and cost effectiveness of pay as you go pricing. And you are uh, already accustomed with this. You pay only for the storage you use. There is no minimum fee. Let's now go through estimating your costs. So price, the total price you will pay per month will depend on the following. Storage class. So you would start with standard storage class and probably you will move your data to standard IA in frequently accessed in order to reduce your cost by storing less frequently accessed data there and move to S3 Glacier storage for archiving data at very low costs. In terms of storage, cost depends on number and size of objects, right? And you're also going to be charged for requests, so number of requests. Get requests come with charges, which means that 
uh, users, clients um, is, are going to access your data in Amazon S3. They will perform GET request and you will be charged for this. Also, data transfer. You are going to be charged for the amount of data transferred out of Amazon S3 region. So this is something I have mentioned in previous sections as well. Anything that is going to leave the Amazon uh, in general, the Amazon um, uh, cloud, you are going to be charged for. Amazon Glacier, it starts at $0.004 per gigabyte per month. Amazon Glacier allows you to archive large amounts of data at a very low cost. You pay only for what you need with no minimum commitments or upfront fees. And other factors determining pricing include requests and data transfers out of Amazon Glacier. So incoming data transfers are free. Outgoing, again, uh, will charge you. Amazon Snowball. With Amazon AWS Snowball, you pay a service fee per data transfer job and the cost of shipping the appliance. So remember, the Amazon Snowball is the actual suitcase that you can uh, have from AWS side in order to quickly get your data into AWS. Each job includes the use of a Snowball appliance for 10 days of on-site usage for free. Anything more than 10 days, you will be charged. So data transfer into Amazon S3 is free. Data transfer out of Amazon S3 is priced per region. Just as a fact, so you will not be tested in the exam. The Snowball 50 terabytes will cost you $200 and the Snowball 80 terabytes will cost you $250. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will create a bucket in AWS and we will also run some operations with objects or files. So now let's switch over to AWS Management Console and get started right away. Alright, so I have logged into AWS Management Console. And before we start, please know that we are currently working in Virginia, US East 1, Northern Virginia. And this is really important because now if we start and click on services and go under storage in S3, you will see that it changes here and now it says global. So S3 does not require region selection. And this is something um, uh, that you really have to, to bear in your mind to keep it there for your exam. As well, another option, another another AWS service to say so would be IAM, so Identity and Access Management. This service as well does not require any region selection. So now let's create our first bucket. So I'll just click Create Bucket. And the very first thing that you need to do is enter a bucket name. So please enter DNS compliant bucket name. And this means that the name has to be unique. For example, if I type test and click on next, it will say that the bucket name already exists. So somebody created a bucket with this name. I will say AWS CCP just to try it. So bucket exists. So let's say dash V1, so version one. I will leave the region here and let's imagine that we have uh, some applications, some servers that will use uh, data stored in this bucket and uh, the servers um, are deployed in Northern Virginia. So that's why I'm leaving this one here. Uh, let's configure some options now. So I could enable versioning. So keep multiple versions of, uh, of our documents in the same bucket. This is not uh, what we need, just that you need to know it exists. We could also enable server access logging or we could also add tags, object level logging, so even more deep. Default encryption, we could also enable encryption in, uh, in this bucket, but we will not do anything. We will just keep the defaults and click next. In terms of permissions, block public access uh, bucket settings. So if I leave this one here checked, block all public access, it will be very, very hard in order to enable access to this bucket. So I want to, to do some testing after I upload the, um, the, the documents to this bucket. So I will just untick it and just click next. Now we can review our selection and create bucket. So now we have our very, very first bucket in AWS, AWS CCP version one. And this is similar to, um, to a folder. So if I click on this one, Immediately, immediately I get some properties, permissions and management uh, to the right. I can also say here, edit public access settings. And as you can see here in the access column, it says that objects can be public, which means that they are not necessarily public. 
So let's go on and explore a little bit the options. Edit public access settings will just lend me the page that I got when I created the bucket, so nothing really important. Let's go on inside. And inside the bucket we have properties, permissions and management. Let's click on properties. These are different features that I can enable uh, for this bucket. So versioning to keep multiple versions of an object in the same bucket. Server access logging, static website hosting. This is very, very nice. Host a static website which does not require server side technologies. Object level logging, default encryption and some, some advanced settings like transfer acceleration. We have talked about it in the theoretical lecture um, as well. In terms of permissions, these are the block public access settings. We know this already. We can also go for a bucket policy and paste it here. This is more advanced configuration and we'll address this in the associate um, course. Course configuration, nothing really uh, to, to bother of now. Management, we can also ha add some management here in uh, for this bucket, for example, life cycle. So something like uh, add a life cycle rule while I now uh, have the objects in the standard storage class after some time I will uh, trans uh, transition them to, let's say, infrequently accessed and maybe to Glacier or Deep Archive later. Replication, cross-region replication. We have also mentioned this feature. Analytics, metrics, and some kind of inventory. So these are the, the main features of the bucket and what we can really explore. Now we can also go and upload some content. So desktop, AWS CCP, and I have prepared two objects here, textfile.txt and the cloud practitioner badge. So I will choose now these ones in order to upload them. I could upload them right now or I can just go uh, just the way I did for the bucket through the options. So for example, in the properties, I can select here what is the storage class I want and, uh, you know, like define Glacier, Glacier Deep Archive or just uh, leave it the default the standard one so let's click next so it is not encrypted some metadata tag here and the storage class is standard so i'll click now just upload and i should have in a moment two objects here and there they are cloud practitioner png and text file.txt if for example i click on the cloud practitioner png i get here the object url and if i just copy it and try to access it. Let me just do that now, clicking on it. It says that access is denied. So why is that? Let's investigate a little bit. Now, in order to make this, um, this object public, I could say make public, and there it is. And if I now click on the link, here is the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner badge. Now, let me get back and look at the second object, so the text file. Another way to make it uh, public would say would be to go to permissions and click here on everyone and enable read object. All right, this object will have public access. So click on save. And if I go now to text file and click on the object URL, so HTTPS S3 Amazon AWS dot com slash. And this is the bucket name AWS CCP version one and then the real key of the uh, of the object so the name text file.txt if i click on it here it is this is a text file one last thing before we wrap up this section are properties and these properties are related to the object this time so not to the whole bucket storage class encryption metadata tags and object lock this is something that i can configure specifically for this object only in terms of permissions, me as the account owner have permissions like to read the object, read object permissions and write object permissions. While in terms of public access for everyone, there is only um, permission for reading the object and nothing, nothing more. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will work in AWS CLI and we will copy a file from the EC2 instance to Simple Storage Service or S3. All right, so first thing, let's SSH to the instance. SSH minus I and then the PEM file and then EC2-user at and then the public IP. 
and I should be connected, right? Perfect. Then I have to create a file in order to upload it to S3. So let's create, now we have no files. Good, and I'm in home EC2 user, good. Let's say nano, and because I have mentioned um, previously quite a couple of times about copying snapshots from EC2 to S3, let's create a file just like that, snapshot dot what I will say txt and this is my first snapshot follow only incremental good control x then yes and enter and now ls with list snapshot.txt if I want to see the file cut snapshot great now i would like to upload this file and this is um, basically a simulation of uploading a real snapshot of the ec2 instance into s3 i want to upload it into my s3 bucket so now let's let's see how we can do that the command is aws s3 so this is the service and then copy and i would have to say here um, s3 colon colon then the the bucket name and let's see exactly it was aws ccp dash version one and i forgot to say exactly what to copy copy snapshot.txt if and if i do this it says unable to locate credentials so it will need some credentials to log into s3 if i just say amazon s3 ls so i want to list the content in the in the s3 in simple story service and i hit enter it says unable to locate credentials you can configure credentials by running aws configure so now let's do this aws configure and enter and now i'm being asked aws access key id and i can type here the the exact access key and this refers to what we have seen when defining a user in identity and access management with programmatic access so now let's go to identity and access management and grab the access key id and secret access key all right so recently visited services iam i will click on iam and then i will go to users and now i have here user one and this is administrator access group which is good it will have permission to copy a file from the ec2 instance um, going for forward to s3 so i'm clicking on the user and if i click on security credentials i can see here the access key but i don't longer see the password so in order to have the password available i will just make this inactive or just click on this one in order to delete it and i will say again create access key so access key id and secret access key these are available only when you actually create the user so i'll say here show and i will say copy download the csv file as well so paste here and enter and the secret access key i will take it with copy and paste it here as well now the default region we are using us dash east dash one and nothing here enter now if i say aws the service s3 and ls for list i can see now the bucket aws ccp version 1 that's good so what i need now is to copy the file i can also create a bucket and i can do this aws s3 mb aws ccp let's say version 2 let's see if it creates the bucket no the format is not good so let's say s3 and the bucket name make bucket so if i now say again aws s3 ls i can now see two buckets in my aws account good now let's try to copy the file to any of the buckets so i have here the snapshot.txt i will say aws s3 the command is cp for copy what do i want to copy is snapshot so 
is snapshot.txt and the location is s3 colon slash slash and the name of the bucket so let's try aws ccp and then version 1 and it says that it has uploaded the file let's take a look in the web console so close here and i'll go to aws so the home page and i'll go to s3 and take a look in aws ccp version 1 and here it is snapshot.txt if i click on it obviously it's not available now because i have to say make public and it will be so now i can access it but that's a different thing so coming back here this is how you create a bucket again aws s3 and then the command so copy or mb for make bucket and so on so we have now accessed s3 simple storage service from ec2 using the credentials of a user of a user that has been configured with administrative access another option would be to use roles we have also talked about roles at the beginning of this um, of this module so let's first delete the credentials that i have defined here on this ec2 instance we can do this by going to this folder which has the credentials here so if i look at the credentials I can see the exactly access key ID and the secret access key that I have defined earlier. So what I can do is say get out of it ls okay I'm here I can say rm so remove recursive forced and delete this folder. Let's try to access it again so it's not here. If I say aws s3 and ls now it says unable to locate credentials. You can configure credentials by running AWS configure. So what we can do now is attach a role that has permissions to S3 in order to do the same thing. So let, now let's go to AWS management console and let's go to services and we'll go under security identity and compliance to IAM and let's go to roles. So we have some roles here. Actually, I have one, but I will create another one so that you can see the exact process. So choose a service that will use this role. It will be an EC2 instance and I will click next. For permissions, I will search for S3 and I will attach this uh, Amazon S3 full access and say next. No tags. The role name would be S3 dash administrator dash uh, actually it's underscore and access and just create role so this role s3 administrator access allows ec2 instances to call aws services on your behalf great now we have to uh, attach this role to the ec2 instance so let's go to services and then go to ec2 um, ec2 just under compute let's now go to our running instance and this is our web server just click on actions and instance settings and here it is attach or replace any IAM role that you have defined the IAM role is s3 underscore administrator access and apply and close so here it is IAM role this is something that you also can define when you actually launch the instance but we haven't defined one then we have attached it uh, attached it right now so coming back to my aws cli if i just retype the again retype the command again now i can have access to these uh, buckets aws ccp version 1 and version 2. now let's stop for a bit before we wrap up and think why are roles more secure why would you go for the roles and not use any um, any user that you have previously defined if for example the ec2 instance get hacked then it means that the hacker has access to your credentials while using roles as you see now um, i have no credentials stored on this machine it is using a role and if you just recall what i have talked about in the theoretical lecture roles are the same as users and groups in mean meaning that they just perform authentication and not storing the credentials on the EC2 instance makes sense from a security perspective, as you can understand.
Thank you and see you in the next section. This concludes Module 4, AWS Core Services, the backbone of AWS. Congrats for your progress on the course, you have learned a lot really in this module. Before sitting the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, please make sure you are comfortable with the AWS Core Services covered in this module. Let's now go over the most important topics covered in this module and the exam hints. We have started our discussion in this module with Identity and Access Management or IAM. AWS Identity and Access Management helps you securely control access to AWS resources. You use IAM to control who is authenticated, and this means signing in, and authorized, which gives you permissions, in order to use what resources. IAM authentication and author authorization have been discussed in this module. We have talked about user group role, which relates to authentication, and the policy document, which relates to authorization. A user is a permanent named operator, it's, it can be a human or uh, just another AWS service and very important, it has permanent authentication credentials. A group is a collection of users and usually contains multiple users. A user can belong to multiple groups. A role is an operator as well, just like a user. A role can be as well a human or another AWS service, but this one has temporary authentication credentials. And last, policy documents enforce authorization or just handle permissions um, to, to the AWS service that is authenticated or to the user that is authenticated. Next, we have also talked about VPCs, so Virtual Private Cloud. A Virtual Private Cloud or VPC is a virtual network dedicated to your AWS account, as an example 10.0.0.0.16. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud enables you to launch AWS resources into the virtual network that you define. AWS VPC is literally your data center in the AWS cloud. Next on our list is the Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2. AWS Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 provides scalable computing capacity in the Amazon Web Services cloud. This is literally the virtual machines in AWS that you will build and please note that the correct terminology that you should use and also for the exam in the real world is instances and not virtual machines. There are four ways to pay for Amazon EC2 instances, on-demand instances, reserved instances, spot instances and dedicated hosts. With on-demand instances you pay for compute capacity per hour or per second depending on which instances you run. Amazon EC2 spot instances allow you to request spare Amazon EC2 computing capacity for up to 90% of the on-demand price. Amazon EC2 reserved instances provide you with a significant discount, so up to 75% compared to on-demand instance pricing. Amazon dedicated host is a physical EC2 server dedicated for your use. This means that you will not use um, this resource, the dedicated host, with another customer. It's only only for you. We have also talked about security groups or SGs. AWS security groups act as a virtual firewall for your EC2 instances to control inbound and outbound traffic. Security groups enforce security at the instance level. This is very important and not at the subnet level. Different EC2 instances can have different security groups applied. In a security group, you add rules that control inbound traffic to instances and separate rules that control outbound traffic. Elastic Block Store or EBS Amazon Elastic Block Store provides block-level storage volumes for use with EC2 instances. EBS volumes are highly available and reliable storage volumes that can be attached to any running instance that is in the same availability zone. We have seen in the lab that you will deploy or you will just create an Amazon EBS in the same availability zone in order to be available for attachment to the EC2. EBS volumes that are attached to an EC2 instance are exposed as storage volumes that persist independently from the life of the instance. So there are a couple of types of EBF volumes. So SSD volume times. Uh, we have general purpose SSD or GP2, this is the best balance between price and performance. Provisioned IOPS SSD or IOL, this is the highest performance SSD volume that you can get with AWS. 
Now the legacy one, HDD or hard drives, throughput optimized HDD or ST1. This is good for low cost and frequently accessed throughput intensive workloads. The last one, cold hard drive or SC1, lowest cost, less frequently accessed workloads choice. Now in terms of pricing, very important for your exam, Amazon EBS pricing depends on the following. So on the volumes, total storage of all EBS volumes and you will be charged as gigabytes per month. Snapshots, total snapshot storage consumed in AWS S3. EBS snapshot copying between regions is also charged, so please know that. Data transfer inbound is free, outbound, so out of uh, Amazon is charged. Last, we have talked about Simple Storage Service or S3. Amazon S3 or Amazon Simple Storage Service provides object storage through a web service interface. With Amazon S3, you can store and retrieve any amount of data at any time from anywhere on the web. You can use S3 to store like files, documents, pictures, videos, whatever. You know, so this is object storage. This is what I'm uh, referring to when I'm saying object storage. And this is not good for operating system storage. Elasti Elastic Block Store or EBS has been built for this. Now, in terms of Amazon S3 key concepts, let's talk about a container. Um, so the bucket is a container for object store in Amazon S3. Every object in S3 is contained in a bucket. And I would like you to think of a bucket as a folder where you can store objects or files. Very, very, very important bucket names are globally unique. And this is what, um, what Amazon calls DNS compliant. In terms of data consistency model, Amazon S3 provides read after write consistency for puts of new objects in your S3 bucket in all regions. This means you can access the object immediately after it was copied or put in S3 bucket. Well, Amazon S3, S3 offers eventual, eventual consistency for override puts and deletes in all regions. So this means that if you update or delete an object in S3 bucket, the change will eventually be propagated and visible uh, to everyone around the world in Amazon S3. We have also talked about storage classes. So the standard storage class is used for performance sensitive use cases and frequently accessed data. Also now we have talked about the infrequently accessed storage classes. We have two types here. So the standard IA and the one zone IA. These are designed for long-lived and infrequently accessed data and you should plan to store the data for a minimum of 30 days commitment. The standard IA now. So Amazon S3 stores the object data redundantly across multiple geographically separated AZs. Objects are resilient to the loss of an AZ. Standard one zone IA, Amazon S3 stores the object data in only one availability zone. However, the data is not resilient to the physical loss of the availability zone. So if the AZ fails, then you will not be able to access your data. Next, the data archiving uh, storage classes, Glacier. Data stored in this storage class has a minimum storage duration period of 90 days and can be accessed in uh, one to five minutes using expedited retrieval. The last one is Deep Archive, minimum storage duration period of 180 days and a default retrieval time of up to 12 hours. This is the lowest cost storage option you can get in AWS. We have also talked about two cool features in AWS S3. You could uh, speed up the transfer uh, of any files that you would upload in an S3 bucket that is far, far away, enabling transfer acceleration. The main point is that you would upload the, um, the file to a location that is near to you, to an edge location, and then AWS will use the CDN network in order to speed up the transfer of your file into the far distance um, S3 bucket. Now the next one is the cross-region replication. So you can define here that the content in your S3 bucket should be replicated once any file arrives there to another bucket. And it was an example with Seattle and Melbourne S3 buckets. The last thing to talk about is Amazon S3 pricing. Amazon S3 provides the simplicity and cost effectiveness of pay-as-you-go pricing. You pay only for the storage you use with no minimum fees. Price will depend on the following. Storage class. So you upload your files uh, first in the, in the standard storage class and then your files can be moved to infrequently accessed or uh, deep archive storage classes if you choose to do so. You'll also be charged based on storage, so number and size of objects. 
based on requests you'll be charged with uh, get requests that come from your clients and you'll also be charged on the data transfer so this is a rule of thumb for aws data transferred out of amazon s3 will come with charges for you so in our next module we will start to deep dive on each of the aws key services with a real hands-on and practical approach so please be ready to use your aws account extensively with that said, please join me in our next module, module 5, AWS key services that you need to know following the same approach as in this module, really hands on and I do think it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you and see you in the next module. Welcome to module 5, AWS key services that you need to know. This module covers AWS key services relevant to the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam highlighted in the official exam blueprint. We will start this module covering AWS Route 53 service and continue with CloudFront Application Load Balancer and Auto Scaling. For every topic covered in this module, we will first lay down the foundation from a theoretical perspective and then we will jump to AWS Management Console or AWS CLI for hands-on labs. By the end of this module, you will have a good understanding and also gain hands-on experience with services like Relational Database Service, AWS Lambda, Elastic Beanstalk, CloudFormation, Simple Notification Services, and also AWS CloudWatch. We will wrap up Module 5 after going through a fast recap on all topics covered in this module and exam hints relevant for the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. With that said, let's get started. In this section, we are going to talk about Route 53 AWS service, but it's honestly going to be more of a discussion about DNS because this is what Route 53 is, is AWS DNS service. So DNS first stands for Domain Name System and acts as the phone book of the internet. When you want to call someone and you don't know the phone number, you look it up in the phone book, so yellow pages or something similar to that and you find there an association between the person's name and the phone number. So as an example, I'm looking for William Stone's phone number and I can find that in the phone book. It is plus one for USA International, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And then I can make the call. So you can then call Mr. William because now you know this gentleman's phone number. Uh, DNS solves a similar prob problem, but this is for the internet worldwide. Let's have an example. So this user is trying to access aws.amazon.com. And because in the IT, let's say in the IT world or anything related to IT, we communicate using IPv4 or IPv6 uh, v6 addressing, then it means that this user would need to know what is the IP address again IPv4 or IPv6 of aws.amazon.com and because um, the laptop doesn't know that it will ask something that is called a DNS server and the DNS server actually keeps a, a mapping between the name in this case aws.amazon.com and a public real public IPv4 address and actually that's a real IP, IP address um, I, just, uh, I just found that by pinging aws.amazon.com so the laptop will ask the DNS server, hey, Mr. DNS server, what's the IP address corresponding to this name? Then the DNS server will just handle this request and return the IP address, which means that now the user can uh, access the specific page, aws.amazon.com, and that's with all you know. You need to know with the, with the DNS. Now, returning back to um, Amazon Route 53, Amazon Route 53 is a highly available and scalable domain name system DNS web service. It is designed to give de developers and businesses an extremely reliable and cost-effective way to route end users to internet applications by translating names like example.com into the numeric uh, IP addresses like 192.0.2.1 that computers use to connect to each other. What else does the, the, the Route 53? You can use Amazon Route 53 in order to register um, a domain name. And this is something we will do 
in the next section we will register a new domain and we will also uh, deploy static website now in terms of pricing for amazon route 53 amazon route 53 pricing is based on two things something that is called hosted zone and you'll see in the next section although it's not relevant for the certified cloud practitioner exam uh, you will see exactly what it is anyway you will pay 50 cents per hosted zone per month so anything in amazon is on a monthly basis and also you are going to be charged based on the number of queries you're gonna pay 40 cents per million queries per month thank you and see you in the next section in this section i will register a domain on aws route 53 and then i will use that domain in order to create a static website on amazon s3 so let's switch over to aws management console and get started so let's proceed please click on services and then go down to networking and content delivery and here it is aws route 53 so click on route 53 and then i can select from uh, these four options for our first step we need to register a new domain so domain registration so yes let's get started now i will have to either register a domain or transfer one so we want a new domain so i'll click on register domain now i can choose a domain name for example let's say aws training bootcamp.com yes this is it so aws training bootcamp.com let's check the availability and it looks like the domain is available great now before we start with the registration please note that in order to serve the content from an s3 bucket uh, and transform that bucket basically in your website you would need to have a bucket with the same name that you register the domain so in my case aws training bootcamp.com so before i go ahead and do the registration i will just try and see if it's uh, available so the the bucket so what i will do now is right click on services and i will open a new tab so services and i'll go to s3 and let me just try and see if this is available so right click and paste and i will say create bucket so right let me just say cancel so this is where you search for a specific bucket click on create bucket the dns compliant name let me see if it's available and it looks like it is so aws trainingbootcamp.com i will click on create now the first thing that we can see here for this specific bucket it says that bucket and objects are not public so we want to change this either select it and go to edit public settings and click save or you can just go ahead and enter the bucket and then go to permissions and here it says on so i will click on edit and uncheck it and save so again i have to type confirm so here it is and confirm so it should be good now public access set, public access settings have been updated successfully great let's click on overview and go to amazon s3 so now it says that objects can be public which uh, really doesn't mean that objects will be public so what you need to do is go to permissions and go here in the bucket policy Bucket policy uses JSON-based access policy language to manage advanced permission to your Amazon S3 resources. And if you just search in AWS uh, documentation, you will see here this one permissions required for we website access. The following sample bucket policy grants everyone access to the objects in the specified folder. So this is something that we need. And I will copy this one and the bucket policy will also be available for download if you want to, to do the registration yourself so let me just get back to s3 and i'll go to bucket policy paste it here and i will click save and policy has inv invalid resource which means that i have to put this one here amazon resource name i will take it copy and replace the example bucket so paste and let's try again save and this is totally different this bucket has public access you have provided public access to this bucket 
We highly recommend that you never grant any kind of public access to your S3 bucket. But this is something that we want because we want to transform this bucket into a website. So going back to Amazon S3, we can see that for access, objects are, are not in this position now. So the status is not objects can be public, but the, the access is really public. So before we continue with the domain name registration, let's do this. I will go in the bucket and upload some files. And I will go into my folder and into text, uh, into website, sorry. So I will just take this ones and I will say choose and I will say upload. So these ones are going to be uploaded, perfect. Now, one more thing I forgot to do in the properties, very important. This is the feature that we will use, static website hosting. So host a static website which does not require server side technologies. So if you click on it, you can say, use this bucket to host a website. The, uh, the endpoint is used as the website address. And you can say here, like you can, you can type like two documents. I have uploaded index and error.html. For index.html, it says that this is the home or default page of the website. And for the second one, this is returned when an error occurs. And you can name this whatever you want. But I have said that this is the index.html and the second one, error.html. So I'll click save. And yes, bucket hosting is now ticked, so everything looks great. Coming back, this is public. We're hosting in uh, US East 1 in Northern Virginia. So here I have the index.html and error.html. These are the two uh, PNGs, so pictures that are available. So now let's get back to Route 53. So let's continue now with this one. So I'll add to cart and I will say continue. And now I have to fill in all of the contact details for this one first domain. My register, administrative and technical contacts uh, are the same. So let me just fill in these ones now. All right, so registration was successful. As you can see here, thank you for registering your domain to AWS Route 53. Your registration request for the following one domain had been successfully submitted. And here is the domain, AWS Training Bootcamp.com. So what next? Going to domains. It says that domain registration is in progress and it should be, let's say, fulfilled in a couple of hours, maybe 24 hours. Although in the previous page was said that it could take up to three days. So anyway, I will just pause the, the, uh, the registration and I will come back to you once I receive the confirmation from AWS. All right, so I'm back in AWS Management Console. Honestly, AWS services have improved a lot and are continuously being uh, improved. It took around 15 minutes until I received the confirmation from AWS. So now let me just refresh the page. And let's say register domains now. So it is no longer in the pending requests. AWS training bootcamp.com is now uh, shown up in registered domains. So if I click on AWS training bootcamp.com, I can now go ahead and manage DNS. So I'll click on this. I'll select it. And then I can say, so let me just take a look, create record set. This is what we want. I'll click on this one. And AWS training bootcamp.com. I will create an alias for this. This is a type A record, DNS record which means that I have now the possibility to select a target and the target is actually the, uh, the S3 bucket. So I will select this one and just say create. And here I have the DNS, uh, the DNS record. It is a type again. So it is an alias going to this, uh, going to this bucket. So going back to the previous uh, section we went through an example so if a user will, will try to go to aws training bootcamp.com that request will be forwarded to the s3 bucket which is now serving statically content to the user so let's try now to connect to aws training bootcamp.com website enter and here it is welcome to aws certified cloud practitioner training bootcamp
Now, if I say awstrainingbootcamp.com slash something that is not okay, I will just say enter. Then I will be presented the error.html uh, HTML content. So resource not available. Anyway, not available. So pretty much that's it with registering a new domain with AWS route 53. And then also going to S3, creating a bucket with the same name like the domain name, making it public. So also configuring it with this option, static website hosting. And that should be everything that you should do if you want to host a static website with AWS. All in all, you don't have to do it in order to pass the certified cloud practitioner exam. It's just like um, a great example of how you can just use different AWS services in order to create cool stuff in the cloud. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we are going to talk about CloudFront basics. This topic is not new. We have addressed the CloudFront and also the AWS Content Delivery Network in Module 2 when we discussed about the global infrastructure with the regions, availability zones, and also edge locations. Amazon CloudFront is a web service that speeds up the distribution of your static and dynamic web content to your users. CloudFront delivers your content through a worldwide network of data centers, and these are called edge locations. When a user requests content that you're serving with CloudFront, the user is routed to the edge location that provides the lowest latency so that content is delivered with the best possible performance. So again, edge locations are AWS endpoints that cache content locally. Let's now go through an example. So consider that a user comes online in North America, somewhere around Seattle, and will request a file that is stored in an Amazon S3 bucket all the way in Melbourne. So the content will be delivered, that's for sure, but it will take some time. And in order to accelerate this and provide a better user experience, you could enable CDN, so CloudFront, with, uh, with the content delivery network. And when a user requests the same file, then the content will be delivered locally through an edge location and uh, also meaning that through the CDN, the content delivery network. So that's all that you have to know for the certified cloud practitioner exam. And we can just move on. More information about it and also about the global infrastructure at aws.amazon.com slash about aws global infrastructure. So some conclusion now, CloudFront helps you deliver your web content faster to your end users, thus providing a better user experience. CloudFront edge locations bring the web content closer to your viewers and make sure that popular content can be served quickly. If the content is not popular enough, it will be aged out, meaning that it will not be cached locally at, uh, at the edge location. So CloudFront regional edge caches really help when the content is not popular enough to stay at the CloudFront edge location and improve delivery performance for that specific content. In terms of CloudFront pricing, well, you have now signed for one year with a free tier account here at AWS. And for every month during this year, you will receive 50 gigabytes of data transfer out, so out of, um, out of AWS, and 2 million HTTP or HTTPS requests. After this period, you will go with the on-demand pricing. And again, per month, for example, for the first um, 10 terabytes, you will pay like 8 cents or up to 25 cents. So this is extremely low cost. Uh, there are also other levels, so after this for 10 uh, terabytes, then you have the next 40 terabytes and so on. And a complete list you can find here at aws.amazon.com slash cloudfront slash pricing. So thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will create a CloudFront distribution and then we will test the website speed. I'm now in AWS Management Console and before we configure the CloudFront distribution, I would like to do some testing and see exactly what is the current status. So this is the website and it is functional. We can, uh, we can serve static content from the, the Amazon S3 bucket. So I will go now into Web Inspector 
and uh, this kind of option is available with other browsers as well i'm using safari and in safari if you select network here you can see when you refresh the when you refresh the website what is the current uh, let's say latency so in this case 133 milliseconds and i can do more than this i can just keep on refreshing and it is somewhere around 130 150 milliseconds now the idea is that if we implement the cloud front distribution we should have less than that and i've seen cases where latency between 300 and 400 milliseconds have been uh, has been improved up to 30 40 milliseconds and that's really really great it really depends on the distance between you the the current user and the s3 bucket where the content is being uh, is being stored so in order to proceed please go to aws management console and go to services and we should go down under networking and content delivery here it is cloudfront so please click on cloudfront all right so here is the start page amazon cloudfront getting started so i'll just click on create distribution and there are basically two steps step number one select delivery method and step number two just to create the distribution i will click on get started and now i have to select the origin domain name i can see here the amazon s3 buckets i have three buckets and uh, the one that we are interested in is the aws training bootcamp.com s3 amazon aws so this is the s3 bucket where we have defined the static website and where we have put the content for this website right so i'll just select it and honestly just for this testing there's nothing i have to modify here there's also distribution settings where you also select how much of the edge uh, the content delivery network and the edge locations you'd like to use so you could say use only us canada and europe or use us canada europe asia middle east africa or all of them which means best performance but also the the highest price as well that you will pay for so i will leave everything default now and scroll down and click on create distribution so it will take some time until the the distribution is created the cloud from distribution is created currently it says the state is enabled and the status is in progress so now i will just let's say take a look here i just click on that one and when everything is done in order to, to connect to our website through CloudFront, we'll take from the domain name everything that is here and we'll connect to that website with this specific, um, let's say, fully qualified domain name. So anyway, we will not use the, um, the, let's say, the domain we have created, AWS training, training Bootcamp.com, but we will use what we have in the domain name within CloudFront distribution. So what we'll do now, I'll just click on distribution. I'll wait until the status will change, so not in progress, and I will just pause the recording now and get back to you when it's done. All right, so deployment has been successful. Everything uh, has been deployed and we are ready to test. As you can see, the status is deployed. State, of course, is enabled. I will click on this CloudFront distribution. I want to use the domain name. So I will take this one and I'll open a new tab in order to test this um, the speed and latency of the current website delivered through cloudfront this time so now i am using the cloudfront distribution domain name page is loading just fine let's examine the latency so develop and the web inspector let's take a look here down the time so in the time column and i will now just refresh as you can see it's around 30 milliseconds as opposed to what we had when we were using the AWS training bootcamp.com, uh, let's say domain directly, 300, 160, 160, and so on. Thank you, and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover application load balancer basics. So now let's first start with an overview. With AWS Elastic Load Balancing, you can achieve fault tolerance for any application by ensuring scalability, performance, and security. Elastic Load Balancing automatically distributes incoming application traffic across multiple targets, and this is an example like EC2 instances. AWS Elastic Load Balancing supports three types of load balancers, and these are the network load balancers, classic load balancers, 
and application load balancers which is our subject in this section. If you want to go and search for a comparison between these types of load balancer, here is the link that you can follow aws.amazon.com slash elastic load balancing slash features. And you'll see that there is a comparison on a per feature basis and application load balancer is the first one, then the network one and then the classic one. Application load balancer is good for application traffic as the name says, HTTP and HTTPS. And if you, if you are also familiar with uh, the OSI model from the networking field, well, application load balancer really understands applications. You can define complex rules with URLs and, and stuff like that. So this is good when we need layer 7 as related to OC model um, visibility. Now the network load balancer is good for traffic, for intensive traffic, and it has visibility up to layer 4 which means uh, IP and also protocol and port number. And the last one, the classic load balancer, is considered now legacy and is not that much used. So let's now go through the components of the application load balancer architecture. The load balancer is the single point of contact for the clients. And when I say clients, I mean uh, people, users from the internet contacting or sending traffic to a specific application that is behind a load balancer. The load balancer distributes incoming application traffic, let's say web traffic, across multiple targets such as EC2 instances in multiple availability zones which results in increased availability of your application. The listener checks for connection requests from clients using the protocol and port number that you have configured and forwards this request to one or more target groups. You will define rules for traffic forwarding, including target groups, uh, condition and also the priority. The target group or TG routes requests to one or more registered targets, such as EC2 instances, using again the protocol and port number that you have configured. And the target can be registered with multiple target groups, as you will see in just a moment. Health checks are run on all target registered um, on, on all target registered to a target group. Now, this may be confusing to you, or um, anyway, not that clear if you're new to networking and also to to the cloud, to the cloud stuff. So I think that it's a good idea to go through a visual representation of all of these components. So let's say that a user comes online and initiates an HTTP or TCP port 80 traffic and it will reach an application load balancer. Now the application load balancer or inside the application load balancer as you will see, we will configure a listener and this listener is a process that really listens for traffic coming or um, arriving at HTTP port 80. So if this is the case, then the application load balancer will forward the traffic to the listener and within the listener you will configure a rule that says, okay, if I receive any traffic from, uh, uh, from any user on HTTP port 80, then I will forward that traffic to a target group configured for HTTP 80. And inside the target group you will have there uh, one or multiple targets or registered targets which in our case will be EC2 instances. We will also have something that is called a health check and the health, health check is really really useful for the listener in order to verify if the targets are available to receive traffic. So if one target for example is not available then it makes sense for traffic to not be the, um, let's say sent to that specific EC2 instance. So that's um, let's say in a nutshell everything that you need to know about the application load balancer. So as a comparison on the right side we have two target groups configured for HTTP port 8080 and HTTP 443 and we have a listener defined here with two rules. So traffic that will be arriving here at the listener for 80, um, 8080 as the port number will be forwarded to the left target group and traffic that it is originant uh, from any user and is des destined to HTTP 443 will arrive on the right target group. Now also please note that we have a target, so an EC2 instance that sits really on the boundary between the two and this is because a target can be a member of multiple target groups. Now in our next section 
Also, let's have a visual representation of what we'll configure in order to test these technologies and actually see how they work. So we will configure two web servers, web server number one and web server number two. And this will be configured in different availability zones in order to uh, achieve high availability and redundancy for our web traffic. So for our web server. Now we will configure an application load balancer and a listener that will wait for traffic arriving on port 80, so TCP 80 or just simple HTTP. And we also have a rule here configured saying that if I see any traffic coming here on HTTP, then I will forward this traffic to a target group that has these two web servers registered as, as targets there. So also we'll have a health check and the health check will be okay if i can reach the index.html file on the web server it means that the instance is available if that is not available then it means that uh, the health check will fail and i will not forward traffic to that specific web server as a verification we will just initiate traffic from our pc or laptop going to http 80 to the dns name of the application load balancer as you will see just in a moment and then the traffic will be forwarded to web server number one. If we re refresh the page, it will be load balanced. So again, we are talking about load balancer, right? And it will reach web server number two, then again, web server number one and web server number two, and that's it. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will create an application load balancer and test load balancing within AWS Cloud. So now let's switch over to AWS Management Console and get started. All right, so I am logged in AWS Management Console. Before we start, let's take a look at what we currently have here available in our account. So what I mean by this is, for example, if we now go to VPC, so just a small and short recap. We have one VPC that we have used up to now. So AWS CCP VPC. In terms of subnets, when we have defined this, um, this virtual private cloud, it was the first option with one public subnet. And because we said that these two instances will be uh, deployed in two different availability zones, it means that we need to deploy or configure just another subnet. So what we will do now is create another subnet. Let's call this, for example, public subnet one. And let's have it this way. And we'll just create another one. Before we do that, let's take a look at the, at the settings of this subnet. So if you look at the route table, we can see that two routes are available. So for anything that is going to be routed inside the VPC, 10.0.0.16, it will be used the built-in router. For anything leaving the VPC or coming from the internet, then it will be used an internet gateway. And I was saying that the internet gateway basically uh, performs static NAT for traffic uh, leaving the VPC and coming from the internet inside the VPC. So now I'll just create a subnet. Let's say that the subnet name will be public and subnet 2. The VPC will be AWS CCP VPC and the availability zone will not be US East 1A, will be US East 1B. So IPv4 space 10 0 this time 2.0 and slash 24. That's good. And I will just click on create. Let's click close and take a look. So now we have two subnets um, that are associated with this AWS CCP VPC. If I click on public subnet 2, I currently see that I have only routing local uh, or locally routing enabled. So I will need to do something in order to have here the default route as well. If I go on the route tables and take a look, actually, let me get back to the subnets. And this is public subnet 2, route table and edit route table association. So this is a2fe i will select the other one so c43 as the ending and now i have the same routing table associated with both subnets in this specific vpc so just click save 
and close. So I used the same routing table for both of the of the subnets, public subnets as they are uh, named. Just look here in the route table column. I have the same routing table. Great. Now I can start and deploy the two subnets. So the the two the two EC2 instances. Sorry about that. So I will just go to EC2, and you will now also see how I can also shut down, terminate, and delete a specific instance. So with this one selected, the web server, I will go on actions, or you could say right click. That's the same, and instance state and terminate and i will click yes terminate now so now we will deploy web server one in uh, the first availability zone and web server two in the second one so click on launch instance we will use amazon linux 2 ami so click on select the instance type is going to be the t2 micro this is free tier eligible so we will not pay for for the usage i will click on configure instance details and now we have the, the possibility to do some, uh, to make some choices. So I will click our VPC. For the first subnet, I will use here public subnet 1 in US East 1 availability zone. For the auto assign public IP, I will select here enable. And this is because I want to be able to connect to this specific instance. Let me just take a look here. The network interface, I will not do anything here. Okay, so let's just continue now. So add storage. I will leave the default here and click on add tags. As a tag, I can say here name and this is going to be web server, let's say 01. I will click on configure the security group and I will select an existing security group. I will go with the SG security group AWS CCP VPC. And as you can see here for the inbound rules, so traffic that it, it is arriving at this specific instance, uh, port 80, so TCP 80 or HTTP, it is permitted from, from what source, from any source around the globe. So I will now just click on review and launch. So this is the review and launch. Now I have to select an existing key pair. I will use the one that I have used up to now. So I will just acknowledge and click on launch instances so view instances and here is the one that is being deployed now so web server 01 t2 micro us east 1a and pending so if i click on it and now i have access to the public ip i will just copy it and connect to it through ssh in my terminal now all right so now let's connect through ssh let me see if I have here and I do have, where is it? See, here is the PM file. So this is the private key. So let's say SSH minus I, and then we have to uh, communicate here the, the PEM file. So the authentication private key file. And then we will say the username. So EC2-user and then the specific IP. So I'll connect to that and I will say yes. And now I am in the EC2 instance. I will just say sudo su, which means that now I am the root user in this specific instance, so I can do whatever I want. First thing I will say yum update and minus y, and this will enable the update for this specific instance. And now I have the, um, the EC2 instance updated. I would like to install, so yum install Apache so I want this to be a web server and I will say minus Y in order to to have the uh, Yes option selected during the, the installation and Here it is Good now if I say service HTTPD so the um, HTTP daemon the HTTP process if I say here status Again, it says that it is available the although it says active inactive so it is not active we'll have to start it so just up and say start and if i now check the status again it says that it is active and running in green perfect so now going to var www dot slash sorry about that so html i have nothing here now I will define the index.html file. So nano 
index.html file. Let me just grab the code for this. And this code will be available as a resource for, for this specific section. So I'm just saying that when any user will access this specific uh, web server, the page that will be displayed is web server number one or web server zero one. So now control X and I will say, I will just press on Y for yes and then enter and that's it with the configuration. Now if I say cat and the index.html, I have this specific code here, so HTML code. Now let's get back to the AWS Management Console and test our web server. I will just refresh now and everything is in green. I can take this IP, so just copy it and I, or I can take the public DNS name, the full name, copy and let's just open a new tab and test functionality. And here it is, web server, web server number one or web server zero one. Now what we want to do also is to create the second server. So let's do that right now. So again, launch instance. We will use the Amazon Linux 2 AMI, so I'll select it. The instant instance type will be again T2 micro. We don't have to use anything uh, bigger than that. So let's configure instance details. Now we have to select the uh, VPC. And for this specific one, we'll use the other subnet, public subnet 2. And this is in US East 1B. So this is a different availability zone. We also have to enable here the public IP. So this is what we want. And I am role, nothing here. No, we can do here like advanced details. So this is something that you can use if you want to script your configuration. And again, what you will see in just a moment will be available as a, as a resource to be downloaded if you want to test it uh, on your own. So let me just paste it here and take a look. So the first line will inform the EC2 instance that this is a script. We will go into the root user and then we will update the box. We will install HTTPD or Apache. We will start the service. We will go into var www.html uh, slash HTML and we will just uh, echo or put this text into index.html and this is web server number two. So this means that when we launch this specific instance, we will not have to go uh, and SSH and perform manually all of these steps. But anyway, you will not be tested on this knowledge into the certified cloud practitioner exam. This is just to, to show you that the option exists and it will make your life easier in a production uh, environment. So now let's add storage. I will leave the default here. I will not modify anything, just add tags. And for a tag, I will say here the name is going to be web server and not number one, but web server zero two. And I will configure security group now. I will select an existing group and I will select the SG AWS CCP VPC. Again, this one permits HTTP traffic, so it's fine. Review on launch. We can now take a look at everything that we have configured and just click on launch. Selecting uh, that we acknowledge everything here and also that we will use this specific keeper. So just click on launch instance. I will click on view instances. And now we have web server 01 and web server 02. As you can see, they are in different availability zones. And they are also using, of course, different IP and different uh, public subnet as well. So what we'll do now is just take the IP and start refreshing the page so that we uh, hopefully see web server 02 as the result. So nothing, nothing yet. I will just keep on refreshing and hopefully when here says that it's good, hopefully we'll see here web server 02. Yeah, here it is. So now we have two web servers, web server 01 and 02 that are deployed in two separate availability zones. So we are now ready to test our, um, our configuration with load balancing. In order to do that, please navigate on the side menu here down to load balancing and click on load balancers. So now let's deploy our first load balancer. I will click on create load balancer. And here are the options we have talked about in the previous section, the theoretical one. Application load balancer, network load balancer, and the classic load balancer, which is also stated here that it is previous generation. So 
for the cloud practitioner exam we will use the application load balancer click on create so let's put a name here this is going to be an application load balancer next we can also define the listeners so a listener is a process that checks for connection requests using the protocol and port that you have configured we are going to configure a load balancer uh, that is going to listen for http and the port is 80. now here are the availability zones that um, the load balancer will process traffic to and if we select the aws ccp vpc we have only two availability zones so this is why we also configured a second um, a second public subnet so a second subnet for this specific vpc i will select both meaning that the load balancer will route traffic to the targets in these availability zones only so that's why i'm selecting both and i'll now click on configure secure settings this is related to https uh, inspection decryption and then uh, again encryption we will not do that we will use just simple http so for this reason i will click on next configure security groups i can use an existing one which is what i will do so i will select the second one the sg aws ccp vpc and now we have to configure routing so now i'll have to define a target group so let's say that this is tg target group and then web servers good the target type so where is going where is where is really traffic going to arrive or to to be destined to is going to arrive at an instance or multiple instances the protocol is http good port is http so traffic http port 80 now here are the health checks and if i look here it says the protocol load balancer uses when performing health checks on targets in this target group i want to check http and i want to go for index.html so this specific file exists so it will be it will be checked and if that exists then the target uh, will be used in order to to um, to send traffic to that specific target if it doesn't respond to this one to to index that html verification then it means that the instance is not available if you look here at the advanced health check settings there are multiple options i will just lower the the interval in order to have the instance um, let's say faster available for performing uh, let's say or to responding to HTTP requests coming from the internet next we'll have to register targets so who is actually going to receive the request well in this case it will be both of my web server 01 and web server 02 and add to register on what port on port 80 so I'll just click on add to registered and I will now have to say review and we're almost done so i'll click on create and i can see here that is being created i'll click on close let's take a look for example here at listeners so i have only one i am expecting only http port 80 traffic and this is the rule i was mentioning so the rule says that traffic is going to be forwarded to this specific target group tg web servers if i click on tg web servers or I click on target groups on the side menu so let's just click on this one I can see here exactly what are the targets so what are exactly the the targets so the instances in this case that will receive this specific uh, traffic now I can see here that the status the target registration is in progress so it is being checked now the availability of these specific two instances and when everything is performed and uh, successful you'll see here that the status will change to healthy great health checks i'm checking for this specific file and we have some tags no we don't have any tags for this target group so now let's wait for the targets to register and i'll just come back to you when uh, this is done all right so now the status has changed to healthy so if i just take a look here it says that this target is currently passing target groups health checks so we are good both of them are fine which means that both of them will receive the request and uh, will be able to respond to the client's request so now what we'll do is take a look here in the load balancing we'll just click on load balancers and let's take a look at our load balancer as you can see now this is an a type record so remember from the 
uh, Route 53 section. A ray, uh, an an A-type record is a record or DNS record that says for this specific um, uh, uh, DNS name, for this node endpoint name, there is an uh, IPv4 address at, uh, in the end that will be able to be resolved to. So it doesn't matter if the IP changes, if we have a DNS name available, we can use that. So I will just take it here with a click. It is copied. And what I will do, I will go now and say paste. So this is the application load balancer full, fully qualified domain name. If I just keep on refreshing, as you can see, we have web server 01 and web server 02 and 01 and 02 and 01 and so on. The last thing I want to test with you is go on and delete the index.html file or just uh, rename it and the health check should fail, which means that we should see only web server 01 or web server 02 depending on which uh, index.html file we will delete or just modify. So here I am back in web server 01. Let me just say ls. So this is the index.html. If we just say, let's say move index to index1.html. Let's say ls. So this has renamed the index file and the new name is index1.html. So what we'll do, let's get back to AWS Management Console. And if I take a look in the EC2 dashboard at the running instances and take a look at web server 01, if I just select it and take the public IP, let me just open a new tab and see here paste and go. Well, I can see that Apache is being installed. So this is Apache 2.4, but the index file is no longer there. So we do not see the web server 01. Good. Now let's get back to the load balancer. So on the side menu, I'll click on load balancers and I'll click on target groups and I'll go to targets. And now, as you can see here, web server 01, it's in the, uh, it has the status or it is in the status of unhealthy. Why? Because we, because we have the health checks defined here that I will check the full path going to index.html file. And if that file isn't there, then I consider that the target is not available. Maybe just the instance it's, um, uh, let's say, rebooting or it's anyway deleted. So that, what we can do now is the following. So we get back to the application load balancer and keep on refreshing. And we will see that only web server 2 will answer to our request because web server 01 is not that it is not available, but simply uh, it doesn't have here the health checks passed. So if I get back to the, um, the terminal now and modify again the... So here in index.html so now it should be the health check should be passed and I should be, um, let's say, passing traffic with this web server 01 as well. So let's see the status. I'll just keep on refreshing. It will take around 30 seconds to, to one minute, up to one minute. And let me just pause the recording now. So now both of the web servers are healthy, which means that if I refresh, then yes, now I have again both of the web servers answering to the client's request. Web server 01, 02, 01, 02, and so on. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS EC2 auto scaling basics. So first, let's try to answer this question. What is Amazon EC2 auto scaling? Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling helps you ensure that you have the correct number of Amazon EC2 instances available to handle the load for your application, which means going up or down, so not necessarily increasing the number of EC2 instances. EC2 instances are grouped, as you will see, in auto scaling groups um, in something like minimum number or desired number or maximum number of EC2 instances. These are different levels that we can configure in auto scaling groups and you will understand just in a moment what these are. 
Scaling policies will automatically launch or terminate instances as your application demands. So now let's go over the minimum, maximum and desired EC2 capacity. This is probably the key in understanding auto scaling groups. So you define an auto, an auto scaling group as we will do in the next section. We'll actually go on and lab this, uh, these technical topics, uh, theoretical ones and get some hands on experience. So again, you will define an auto scaling group. And in that specific auto scaling group, you say that, well, I would like this web server. Let's have an example, this web server to, to be sustained by three EC2 instances, maybe in three availability zones in order to, uh, to achieve um, a redundancy and also high availability. Now, okay, this is the desired capacity. So uh, three EC2 instances, but at one point you, st you see that, well, the capacity uh, needed could be only one because there's no so, um, so much traffic uh, hitting your web server and you can also define this one here the minimum capacity uh, you can lower your capacity of the auto scaling group manually or you can define scaling policy as you will see and uh, in a scaling policy you can say something like well if the average cpu of my auto scaling is i don't know um uh, 10% or 80% so some value then increase or decrease my EC2 uh, instances my number of EC2 instances at the same time as we uh, gone through an example with uh, with the Black Friday maybe we can also set a maximum capacity so if the application demands I will uh, approve let's say the increase so scaling out to a maximum of C uh, of, uh, of five EC2 instances as you can see on your screen now so again, minimum, desired and maximum. You start with the desired one. So desired, let's say three in this case, and then I can also adapt. So scale in or scale out depending on the, um, on the application. So now let's continue. As you will see in the next section, when we'll lab this, uh, these technologies, we will start defining a launch configuration. A launch configuration is an instance configuration template that an auto scaling group will use to launch EC2 instances. And you can see that uh, in the launch configuration, we will include um, basically everything uh, as you would do when you launch an EC2 instance. So the AMI ID or instance type, and then the key pair, security group, also the volumes so of the block storage. And again, these are the things that you'd normally define when you just launch an, an EC2 instance by itself. Now, auto scaling groups, an auto scaling group contains, as you, as you have seen in the previous uh, slide, a collection of Amazon EC2 instances that are treated as a logical grouping for the purposes of automatic scaling and management. Maintaining the number of instances in auto scaling group and automatic scaling are the core functionalities of the Amazon EC2 auto scaling service. The size of an auto scaling group depends on the number of instances you set as the desired capacity. So you will start with the desired capacity and then manually change to minimum or maximum or automatically have the, um, the number changed depending on the scaling policy. The uh, auto scaling group starts by launching the desired number of EC2 instances. Again, this is the desired capacity. In the example, we had three EC2 instances. You can use scaling policy to uh, increase or decrease the number of instances in your group dynamically to meet changing conditions. When the scaling policy is in effect, the auto scaling group adjusts the desired capacity of the group between the minimum and maximum capacity values and launches or terminates, it, or terminates the instances as needed. Again, our example is between one and five, and this is exactly what we will do in the next section. So in the previous section, we have played with web server 01 and web server 02 and load balancing for, um, for the purpose of, uh, of solving this next lab, we'll take web server one and we'll create our first AMI. So uh, an Amazon machine image, then we'll create the launch configuration with three desired EC2 instances, create the auto scaling group and also define dynamic auto scaling capabilities through scaling policies as you will see in just a moment. Thank you and see you in the next section.
In this section, we will create a launch configuration and also an auto scaling group. We will wrap up this section by playing a little bit with the scaling policies. So now let's switch over to AWS Management Console. All right, so now let's get started. Let's go ahead and navigate to EC2 console. So we are now in EC2 console and we currently have two running instances. So this is web server number one and number two from the previous section when we addressed the load balancing capabilities. So what I will do now, I will just terminate web server two. So instance state and terminate. And yes, I would like to terminate this instance. Now I will use web server number one in order to create an AMI, so Amazon machine image. And we will use that specific image when um, defining the launch configuration. So with web server number one being selected, I will go to actions and then go to image and create image. So I will say here as the image name, let's call this web server AMI image description web server ami and uh, let's say simple web server now what's the volumes included i will just leave the one that um, it's currently living with the web server number one so nothing here and i'll just click on create image so create image request received which, me which means that it will take some time and if you go here on the left side menu and click under images in AMIs, you will see here that currently the image is being uh, created, so the status is pending. Once this is done, we can go ahead and create the, uh, the launch configuration and also the auto scaling group. And we can find it here, scrolling down in the side menu with auto scaling launch configuration. So I'll click, click now on launch configuration and start with create launch configuration. And here, instead of going with the default Amazon Linux AMI or whatever image here, I will go to my AMIs and here is the image we have available. So web server AMI, simple web server. So I will just select it. And yes, I want it to be a T2 micro instance type. I will click on configure details. The name of the launch configuration, let's call this web server and launch configuration all right no i am no monitoring let's see in the advanced details no need to configure anything here in the ip address type only assign a public ip address to instances launched in the default vpc and subnet assign a public ip address to every instance why is that because uh, we will also select the vpc and we want to work in our vpc in AWS CCP VPC and I would like to create a new security group or choose an existing one let me just choose the one we have used up to now we have SSH enabled and also HTTP and HTTPS so that's good that's fine I will now click on review and we can also now review everything we have configured so this is the launch configuration on demand purchasing option EBS optimized, no, storage, anyway, everything we have selected is here. So now I'll click on create launch configuration. I'll have to choose an existing keeper or uh, to create a new one. The, the one that we have is fine, so just click on create launch configuration. Now we can also go ahead and uh, create an auto scaling group with this launch configuration, which is what we want. So I'll just click on this menu. And I will have to provide a name here. So group name, let's say, again, web server and auto scaling group, ASG. I would like to start, let's say, with three instances. And I will work in AWS CCP VPC. And I will use, so let's say we have only two subnets, that's fine. Public subnet one and also public subnet two. Uh, right health check grace period monitoring that's fine let's now go to configure scaling policies keep this group at its initial size or also we can use scaling policy to adjust the capability the, the sorry the capacity of this group so let's say that as in our example earlier 
I want to scale between one EC2 instance and up to five EC2 instances depending on what? Depending on the average CPU utilization and I will say that the value is 80%. And because we will not do anything with the EC2 instances, we will see that after the deployment of the three desired EC2 instances, most probably uh, the auto scaling group will scale in the size to one or two EC2 instances. So let's now go and say configure notifications. Here I can configure an email uh, in order to receive alarms or just notifications when something happens with the auto scaling group in, uh, in AWS. I can also go ahead and um, let's say create some tags here. So you can say name and this is the web server auto scaling group um, setup right so now review i can review everything so minimum is one desired is three maximum five i'm using these two subnets that i have available in um, aws ccp vpc now we'll just click on create auto scaling group initiating creating perfect so click on close and now let's analyze a little bit what's happening here so i'm on the left menu as you can see under auto scaling i mean auto scaling groups and we have only one here web server auto scaling group perfect we can take a look here in scaling policies and also instances first so as you can see here now already three ec2 instances are being deployed as the desired number we have configured so if i go now and let's say take a look in instances i will see web server 01 which is still here web server 02 we have terminated and we have another three web servers so let me just expand a little bit uh, three other web servers that are being deployed here as you can see now as um, as per our configuration so i can just click on the refresh and now i have three ec2 instances in the status of healthy if i take a look at scaling policies I see here that currently the policy type is target tracking scaling. Execute policy when is required to maintain an average CPU utilization at 80%. So the, the action that it will be taken is add or remove instances as required. All right, it will take some time, 300, uh, 300 seconds in order to detect that there is no traffic and most probably to do a scale in or reduce the number of EC2 instances. In the meantime, if I take any one, uh, any instance from uh, from the three, and I will just take the the public IP, I will say here, right click, paste, and go. And once it's done, I should see here the web server uh, index.html page. So let's see, initializing, initializing, none of them are ready. So again. Let's just wait for a little bit in order to uh, to finish the the let's say the deployment of these three EC2 instances, and also to see what's happening here with the number of instances. Once the auto scaling group will detect or the scaling policy will detect that three instances are too much for the current load. All right, so now all of the EC2 instances are in the running state and the status uh, checks look fine. So two out of two. So as you can see here, I'm, not, I'm now just refreshing the page of one of the EC2 instances that we have created. And indeed, I am provided the index.html content we have, uh, we have really configured in the previous section with Web Server 01. So now going back, we should analyze a little bit what's happening here. And once the necessary time passes, so it was in the scaling policies like 300 seconds to warm up after scaling so after everything is done and we have all of the uh, three instances available there's going to be 300 seconds uh, needed to wait so we, again i will pause the the recording and came back came back to you when uh, get back to you when we will see that some instances either will be um, let's say initiated or some of the existing existing ones will be uh, let's say terminated all right so it took around five to six minutes and now we, i can see here that two of the instances are in the terminating state 
So if I go and check for the instances and just refresh, I can see that web server SG, this one is terminated and this one is also terminated. And we, uh, we now have only one web server in the SG setup. Getting back, so here is what we have, only one. This one is going to be terminated and that's it. If you look at the scaling policy, it says here that um, it will execute the policy as required in order to maintain the average CPU utilization at 80%. And because I'm not doing anything on these uh, machines, probably the CPU is like 5-10%. And only one machine will uh, just solve this equation, like uh, having the CPU under 80%. Now, if I look here at the activity uh, history, I can see here first launching the EC2 instances and then another two actions like terminating these two instances. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover Relational Database Service or RDS basics. So now first, let's start with what is Amazon RDS? Amazon Relational Database Service or RDS is a web service that makes it easier to set up, operate and scale a relational database in the cloud. Now remember from the overview module, I think it was module 3, a database is just a location to store and retrieve data. Microsoft Excel is a great example. Think of spreadsheets in Excel where information is stored in columns and rows. Relational databases can use information from multiple tables and combine it, and that is create relations between the tables. And the example was in an Excel, we have three tables like courses, students and registration. And with the information that is stored, or at least a part of it, is stored in course table and also in students table, we can create a registration table using some information from this course and students table, which represents also relations. Now let's continue with the advantages of AWS RDS. You can easily allocate or increase resources as you need them on the fly. And I'm referring to CPU, so the processor, memory and also storage. You literally can forget about backups, operating system patches and also recovery. This is fully managed by AWS. And that's why this is called an AWS Managed Relational Database Service. Automated or manual backups for the database restoration is also managed by AWS. You can also achieve high availability with primary database and a synchronous secondary database. You can use read replicas to increase read scaling. So just read replicas, just to, to put a note on this, are um, Amazon RDS instances that are going to be used only for reading, so not for uh, writing also information there. Control who can access your database with, of course, AWS Identity and Access Management. Now let's talk about the Amazon RDS database instances. The database instance is the basic building block for AWS RDS. A database instance is literally just a database environment in the cloud. Each database instance runs uh, something that is called the database engine. And maybe it's not the, the best or the most, uh, the most correct one, but you can think of it as, as an operating system, but it's not like that. So each database instance runs a database engine and AWS supports popular ones like MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, Oracle, and also Microsoft SQL Server database engines. The database engines differ in terms of features and also the database engine controls the databases that it manages. Now let's continue now. The database instance class determines literally the CPU and memory the database will use. So you can choose here as you will see in the next section when we go through a lab that the database can have like one virtual CPU and one gig of RAM or more than that. When you select the storage for the database, you can choose from magnetic, general purpose SSD and also provision IOPS for the best performance. Each database instance has a minimum and maximum storage requirements and this depends on the storage type and database engine it supports. Now very important for Amazon RDS redundancy and high availability is the multi-AZ feature. So now we'll go through an example of multi-AZ deployment. So in a VPC you have a load balancer that is going to distribute traffic to 
your web server application that may be deployed in two availability zones, one in zoo, in order to achieve high availability, redundancy and also fault tolerance. Now, usually, if not most of the times, the web server application has some, uh, um, let's say, database that is running on the back and you can literally replicate the content on your primary database to a secondary database or secondary Amazon RDS that is going to be hosted in a different availability zone, of course, in order to achieve the same availability, redundancy and fault tolerance for your whole setup. Now, let's talk about the Amazon RDS security also. RDS security is implemented through security groups and you can allow access to the database by specifying IP address ranges or Amazon EC2 instances that will be allowed to access your database. Three types of security groups can be used. Database security group, which means uh, controlling access to a database instance that is not in a VPC. A VPC security group controls access to a database instance inside a VPC. And last one, Amazon EC2 security group controls access of an EC2 instance to the database. Now, one more thing, how can we interact? So AWS Management Console, the command line interface or CLI, and also AWS Software Development Kits. In terms of monitoring, you can use the free Amazon CloudWatch service to monitor the performance and health of a database instance. Performance charts are shown in the Amazon RDS console. Now, the last part of this section is Amazon RDS pricing. Amazon RDS costs depend on the following. Clock hours of server time. So you are going to pay for what you use and nothing more with no initial commitment. Database instance type also counts. Database purchase type, either on demand or reserved for a big discount in advance. Number of databases, and of course this is a no-brainer, right? Backup storage is charged on a per gigabyte per month. And three more, number of input and output requests. The deployment type, either single or multi-AZ for redundancy and high availability, which also means multiple instances. And data transfer, In inbound data transfer is free and for any outbound data transfer you are going to be charged by AWS. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will deploy an Amazon RDS database instance running MySQL. I have logged into AWS Management Console and now in order to get started with the database installation, I will go and say services and I will go down to RDS. So under database services. So click on RDS now. Now once the console loads, we are now in Amazon RDS Console. We will go and say create database. We'll have to choose from different engine options and we said that we are going to run a MySQL engine. So I'll just click on MySQL and then why not go to next. Here I'd have to select the use case. So do you plan to use this database for production purposes? And anyway, this is the recommended version. But we're now just testing. So I'll go for the dev test MySQL and click on next in order to continue. Now I'll have to specify some database details. I will leave here the default with license model. So general public license. Also, I will not modify the database engine. And now let's just scroll a little bit down. I can select here the database instance class, which also comes with different performance and costs for me. So because this is only a test, I will go up. Sorry about that and select the database T2 micro. That's fine. Multi-AZ deployment, we have gone through an example. I will not go for the multi-AZ, so I'll leave the default selection with no. This is where also you can select the storage type. So general purpose SSD or for better performance, the highest one provisioned IAPS, also SSD. So anyway, I will leave the general purpose SSD with 20 gigs. That's fine. And here I have the estimated monthly costs, with, which comes from the uh, database instance and also storage and a total, approximate total of uh, around $15. Now I'll have to specify some details in, uh, as related to the settings. So the database instance identifier, uh, my database instance. So this is the AWS CCP database, or let's just call it uh, RDS database. 
the master username so i will use no it doesn't want any spaces so i will just say dash here and dash here let's see if it's good great now the master username aws and ccp and db master password i will use the same everywhere so no i will say here this is the password and this is the password good now let's click on next in order to continue some advanced settings now i'm going to run this database in a vpc and i will use our vpc aws ccp vpc default uh, vpc here that's find the subnet group is it going to be public uh, accessible so i will say yes because i want to connect at the end of this session to uh, validate the installation any availability zones yes i can say us east one now the vpc security groups i can create a new vpc security group or i can choose existing one so i will use our sg aws ccp vpc now the database name let's call it again so i will just paste here aws ccp database the port so i'm connecting on port 3306 now database uh, parameter group i will not change it option group i am database authentication no i will not use i am in terms of backup i will say that no backup here um, so i will not select any backup because again this is just for testing purposes I can also select something related to the log expert. So select the log types to publish to Amazon CloudWatch logs, but I will not select anything. Maintenance, that's fine. And I will now just um, click on create database in order to continue. So your database instance is being created. Uh, it may take several minutes. I will click on view database instance details. And here is our uh, RDS database. So this is the name we have defined at the beginning of um, of creating the database if i click on databases i can see here now the status is creating so i will now pause the recording and wait for the database to be deployed by aws all right so now the database is available as you can see in the status column so in order to connect to the database i will just click on the name and I'm now being provided in the connectivity and security reports. So right here under, under endpoint and port, this specific endpoint name. So if I take it here, all right, and the port is 3306, I'll now open an app. And this is MySQL Workbench. So this is something for a Mac OS operating system, but there are different other softwares for Windows as well. So anyway, you will not be tested on this on the exam. It is just for testing for this specific section so i'll click on the plus sign in order to create another mysql connection to this specific uh, rds instance and in the connect uh, connection name i will just say aws ccp and db for database i'm connecting instead of an ip i'm providing the endpoint name the port is 3306 for the username we said that aws ccp db is our uh, username in terms of password i will say here the same aws ccp and db and i'll now click on ok and i'll just say test connection so let's see if the connection is going to be successful or not so trying 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 and the idea is that it will not be uh, it will not be successful and the question is why so why am I not able to connect to my newly deployed RDS database instance? And let's wait now for the error. So it says failed to connect to MySQL at this specific endpoint name on 3306, the port number. So I'll now click on OK and go back to AWS Management Console. Now I'm back in AWS Management Console and let's now navigate to Services and EC2. And let's examine a little bit from a security perspective what's happening in this setup. So I'll go to security groups and I will select the SG security group AWS CCP VPC that we have uh, worked um, with up to now. So clicking on inbound, I see that I'm permitting only HTTP, HTTPS and SSH. So we will need to add another rule, edit and add rule in order to permit traffic to this specific uh, application. 
So if I say here, uh, let's see, let's see, where is it? Custom TCP rule. So that's the one. And the port is 3306. Or maybe just select from the list here, uh, Microsoft SQL. So not Microsoft SQL, MySQL. All right. So this is the same, 3306. I will now permit traffic uh, with inbound rules arriving at this specific instance. So I'll click on, let's say here, anywhere. I will click on save. And now let's get back to the MySQL app and try again to connect to the RDS instance. So let's try again. So I'll click on plus. Again, this is AWS CCP and database. And the host name is going to be the endpoint name. The username we said is AWS CCP and DB. The password has to be the same, AWS CCP and DB and click on OK. And I will now say again, test connection. And right, successfully made the MySQL connection. So I'll click on OK and OK. And I have now added this MySQL in the MySQL connections. So clicking on it will just open the SQL editor. And from this point on, if you're using MySQL in your daily, uh, daily work or as a daily task, then it's just your database ready to use in just a couple of minutes in AWS Cloud. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS Lambda basics. So AWS Lambda is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. So for example, if you have a website that you're going to host it in AWS on an EC2 instance, you can choose to run it serverless. So no servers uh, in your equation there. So what is that? You can take your code and run it with AWS Lambda and literally that's it. So you'll not have to manage any EC2 instances. And again, this is called serverless. AWS Lambda executes your code only when needed and scales automatically. You pay only for the compute time you consume. There is no charge when your code is not running. And this is really nice. AWS Lambda runs your code on a high availability compute infrastructure and performs all of the administration tasks um, of the compute resources. Maybe you're wondering what's happening on the back. So literally AWS on your behalf will uh, take care of server and operating system maintenance, capacity provisioning, automatic scaling, code monitoring, and also logging. You can use AWS Lambda to run your code in response to events. As an example, you can run your code in response to HTTP requests using Amazon API Gateway. In order to get a better understanding on Lambda from a hands-on perspective, you can go to AWS documentation website and search for build a serverless web application. And this is a really, really nice project and it will take uh, somewhere between one and two hours. And you will get the, to use the Amazon S3, Amazon Cognito, Amazon API, Lambda, and also DynamoDB. So long story short, you will host any static content in an Amazon S3 bucket. We, we have also done this in a previous section and that will be your website. When the user, um, let's say, comes to your website, it will also uh, be able to create a username and password and register with you. And this can be done using Amazon Cognito user pool. Uh, so the server literally is Amazon Cognito, but you will define there a user pool once users start to register with your web. You will also uh, use their Amazon DynamoDB and Amazon, uh, let's say, Lambda will store uh, only any data that it will generate when running in this Amazon DynamoDB and you will integrate uh, everything with Amazon API Gateway and uh, provide, let's say, access to the outside world with this functionality and Lambda and every everything. So I really encourage you if you uh, like the idea of serverless to start testing this setup. It is uh, already there. You don't have to, to provision uh, too much. The step-by-step -step guide is available and I think it's a nice thing to do, but maybe just after your certified cloud practitioner exam. Now, in terms of pricing, with AWS Lambda, you pay only for what you use. You pay only for the compute time you consume. There is no charge when your code is not running. You are charged based on the number of requests for your functions and the time it takes for your code to execute. Lambda registers a request each time it starts executing in response to an event notification or maybe uh, an invoked call. Thank you and see you in the next section.
In this section we will cover AWS Elastic Beanstalk basics. So first let's answer this question, what is AWS Elastic Beanstalk? With Elastic Beanstalk you can quickly deploy and manage applications in the AWS without having to learn about the infrastructure that runs those applications. So this is a great starting point for let's say developers that have their app ready and they want to run that app in AWS but they don't know exactly um, what services to use in order to run the app. So you can just start using that with Elastic Beanstalk that will uh, automatically provision every AWS service that is needed in order to run your application. So you simply upload your application and Elastic Beanstalk automatically handles the details of capacity provisioning and more like load balancing, scaling and also application health monitoring. Elastic Beanstalk will provision one or more AWS resources in order to run your application and the most basic example is Amazon EC2 instances. So if your app needs an EC2 instance to run on, then uh, the, um, the service, the Elastic Beanstalk, will automatically provision that and put everything that is needed on the EC2 instance. Now, in order to use Elastic Beanstalk, you create an app, upload an app version as a package. So as an example, you upload an archive with everything included there that, uh, that defines your application. And you upload that to Elastic Beanstalk and then provide some information about the application in the Beanstalk console as you will see later. The Elastic Beanstalk automatically launches an environment and creates and configures the AWS resources needed to run your code. And that is really really awesome. So after your environment is launched you can then manage your environment and deploy new application versions as you progress with your web app or whatever app you are deploying in order to have let's say uh, incremental updates to your app. Now in terms of pricing there is no additional charge for Elastic Beanstalk usage. You will pay um, only for the underlying AWS resources that your application consumes. So for example if you have an app that will just let's say um, deploy uh, I don't know 10 EC2 instances and a couple of RDS database instances then you'll not pay for Elastic Beanstalk that has helped you in order to create these resources but you will pay for the resources that have been created with uh, Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, and this is the example. If deploying uh, the app with Elastic Beanstalk, uh, I don't know, and you fire up several EC2 instances, you will only pay for EC2 usage and not for Elastic Beanstalk. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will create a sample app using Elastic Beanstalk. Alright, so we are back in AWS Management Console. In order to continue, please click on Services and under Compute you can find here Elastic Beanstalk. So please click on Elastic Beanstalk. And now you are going to be provided the landing page of this service, AWS Elastic Beanstalk. In order to continue, please click on Get Started. And now we can create our web app using Elastic Beanstalk. So the application name, let's call this AWS CCP and uh, app. And now we can choose the platform that we need in order to run our application. Let's choose for example PHP or Tomcat, why not? And now we can uh, select either sample application or we can upload our code. So if we have our application up and running, so ready in order to be uh, included in AWS Cloud there, we can say here upload and you can see here a zip or war uh, is being expected. So either an archive zip or a Java war archive. So in this case, we'll just use a sample app. So I'll select this one and in order to continue, I'll click on create application. Now everything is going to be deployed automatically by AWS. So creating the environment and we should now wait for the deployment to, to be installed here and we'll take a look at what is the result. Alright, so the deployment has been completed successfully. Now let's examine a little bit what has happened behind the scenes, so literally what has uh, been, um, let's say, delivered by the Elastic Beanstalk AWS service. If you take a look here on the left menu in configuration, you'll see exactly what are the AWS services that have been deployed with this, uh, with this app. So the most important one and relevant, let's say, is the instances. We can see that a T2 Micro EC2 instance has been deployed in order to run this specific app. 
If, for example, you would use Elastic Beanstalk to, to deploy a WordPress uh, website or blog, depending on what you, what you want to use it for, you'll also see, for example, here in databases, some RDS databases, instances created and so on. Now, the environment, environment type is uh, one single instance. And anyway, this is something that you may want to, to watch and to take a look after using uh, Elastic Beanstalk. Now, on the, other, on the other hand, if you take a look here at the top in environment ID and the URL, you can click on this specific URL and your web app, your newly deployed uh, web app will be provided and shown to you. So congratulations, your first AWS Elastic Beanstalk application is now running on your own dedicated environment in the AWS cloud. If again, coming back to the WordPress uh, example, if you're going to do that, you'd need either to deploy it directly so the database uh, as well with your Elastic Beanstalk or you, what you can do also is deploy the, the front end, so your web application, your WordPress website, and then also deploy an RDS instance that will be your database working on the back uh, of your web app, so your back end, not your front end, and connect the two in order to have a complete uh, website uh, application. Now, before we wrap up this section, let's take a look at so services and EC2. We should see here at least one EC2 instance, and here it is, that has been deployed by AWS Elastic Beanstalk. And here is the instance. We can take a look at all of the details as with any other EC2 instance, like the instance type, Elastic IPs, av availability zones, and so on. So before continuing on with the next section, let us just terminate this instance. So instance state, and I will choose terminate. And yes, I want to terminate this one. And also let's get back to Elastic Beanstalk console. And this is our app. So clicking on it and then let's go to actions and say terminate environment, which also would have also, um, let's say terminated the EC2 instance. So I will just select the name because this is what is asking and I will click on terminate. And in a couple of minutes, everything uh, will be, uh, let's say deleted from your account and you will, you will be ready to continue with the next section. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will address CloudFormation basics and we will deploy a WordPress website using CloudFormation. So now let's start with what is AWS CloudFormation. With AWS CloudFormation, you create a template that describes all the AWS resources that you want. So for example, EC2 instances or databases, RDS databases, and AWS CloudFormation takes care of provisioning and configuring those resources for you. You don't need to individually create and configure AWS resources and figure out what's dependent on what. Literally, AWS CloudFormation handles all of that. So now let's switch over to AWS Management Console and deploy a WordPress website right away. All right, so I'm back in AWS Management Console. And before we start, let's just take a look at AWS CloudFormation documentation. So if you visit this page, uh, there is something that you may want to take a look. This is sample templates. And if I click on US East, Northern Virginia region, which is the one we have worked up to now in, I can click on sample solutions. And we have here something that is called WordPress basic for a single instance and also WordPress scalable and durable. And this installs and deploys a WordPress onto Amazon EC2 instances in an auto scaling group, also with a multi AZ Amazon RDS database instance for storage. So this is something we will use when deploying uh, the WordPress website. So what else we can do from the management console, go to services and in the management and governance category, you can click on cloud formation. So what we can do now is create stack and we can select a sample, a sample template. And from the list, we can say here WordPress blog. So this is one option and continue with next or from the sample solutions documentation web page, we can see here launch stack. And if you do this, if you are logged into AWS Management Console, it will land you this page and basically it will launch this template from an S3 bucket that uh, AWS is uh, hosting. And again, you can say next and continue with the installation. 
So let's get back to AWS Management Console with the template selection. So indeed I am going to install a WordPress blog or a WordPress website. So I will click on next now. Now the stack name I will give something like AWS CCP and this is WP for WordPress. I will use WordPress, uh, no, I will just say AWS CCP and WP and paste it and no. So everywhere I will use AWS CCP WordPress. Instance type, I will use a T2 micro. The key name, I will use the same keeper um, as I've did up to now in the course. I will just click on next in order to continue. There are several options here that I can define. So for example, the IAM role may be important, but it says that you can choose an IAM role that CloudFormation uses to create, modify or delete resources in the stack. If you don't choose a role, CloudFormation uses the permissions defined, defined in your account. So as I'm root, uh, I will not have to define here um, an IAM role. Good, so I'll just now click on next. I have the chance to review my selection and it looks fine. So what I can what I can do now is just click on create. No, I don't want to save any passwords. So let's take a look while the, the WordPress installation uh, it's going to be deployed to take a look at what are the current options and what is the information that is being displayed. So this is just an overview right that's that's nothing uh, very very fancy in the outputs you will see here the um, the wordpress url that is going to be available so we can click and just navigate to the website in terms of resources we will see here exactly what resources will the cloud formation deploy for us so uh, as of now it has deployed a security group now it's also deploying an instance here and this is going to be the web server so if I click on services and I open also EC2, I will take a look in the running instances and I can see here that something is being deployed and this is probably my instance. So it's, it finishes in DDBB0. So let's take a look in CloudFormation. Yes, this is the one, DDBB0. So now it's currently deploying the web server. If you'd also take a look in events, you'll have the, uh, the possibility to see step by step what the cloud formation is doing. And now very, very nice, it's the template. So if you take a look in the template, you will see exactly step by step what it does. So this is the template, um, AWS template format version. This, it will define several uh, parameters like key name, all right, instance, instance type. So this is going to be a T2 small instance type. Then the SSH, I'm going to be allowed SSH from any location. Database name, so this is WordPress database. All right, and database user, database password, and mappings, and everything that is going to do in this, um, in this order is present here. Also parameters, database name, database password. We know that we have put the same value for everything here and the key name, SSH location, and everything. So it says that it is complete now. So if I take a look in the outputs, this is the website URL. So I'll just uh, yeah, open it in a new tab. And I can see here that it says your server is running PHP version 5.3.29, but WordPress is 5.2.1 and it requires at least 5.6.2.0. So what we need to do now, uh, unfortunately, is to uh, kind of manually update uh, to 5.6.2.0, our PHP version. So let's do that right now. I will go to EC2 and take the public IP and I will just SSH through uh, my terminal. All right, so I'm now in my terminal on my Mac. So let's SSH into the web server. So let's say SSH and then minus I. Now I will use the, the keeper and then the user EC2 dash user and of course the IP. So I will type yes. And I am now in my EC2 instance. Let me just say sudo su. Now I'm a super user. So let's do the following first. Yum update minus y so i will update everything on my box 
and yes there are some some uh, some packages to be to be updated but anyway let's just wait for everything to be updated and we will continue great so the box has been updated the latest uh, packages and patches have been applied so before i update my my php version let me just verify what it is now so php minus v and i can see here that it says php 53 and here is 5329 and if everything is successful i should see here php 5.6 so first let me let me just stop the apache web server so i will say service http d and current status is running so i will say stop i will remove anything that is currently installed in uh, um, let's say in related to the http daemon so yum erase httpd httpd tools and also some other options and i will also put this available as a resource in order to be downloaded if you want to test and also do the uh, the wordpress website installation so i'll do this now and i will say yes let me now just remove the uh, the current php installation so i will do this and say yes and it should be done now now let me just install php 5.6 and i will say minus y in order to accept anything during the installation and it is complete if i say php minus v it is now saying that i am running php 5.6.40 which is good and search and php 5.6 there are a lot of packages as related to PHP 5.6 and I will do the following yum install PHP 5.6 and dash and star for everything and I will just say minus yes and a lot of packages will be installed now so let's wait for it to be uh, to be completed great now let's say again PHP minus V and yes it is 5.6 and i will say service httpd and start i will just start the apache web server and service service httpd and httpd and status so it is running let's get back to the web server and do a refresh and great so here is the wordpress website that is now up and running so that uh, that really took not that much so a couple of minutes so let's say the title is aws ccp and this is wordpress great so let me see the username i just forgot what i installed so what i can do is go back to the cloud formation and take a look in parameters and i have here aws ccp wordpress good so let me just get back and say here this is the uh, username and then i will say don't use and this is the password and yes i confirm the use of a weak password your email something like whatever whatever but anyway this should be your email and i will just say install wordpress so not now and here it is so wordpress has been installed thank you and enjoy i'm sure going to enjoy it so again username password yes remember me and login not now and yes here it is the dashboard of wordpress so yeah wh why don't we write our first blog so clicking on this one and all right so plus and i'll say just paragraph come on and this is our this is our first post and i will say publish and publish and if i get back right and i click on this one awscp wordpress here is our first post so installation is not that uh, complicated as you have seen you just have to uh, update the php version in order to to run the wordpress website and that should be it so in order to not consume any resources uh, you may want to shut down everything as related to the wordpress website installation and what you could do is um, let's say delete or terminate um, let's say resources one by one which is an option 
or I can go to the cloud formation and because I have this stack here so cloud formation and stacks I can say with with selecting the AWS CCP WordPress actions and then I can delete it but not here in the uh, overview so click on it and delete stack and it's going to ask me are you sure you want to delete this stack stack name is this and yes I will click delete as you can see the status now changes to delete in progress so everything looks good so let me just say services and if I now get back really really quick to EC2 instances I already have zero instances running because this one is being terminated shut, shutting down so that should be everything that you need to know if you want to just run a WordPress website in AWS thank you and see you in the next section In this section we will cover simple notification service or SNS basics. So now let's try to answer this question. What is actually AWS SNS? Amazon Simple Notification Service or Amazon SNS is a web service that coordinates and manages the sending or delivery of messages to subscribing endpoints or clients. And you will understand more that endpoints refer to other AWS services and clients can be literally humans, so users. In Amazon SNS, there are two types of clients, publishers and subscribers, also referred to as producers and consumers. Publishers communicate asynchronously with subscribers by producing and sending a message to a topic, which is a logical access point and also a communication channel. Subscribers, which can be web servers, email addresses, also Amazon SQS queues, consume or receive the message or notification over one of the supported protocols and you will see that possible ones are amazon sqs http or https email sms uh, when they are subscribed to the topic uh, so what we will do next is configure the uh, s3 bucket to send a notification through sns when any new object upload takes place within my s3 bucket this was a very very short section, let's now get on to AWS Management Console and get started with SNS configuration. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will configure SNS or Simple Notification Service to send a notification for any new S3 object upload in our S3 bucket. Alright, so back in AWS Management Console. In order to get started, please go to Services and scroll down to Application Integration and please click on Simple Notification Service in order to continue. Now here is the Amazon, uh, Amazon SNS, Simple Notification Service Console. And first thing we need to do is create a topic. So I'll click on Next Step. I will name this topic, for example, let's say S3 upload and new so upload new object now display name is optional I will just click on create topic we will have to go also to subscriptions so on the left side menu click on subscriptions I currently have no subscription so I will say create subscription and the topic I am subscribing to is the s3 upload new object and the protocol is email now please type here your email address and then just click on create subscription now the subscription is created and the, as you can see here the status is pending confirmation so you need to go to your email client and then confirm the subscription now this is how the AWS notification looks like so you'll have to just confirm subscription so click on this link and that's it now I am back in Amazon SNS console, so we need, we need to do one more thing. So I will click on the S3 topic and I will go to access policy and click on edit. I will have to go to access policy and I will just edit this policy. So I'll delete this one and copy and paste this one. And anyway, this will be available as a downloadable resource in this specific section. 
So what you need to do is replace this one. So the SNS topic Amazon resource name. So now let's go to services and let's go to S3. And let's say that we will use our first bucket, the AWS CCP V1. So if I just select it, I can copy the bucket ARN and let's get back to the policy and I'll replace the bucket name here. So the ARN is complete now and I also need to replace this one, the SNS topic ARN. So let me just say again in this one services and simple notification service. And I'll go to this topic and I have the ARN here. So I'll just take it, copy, so complete one, copy, get back to simple notification service. And I will just replace this one here in the policy. What I also need to do now is save changes, of course. The last thing we will go in the bucket, so services and S3, and we'll have to enable notifications. So for this specific bucket, I will go here and go to properties. And I have this option here to go to events and I will say add a notification. I would like to name this event, let's say new S3, so S3 object upload and it's upload and then I will say that the event is a put. I will not do anything here for prefix or suffix and I will send notification with SNS topic and the topic is S3 upload new object. So now I will just click on save and I can see that I have here one active notification. So what I will do now is just go to the bucket and upload a new object and I will see what happens with the notification whether I receive an email or not. So I will click on upload and then click on add files and I will go to AWS CCP folder and I have this text file here new object upload to S3. So I will choose that and I will click on upload. The upload is successful, so I now should receive a notification through email announcing that a new object has been uploaded to my S3 bucket. Now, after you do the subscription confirmation, you should receive an email similar to this announcing you that you're now subscribed to that specific topic. And for any new upload, you should receive a notification from Amazon S3 um, with specific information for that specific, um, let's say, upload. For example, you will see in the email like the bucket name and also what's the name of the object and so on. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS CloudWatch basics. So let's start by answering this question. What is AWS CloudWatch? With Amazon CloudWatch, you can monitor your Amazon Web Services or AWS resources and the applications you run in uh, AWS in real time. You can create alarms which watch metrics and send notifications or automatically make changes to the resources you are monitoring when a specific threshold is breached. And as an example, you can watch the CPU usage of your EC2 instances and use that in auto-scaling groups in order to scale up or down the number of EC2 instances. You can also use this data to stop underused instances to save money with auto-scaling policies and remember the minimum desired and maximum EC2 instances example we have gone through. AWS CloudWatch can be accessed and used with the AWS CloudWatch console, the CLI, the CloudWatch API and also the AWS Software Development Kits. So where can I use this CloudWatch AWS service and uh, maybe it's useful or not. So let's decide together now. Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling. So you can use AWS CloudWatch with Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling in order to automatically launch or terminate EC2 instances based on user defined policies. You can also use the CloudWatch along with the CloudTrail service. CloudWatch writes log files to the S3 bucket specified when you configured CloudTrail. Also, you can use CloudWatch with Amazon SNS, so simple notification service. Send messages when an alarm threshold has been reached. Thank you and see you in the next section.
This concludes module 5, AWS key services that you need to know. Congrats for your progress on the course, you have learned really uh, quite a lot in this module. Before sitting the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, please make sure you are comfortable with these key services covered in this module. Let's now go over the most important topics covered in this module and the exam hints. We will start with Amazon Route 53. DNS stands for Domain Name System and acts as the phone book of the internet. DNS helps you to resolve names to IP addresses. Amazon Route 53 is a global, highly available and scalable domain name system web service. So first of all, it is global, it does not relate to any region that we are going to work in. You can use Route 53 to resolve domains, so this is the basic function, and also to register new domains like we did in the lab for AWS Training Bootcamp.com. Now let's move on to Amazon CloudFront. Amazon CloudFront is a web service that speeds up the distribution of your static and dynamic web content to your users. CloudFront delivers your content through a worldwide network of data centers called edge locations. CloudFront regional edge locations really help when the content is not popular enough to stay at the CloudFront edge location and improve delivery performance for, for that specific content. Now, uh, as related also to CloudFront, Origin is where the CloudFront gets the files from uh, and that could be an Amazon S3 or uh, just another website or web server. When you want to use CloudFront to distribute your content, you create a distribution for lower latency and increase use, uh, in, order to, and in order to increase the user experience like we did in our lab in order to uh, have a better latency around 30 milliseconds. Now, we have also talked about the application load balancer. With AWS Elastic Load Balancing, you can achieve fault tolerance for any application by ensuring scalability, performance, and security. Elastic Load Balancing automatically distributes incoming application traffic across multiple targets, so for example, EC2 instances. There are three flavors of load balancers, so the Network Load Balancer, Classic Load Balancer, and the most advanced up to layer 7 as it relates to the OC layer model, right? the application load balancer and this is what we have uh, used also in the labs now let's move on to auto scaling amazon ec2 auto scaling helps you to ensure that you have the correct number of amazon ec2 instances available to handle the load of your uh, application and this means scaling up or down not necessarily up ec2 instances are grouped in auto scaling groups and we have defined here and talked about the minimum number of ec2 instances desired number and also the maximum number of EC2 instances in an auto-scaling group. Scaling policies will automatically launch or terminate instances as your application demands. We have also talked about Relational Database Service or RDS in AWS. Amazon Relational Database Service or RDS is a web service that makes it easier to set up, operate and scale a relational database in the cloud. Amazon RDS is a fully managed RDS in the cloud, so AWS takes care of all of the hard work for you. A database instance is just a database environment in the cloud that runs a database engine. Databases come in different sizes and this uh, we have talked about this as database instance class with multiple storage options like HDD or SDD provisioned IOPS uh, as well. Our next service is AWS Lambda, very very fast. Amazon Lambda is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing services, um, so that is servers. AWS Lambda executes your code only when needed and scales automatically. You pay only for the compute time you consume, there is no charge when your code is not running. You can use AWS Lambda to run your code in response to events. As an example, run your code in response to HTTP requests using also Amazon API Gateway. Elastic Beanstalk is next on our list. With Elastic Beanstalk, you can quickly deploy and manage applications in the AWS without having to learn about the infrastructure that runs those applications. You simply upload your application and Elastic Beanstalk automatically handles the details of capacity provisioning, load balancing, scaling, and application health monitoring. Elastic Beanstalk will provision one or more AWS resources for uh, your app to run smoothly. So for example, Amazon EC2 instances, also databases, and so on. Now CloudFormation. 
With AWS CloudFormation, you create a template that describes all the AWS resources that you want. So for example, EC2 instances and again databases. And AWS CloudFormation takes care of provisioning and configuring those resources for you. You don't need to individually create and configure AWS resources and figure out what's dependent on what. AWS CloudFormation handles all of that um, for you. Now, simple notification service, so SNS. Amazon SNS is a web service that coordinates and manages the sending or delivery of messages to subscribing endpoints or clients. Publishers communicate asynchronously with subscribers by producing and sending a message to a topic, which is a logical access point and also a communication channel. Subscribers consume or receive the messages or notification over one of the supported protocols. So for example, an email, we have seen that in, in our example, in our lab, when they are subscribed to that specific topic. CloudWatch. With Amazon CloudWatch, you can monitor your Amazon Web Services resources and the applications you run on AWS in real time. You can create alarms which watch metrics and send notifications or automatically make changes to the resources you are monitoring when a threshold is breached. And as an example, you can watch the CPU usage of your EC2 instances and use that in auto-scaling groups. With that said, please join me in our next module, Module 6, Billing and Pricing Wrap-Up. Thank you and see you in the next module. Welcome to Module 6, Billing Pricing and AWS Support Levels. This module complements the information covered in the previous module relevant to the billing and pricing in AWS and for the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. In the previous module, we covered pricing and billing information for some of the AWS services as it is presented in the AWS Pricing White Paper. We will start this module by wrapping up the discussion around billing and pricing and we will cover AWS fundamentals of pricing and continue with cost optimization through reservations. By the end of this module, I will also introduce you to other interesting services or tools from AWS and these are AWS Cost Calculator and the AWS Trusted Advisor. We will wrap up Module 6 after covering AWS support plans and a fast recap on all topics covered in this module and exam hints relevant for the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. With that said, let's get started. In this section, we will cover the fundamentals of pricing in AWS. AWS provides agility, helps you reduce your IT costs and reach global coverage in minutes. With AWS, you can optimize your costs continuously in order to match your needs and environment. And let's now think about ROI or return on investment. AWS offers pay-as-you-go on-demand pricing with the best ROI for each specific use case. Now, in regards to the key principles for AWS pricing, these are as follows. Understand the fundamentals of pricing, start early with cost optimization, maximize the power of flexibility, and use the right pricing model for the job. Let's now go over each of the above. So we will start with understanding the fundamentals of pricing. For the vast majority of AWS services, the following impact the cost with AWS. Compute, storage, and also outbound data transfer. There is no charge for data transfer inbound. I have talked about it uh, many times in the previous sections and modules. Data transfer outbound is charged. Outbound traffic is aggregated on your bill, as you can see that uh, monthly. And you will see that as AWS data transfer out. And you will be charged as per gigabyte. Storage is paid on a per gigabyte basis and compute is paid by the minute or by the hour. Now let's talk about start early with cost optimization. It's really never too early to start with cost optimization. You should start managing your costs from the beginning of your implementation start date. The, com the complexity grows as you move forward and scale your project. So if uh, at the beginning you have like a couple of EC2 instances and maybe some uh, databases there, uh, I don't know, let's say also uh, an elastic load balancer and so on. As you progress with your project, if you don't um, think about or you don't have in mind the cost optimization from the beginning, it will be very, very hard to keep up with the progress of the project. 
It's easiest and recommended to put cost visibility and control mechanisms in place before environment becomes large and complex. Maximizing the power of flexibility. With AWS, you pay for exactly what you need with no minimum commitments or long-term contracts. You can choose to save money through a reservation model, for example. Using a pay-as-you-go model, procurement complexity is reduced, which enables your business to be fully elastic like the cloud is. You don't pay for services that are not running, and this refers to cost efficiency. So I've seen multiple environments with, uh, with my clients that have really, um, let's say, implemented the schedule for the EC2 instances, and when that specific service is not uh, supposed to be offered to their end clients, then the EC2 instances are automatically powered off, and basically they are on for about 9 to, uh, nine to 10 hours per day and not 24, right? So that means cost efficiency within your business. Using the right pricing model for the job. With AWS, you can choose the pricing model that best fits your business needs as well. Different pricing models are available for EC2 instances, so Elastic Compute Cloud. Let's start with the first one, On Demand, pay and use EC2 with no upfront payment or long-term contract. Dedicated instances, AWS hardware is dedicated to you and only you. You will not split the host, so the physical machine, with any other customer. Now another two, spot instances, purchase spare computing capacity at discounted hourly rates and reservations, pay for compute capacity ahead of time and receive discount up to 75% for EC2, RDS, DynamoDB and many, many other AWS services. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will briefly cover cost optimization through reservations. Companies can achieve significant cost savings by using reserved instances and other reservation models for compute and data services. With reserved instances, you commit in advance for usage, which in return means a lower price to you. With reservations, you can choose to pay with no upfront, partial upfront, or all upfront, which means you pay everything in advance. The larger the upfront payment, the bigger the discount. EC2 reserved instances allow you to reserve capacity and receive a big discount on your uh, instance usage compared to running an on-demand paying model. So which means like you log into AWS account and just start an EC2 instance that is on demand. With EC2 reserved instances, you can predict compute costs over the contract term. When you want to use the capacity you reserved, you launch an EC2 instance with the configuration as the reserved capacity that you purchased and AWS will automatically apply the, apply the discounted price. Now let's have an example with EC2 reserved instances. The first the, at the top is the standard one year term and as you can see at the bottom is the standard three year term. Now you can see that the price is literally going down as you pay more in advance so no upfront and again partial upfront or all upfront and for the three year term as you can see when you pay all so everything in advance all upfront the discount goes uh, goes to 62 percent which is a lot now the difference between no upfront and all upfront it's around six percent but when you but when you have a large fleet of visit to instances this, uh, let's say, little, so it shows it as a small value, 6%, can mean a lot, a lot of money. So again, this is one way that you can save money within AWS. Go for reserved instances and pay in advance. Now, the Amazon pricing wrap-up. So very, very important. This is what Amazon says about their pricing philosophy. You pay as you go, pay for what you use, pay less as you use more, and pay even less when you reserve capacity. In order to estimate, estimate your monthly bill, you can use the AWS Simple Monthly Calculator, which will be covered in the next section. Thank you, and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS Cost Calculators. So there are two options available, the AWS Cost Calculator, and you can access that at the following URL, so calculator.aws, and the AWS Simple Monthly Calculator that I have mentioned in the previous section. So now let's switch over to AWS website in order to check these two options. 
Alright, so the first option is the AWS pricing calculator and here is the landing page. What you can do is click on create estimate and then give it a name. So let's say my estimate, estimate region. So we have worked up to now through the course in Northern Virginia. Great. And I can click on create estimate. Then I can just go on and add different services that I currently have in my infrastructure or maybe I intend to add in my uh, overall setup. So clicking on add service will land you this page. Uh, it says here like select the service and a small info, browse the list of AWS services that AWS pricing calculator provides, estimates for or search services by keyword. Anyway, this is not that extensive as you can see. All right, we can use the elastic load balancing, Amazon EC2, the storage gateway and so on. But um, it will provide you some information. I do not really recommend this one. I say that it would be best in order to, to estimate your monthly usage using the simple monthly calculator. As opposed to the previous one, as you can see here on the left side menu, this is an extensive uh, list of different services that you can use in AWS. So my proposal is that let's do um, a simulation now. Maybe we decide to deploy a WordPress website and we will work in US East Northern Virginia region. So for the compute Amazon EC2 instances, I will say that I will go for the on demand. So I'll click on this one. I want one instance and the type is in this case. Let me see if I have the T2 micro. Let's see going down and here it is. So I will go for T2 micro close and save. So I will use the, the smallest, let's say, options that are available both for the EC2 instance and also for the RDS uh, database. In terms of the Amazon EBS, so storage for the root, I will say the storage is, let's say, 30 gigs. IOPS, all right, snapshots, uh, let's say I will have 30 gigs, let's say 15 gigs per month of storage. Going down, Elastic IP, I will have one Elastic IP, so for my website. Data transfer, let's say for data transfer like 10 gigs, uh, inter-region, not that much, so let's say 5 gigs, data transfer out, remember that this is being um, charged, so 10 gigs, inside, nothing, and that should be it. In terms of Amazon Route 53, let's have, uh, let's say one hosted zone, so we will buy the domain and we will have it hosted through routed 53 uh, that would be all for the hosted zones let's go down resolver no amazon cloudfront we will enable amazon cloudfront so data transfer out let's say again 10 gigs out of origin uh, let's say again 10 gigs edge location traffic distribution i will leave for united states 50 percent and euro 50 percent just to have an idea of what's happening um, with this setup in terms of ssl certificates so yes we want the website to load through an ssl also https connection so i will uh, type here one let's now go over to amazon rds i will choose amazon rds on demand uh, this is a mysql All right and i will go for t3 micro as well as for the ec2 instance so this is my database interregion data transfer out not that much uh, let's say again five gigs and continue with amazon elastic load balancing so i will use one classic load balancer or maybe i want no classic load balancer but i want to make um, intelligent decision so i will use an application load balancer average connection i don't know what to say here it doesn't matter network load balancing anyway one application load balancer should be uh, should be fine and cloudwatch simple notification transcoder so as you can see the list is pretty extensive as opposed to the previous one elastic map reduce snowball direct connect amazon vpc um, let's say data transfer out the same 10 gigs efs simple db anyway that should be everything that we need to uh, know about our setup. So here we have our estimate for our monthly bill, $600. But anyway, the most is here with CloudFront. As you can see, this is the most that you will pay for. If you don't uh, enable the CloudFront service, 
then obviously you're gonna pay like around 20 bucks 20 dollars us dollars so extending the cloud front service we can see here that the custom ssl certificates is the most so if i say here no then i will be left with data transfer out only 86 cents and out of the origin 20 cents so depending on what you need for your setup the custom ssl certificates in this case is the most uh, that you can uh, you can pay for and anyway so this is something that i advise you to use in uh, in your production uh, for calculating your monthly costs anyway it is roughly around what you will pay but after the first month after the second month and so on you'll get a better understanding and uh, you will be uh, better and better at estimating your costs within aws Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will briefly cover AWS Trusted Advisor. AWS Trusted Advisor is the AWS service that provides you real-time guidance to help you provision your resources following AWS best practices. So there are five directions, categories, or pillars within the Trusted Advisor. And these are the cost optimization, performance, security, fault tolerance, and also service limits. If you want to take a look at this service, the Trusted Advisor, please follow the link awsamazon.com premium support technology, Trusted Advisor, and best practice checklist. So now let's switch over to AWS Management Console and take a look at this specific service. All right, I'm now in AWS Management Console and I would like to navigate to the Trusted Advisor service. So in order to do that, click on services and type here in the search bar, Trusted Advisor, and here it is, click on this one. Now, once you do that, you will be provided the landing page of the console of the Trusted Advisor. And again, there are five pillars, cost optimization, performance, security, fault tolerance, and the service limits. I have some problems here in security, so I will click on this one and I see a red flag for security groups specific ports unrestricted. I can go ahead and expand it and take a look exactly at what it says. So in terms of alerts, I see here that the green is fine. So access to port 80, 25, 443 or 465 is unrestricted. And a red flag as I have for the security group AWS CCP VPC, right? It means that I have provided access to FTP and other services, um, so uh, like 3389, so RDP and so on. So clicking on this specific security group, AWS CCP VPC, I can see exactly what I have defined here. So clicking on inbound will provide me a list of what I have defined here. So I will say edit and let me just remove some of them or do something else. So let's say that I will provide access from this specific uh, IP address, 1234. And I am referring to, I'll just kick the IPv6 out. And let's say that I am providing access from a specific IP address like I'm doing now. So I'll click on save and then go back to the Trusted Advisor Management Console. And I have this refresh uh, option here. So I'll just click on refresh and let's see if anything changes now with uh, within the security group uh, options all right so it says that um, this specific option so the security one has been refreshed checks have been refreshed so let's see now if we have the same uh, the same uh, red flag here no so no red flags now I have the Amazon s3 bucket permissions here so let me just expand this one as well so I can see that the bucket name AWS training bootcamp.com that we have created when we also played with this uh, domain name. So we have defined a web, uh, static website. So yes, of course, this is open uh, and I can do some restrictions here as well. In terms of security groups, let me just expand this as well. I only have only one. So the auto scaling security group number one. So clicking on this one, let's see exactly what is our configuration. So yes, for the auto scaling group, I should not permit uh, administration through SSH, the secure shell to anybody so I, what i can do here is say uh, uh, is to configure here like not anywhere but my ip and if i click my ip then my real public ip will be uh, populated here and because this is an auto scaling group maybe i would like to add like http access from anywhere and maybe uh, let's see where it is https so maybe this is a website 
So just add different services that I want to make public to, to the worldwide. So if I do that, then um, as you can see here in the trusted advisor, what I need to do is also refresh again and the changes will be populated and I can see if I'm now compliant, if I'm all green or if I uh, am recommended to do any changes within my AWS account. So something similar, if you want to optimize your costs, you can go here, but it says that upgrade your support plan to unlock all trusted advisor recommendations. So this is not available for uh, the free tier account. We should upgrade our account in order to uh, have access to the cost optimization as well. We will not do this now. This is just for that you get an understanding on what the trusted advisor service can, can do for you and how it can help. The same is for performance checks. Let's see fault tolerance, the same, and also the service limits. This is something that we can use. So let's take a look here, auto scaling groups. It checks for usage that is more than 80% of the auto scaling group limits. Values are based on a snapshot, so your current usage might differ. So I can take a look here, what is my limit, what is my current usage. We have uh, played just a bit with the auto scaling, so I can see here that in this specific region, US East 1, I am within the limit account. So I hope that you get, uh, you get an understanding now with the trusted advisor. This is something you may want to use again in your daily job, in your, uh, the, let's say, production networks in AWS. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will go over and compare the different AWS support plans. So there are two types of support plans within AWS. The first one is basic. Basic support is included for all AWS customers and includes the following. Customer service, and this one is 24-7 access, so at any moment uh, during the day. AWS trusted advisor, but this comprises only seven core uh, trusted advisor checks and guidance to following the best practices and also the AWS personal health dashboard. So this is a personalized view of the health of AWS services and alerts you when the resources are impacted. So when your resources are impacted. Now the second option is the premium support plans. Three options are available. Developer, business and enterprise. Support plans differ in terms of how many, call, let's call them add-on services you get from AWS how much the AWS team gets involved in your projects and of course they differ in terms of pricing. Let's now switch to AWS website and have a comparison between the premium support plans, developer, business and enterprise. Alright, so following the URL that you have seen earlier on the slide will land you this specific web page, compare AWS support plans. So I was saying that there are three developer, business and enterprise. So let's start the comparison. AWS Trusted Advisor Best Practice Checks. So for the developer, there are only seven core checks and let's see exactly what this means. So what are currently the checks in, uh, in AWS? Trusted Advisor Best Practice Checks. So again, cost optimization. And as you can see, there are quite a lot. In terms of security, some of them are here and there are even more. Fall Tolerance. So this one is here as well. And the last one is the Performance. So if you go for another more advanced, let's say a support plan like business one, you will have uh, this one activated as well. So let's go back and continue. Enhanced technical support. So in case you have any, uh, any kind of problems within your account, you can just open a ticket to the AWS, uh, let's say support team. So unlimited cases, one primary contact for developer. In terms of business and enterprise premium support um, uh, plans, you have like 24-7 phone, email and chat access to support engineers. The same here and also unlimited cases and unlimited contacts. Let's go down and talk about case severity and also very important response times. So for the developer, you should expect like less than 24 uh, business hours in order to get uh, an answer for the, for the general guidance. And if you have any kind of problems, let's say 12 hours, so under 12 hours um, response time. For business and enterprise, of course, you're going to pay more. And this is, uh, let's say, a faster response that you get from AWS. So if you have a production system uh, down, then you should expect a response in less than an hour. Or for the enterprise uh, support plan, you can expect less than 15 minutes when you encounter any business critical system down issue. 
In terms of architectural guidance for the enterprise, you can get consultative review and guidance based on your applications and for the business context contextual to your use cases. Now let's go down. Very, very important also in, uh, in regards to the questions that you may get in your exam. This is the technical account management. The option is uh, available only for the enterprise option. So you really have a dedicated technical account manager in order to proactively monitor your environment and assist you with optimization. So this option is available only for the enterprise support plan. Yes, you get some access to training and also to support team. And now, of course, is pricing. So for the developer support plan, you start at 29 US dollars per month. For the business one, you start at $100 per month. And for the enterprise, you start at 15,000 US dollars per month. And it can go even higher. Thank you and see you in the next section. This concludes Module 6, Billing Pricing and AWS Support Levels. Before sitting the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, please make sure you are comfortable with the AWS Billing and Pricing concepts. You can definitely expect questions in the exam relating to uh, uh, billing and pricing also. Now let's go over the most important topics covered in this module and the exam hints. So we started with Fundamentals of Pricing. Amazon AWS offers pay-as-you-go on-demand pricing with the best return on investment for each specific use case. AWS key pricing principles are understand the fundamentals of pricing, start early with cost optimization, maximize the power of flexibility and use the right pricing model for the job. We continue now with cost optimization through reservations. With reserved instances you commit in advance for usage which in return means a lower price to you. You can choose to pay with no upfront, partial upfront or all upfront. The larger the upfront payment, the bigger the discount. Next, uh, we have introduced two more AWS services. With AWS cost calculators, you can easily estimate your cost on a monthly basis. And AWS Trusted Advisor provides you real-time guidance to help you provision your resources following AWS best practices. And this refers again to cost optimization, performance, security, fault tolerance and also service limits. Now let's talk about AWS support plans. There are two types of support, uh, support plans within AWS. Basic, this comes with all AWS accounts and premium, uh, which, me which also means extra paid service. Premium support levels, there are three. Developer starts at $29 per month and you have an SLA or service level agreement um, which, is, which is less than 12 hours. Now business, this starts at $100 per month and an SLA under one hour. The most expensive and complex is the enterprise premium support plan starts at $15,000 per month. The SLA is under one hour, you get the full AWS team support and also a dedicated technical account manager or TAM. With that said, please join me in our next module, module 7, security in AWS. Thank you and see you in the next module. Welcome to Module 7, Security in Amazon Web Services. This module provides a brief introduction into AWS security. We will start this module by covering general guidelines related to AWS security and also massively important topic within AWS, the shared responsibility model. Please make sure you understand the AWS shared responsibility model before taking the cloud practitioner exam. By the end of this module, I will also introduce you several other security related services within AWS relevant both in real world scenarios and of course for the cloud practitioner exam. We will cover AWS WAF or Web Application Firewall, Shield and Firewall Manager and we'll also cover AWS Inspector. We will wrap up module 7 after going through a fast recap on all topics covered in this module and exam hints relevant for the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. With that said, let's get started. In this section, I will provide you an introduction to AWS security. 
So let's start now. AWS delivers a scalable cloud computing platform designed for high availability and dependability. Security is AWS top priority. AWS helps you to protect the confidentiality, integrity and availability of your systems and data. AWS architecture has been built following two key principles, flexibility and security, providing an extremely scalable and flexible cloud platform. AWS uses redundant and multi-layer controls, continuous validation and testing with built-in automation that helps monitoring and keeping customers safe and secure. The same level of automation and security is contained and replicated in any AWS data center. And this equals availability zone if you remember from, um, from the start of the course. So again, one data center equals one availability zone. With AWS, you get a resilient, fault-tolerant architecture designed for security, able to satisfy the requirements of even the most security-sensitive customers. Now let's start our discussion about the shared responsibility model. Security and compliance is a shared responsibility between AWS and the customer. The customer assumes responsibility and management of the guest operating system, so including updates and also security patches, as well as the configuration of the AWS provided security group firewall while AWS takes care of the cloud. And this bring us to, brings us to something that is known uh, as the following. Security of the cloud, which is AWS task, and also security in the cloud, which is the customer's task or job. Let's talk now about the security of the cloud. AWS is responsible for protecting the infrastructure that runs all of the services offered in the AWS cloud. This infrastructure is composed of the hardware, software, networking and facilities or data centers that run AWS cloud services. On the other hand, customer responsibility for security in the cloud now. Customer responsibility will be determined by the AWS cloud services that a customer selects. And this means uh, if the customer, for example, chooses EC2 is one thing, it has to do quite a lot in order to secure this, uh, this service. But on the other hand, if it chooses a managed service, this means that the AWS service is managed by AWS. Well, it doesn't have to do too much in order to secure that. That's why it's called managed service. It will be managed by AWS. So this determines the amount of configuration work the customer must perform as part of their security responsibilities. If we now take a look at the shared responsibility model, let's discuss, um, so starting from bottom up. We will start with AWS, so responsibility for security of the cloud. So there are two things that AWS uh, takes care of. First is the hardware or the AWS global infrastructure. And remember, we have talked about this quite, uh, quite a lot. So regions, availability zones, and also edge locations. The second thing is the software, software for compute storage, database and networking. It could be the operating system, so the hypervisor of the, uh, all of the hardware that the cloud is running on, or it could be the software in case um, we are talking about or we are referring to any managed service. Now on the other side, the customer, so responsibility for security in the cloud has to do quite a lot and it is not always very, very uh, easy for the customer to understand this. So again, starting from bottom up, the client side data encryption and data integrity authentication. So this is something that the client has to deal with. Server side encryption. So the client has to take care of the encryption on the server and also networking traffic protection. So encryption, integrity and identity. And you can think of this uh, last item of um, just like as a VPN. So let's say that the customer defines a VPN, a VPN connection for the uh, cloud going to the on-premises data center. Well, this means that it has to be configured correctly in order to provide encryption, integrity and identity. And AWS cannot do that. So the, um, the thing is that the customer needs to take care of this in order to be configured correctly and uh, securely. Next is the operating system, network and firewall configuration. So the operating system, let's consider that the, uh, the end customer just starts an EC2 instance and configures like we did a WordPress website or I don't know, let's say just a website, right? So it has to make sure that uh, that specific server will be patched, all of the security um, latest releases will be applied there. And again, continuing on with the firewall configuration. So this refers to security groups 
Of course, it is customer's job in order to configure correctly the security groups. AWS really cannot connect to your environment and, I don't know, let's say, close SSH connection that uh, is open now to worldwide, all right? And also close other specific management ports. It is also customer's job in order to take care of the platform applications, IAM, identity access management, and the customer data as well. I really advise you to take a look uh, at the following URL. So aws.amazon.com slash compliance slash shared responsibility model. It is just a short read and I advise you to do that before uh, attending the real, the real cloud practitioner exam. All right, so I have switched to uh, AWS website and here is the shared responsibility model. It starts with an overview and then also talks about AWS responsibility for security of the cloud and then moves on to customer responsibility, security in the cloud. And here is the diagram that you have seen also earlier. So it is really not that big. It will probably take a couple of minutes and I really advise you to read this before sitting the real exam. Now let's continue with security products and features. AWS offers a lot of tools and features that can help you meet your security objectives. And we have mentioned up to now uh, probably at least a half of uh, what I'm going to, to talk about in the next couple of minutes. AWS provides security specific tools and features across network security, configuration management, data encryption, access control, and also monitoring and logging. So let's start with AWS network security. AWS provides security capabilities and services that can help you secure and protect your data with built-in firewalls, and these are the security groups, also encryption in transit using the TLS, VPNs for dedicated private connections, for example, to your on-premises data center, and also DDoS mitigation technologies. And we will cover DDoS um, just in a couple of minutes in a next section. Now, let's continue with inventory and configuration management. AWS offers several tools that you can make use of. So, for example, deployment tools for creation and decommissioning of AWS services and resources, inventory tools, so you can see a lot of things uh, related to your uh, usage with different services in dashboards, and also template definition in order to create custom EC2 instances uh, with specific config that you can replicate. So it takes some time in the beginning to set up your EC2 instance, you apply patches, you uh, do whatever you need, and when it's done, you just can uh, create, uh, as you have seen, an AMI to an Amazon machine image, if it's a, it's a Linux machine, any other type of machine, so defining the template with everything that you need in your setup and just then reuse that. So this is possible within AWS. Continuing with data encryption, AWS offers the possibility to define encryption at rest for your data. And again, encryption at rest means encryption of data that is not, uh, that is not traveling. So that sits there, for example, in, uh, in S3 or maybe uh, on a database or an EBS volume. So data encryption capabilities available for AWS storage and database services, flexible key management system, AWS or you can manage the encryption keys. So uh, either of two. Hardware-based cryptographic key storage options. This is for the most sensitive customers. Now, access control. AWS gives you full control over access to your AWS services, to the, to the services that you are using. IAM, so identity and access management to define individual user accounts with custom permissions. Multi-factor authentication and also integration and federation with corporate directories. So all these are uh, options available in Amazon Web Services. Now the last one, monitoring and logging. AWS provides multiple tools that can help you with monitoring and logging. So for example, for deep visibility, this is CloudTrail AWS service, and this is the service that will monitor every API call that, ha that happens in your AWS environment. And this is really, really helpful when you want to uh, search for, uh, for an event, for example. Also log aggregation, so this is CloudWatch and you can also uh, receive multiple notifications through alerts, so through emails. Now, now let's also talk about the AWS security guidance. AWS provides customers with guidance and expertise through both online tools and AWS personnel or even partners personnel. So there are also AWS personnels worldwide that can help you with your implementation if you're not very hands-on. So AWS Enterprise Support, we have mentioned this uh, in the previous module with a 15 minutes SLA, 24 seven availability, and also you get a dedicated TAM, so technical account manager. 
AWS Trusted Advisor, we have covered this, and also AWS Professional Services, which means AWS employees, experts, will just configure your setup the way you want or you just need. The last one I want to cover is AWS Compliance Program. AWS computing environments are continuously uh, audited with certifications from different accreditation entities across the world, so across geographies and verticals. And some popular examples maybe you have also heard of is uh, the ISO 27001 and the PCI DSS. In a traditional data center, common compliance activities are often manual. Maybe you have gone through this kind of auditing. Periodic activities and include verifying asset configurations and reporting on administrative activities. Moreover, this is also kind of fun. The resulting reports are out of date before they are even published. And if you want to take a look at what are the uh, current certification that AWS uh, let's say has been awarded or received you can take a look at aws.amazon.com slash compliance and programs so let's just switch now to aws website and have a look all right so i'm now on aws website and here is the aws compliance programs so as you can see there are multiple certifications that aws um, is now uh, has now been awarded so there are global and you here is the iso 27001 or 9001 and others uh, let's say with this one is also very very popular so for payment card standards the PCI DSS level 1 and there are also some specific ones like for example the United States these are different ones so the FIPS uh, for Asia Pacific ones and also for Europe ones so um, maybe you, you receive some kind of questions from your uh, end customers maybe you're doing uh, let's say an implementation maybe you're helping them to migrate some workloads into AWS and if you get any questions related to is AWS or Amazon Web Services compliant to this and this and this this is the web page that you need to to come and check with so probably or most probably AWS will be compliant to whatever uh, the end customer is going to request thank you and see you in the next section In this section, we will cover three AWS services, WAF or Web Application Firewall, Shield, and also Firewall Manager. AWS WAF is a web application firewall that monitors connections forwarded to your web application. A WAF is a protocol layer seven defense, and this relates to the OSI model, and is not designed to defend against all types of attacks. As opposed to typical network firewalls, web application firewalls understand traffic from the application perspective. With WAF, you can monitor, for example, HTTP and HTTPS traffic, which is more than just TCP protocol and AD or 443 port numbers. So that's why uh, this, uh, this is how they are called, so web application firewalls. They understand traffic at layer 7, so from the application perspective. Now let's continue. What is a web application firewall or WAF? WAF typically protects web applications from attacks such as cross-site forgery, cross-site scripting, file inclusion, and also SQL injection. This method of attack mitigation is usually part of a suite of tools which together create a holistic defense against a range of attack vectors. So deploying a WAF in, uh, in front of a web application literally means installing a shield between the web application and uh, the internet users. Now, WAF provides several options that you can configure. So, for example, you can allow all traffic except for specific requests coming from your users. Or maybe you want to block all traffic except requests that you permit. And you can also monitor and count requests with properties that you define. Some of the general benefits of AWS Web Application Firewalls. WAF brings several benefits that you may want to take into consideration in a real-world implementation. So, for example, uh, the WAF brings additional level of security for your web applications. You can define custom rules to protect your web applications. And you can also use WAF API for automated administration in order to ease your administration daily. Now, what is AWS Shield? AWS Shield helps you protect against DDoS attacks. So what's a DOS attack and maybe what's a DDoS attack? Maybe you're not familiar with this terminology. A denial of service or DOS attack is a type of cyber attack in which a hacker aims to make a computer or server unavailable to its users by interrupting the device's normal functioning or normal behavior. 
A distributed denial of service or DDoS attack is a DOS attack that comes from many distributed sources. So for example, a community of hackers around the world that just decide at 6 a.m. in the morning we will just attack that specific server and that will be a DDoS attack. AWS Shield is the AWS service that helps you stay protected from DDoS attacks. And the last one is the AWS Firewall Manager. AWS Firewall Manager simplifies your AWS web administration and maintenance uh, tasks across multiple accounts and resources. With AWS Firewall Manager, you set up your firewall rules just once. The service automatically applies your rules across your accounts and resources, even as you add new resources. Now let's switch over to AWS Management Console in order to check these three AWS services. Alright, I'm now in AWS Management Console and in order to check these three services you'd have to go to Services and under Security, Identity and Compliance you have this option here, AWS WAF and Shield. So click on this and you will now be presented the landing page of AWS WAF and AWS Shield. So these are the three options, WAF, Shield and Firewall Manager. For WAF, AWS WAF is a web, web application firewall service that helps protect your web applications from common exploits that could affect app availability, compromise security, or consume excessive resources. So going to AWS WAF now, in order to just see how it looks. So we can now go ahead and configure a web ACL. So this is the landing page for setting up a web access control list, but this is outside the scope of this exam, so we will just navigate back and also take a look at AWS Shield. So going now to AWS Shield, let's take a look. Uh, here is the thing that it is most important. There are two types of services uh, as related to the Shield one. We are now being here, so this one is activated and it's called AWS Shield Standard. And we see that only two ticks we have here enabled, so the network flow monitoring, and this relates to active monitoring category, and also for the DDoS mitigations, it will help us to protect from common DDoS attacks such as the TCP SYN flood and maybe UDP reflection attacks. In order to have like a full protection against DDoS attacks, we would need to activate AWS Shield Advanced, which will allow us to be protected from uh, multiple, let's say, attacks now. But the idea is that it comes with uh, 3000 US dollars per month. So this is something that you may want to take into consideration before activating this specific service. And the last one is the Firewall Manager. AWS Firewall Manager simplifies your AWS Web Administration and Maintenance tasks across multiple accounts and resources. So this is uh, here in order to help if you have multiple accounts, let's say multiple AWS accounts. So we would uh, consolidate this into AWS organizations and it will make really your life easier when configuring your whole setup. Thank you and see you in the next section. The last AWS service that we will cover in this module is AWS Inspector. So now let's start. What is AWS Inspector? Amazon Inspector tests your Amazon EC2 instances from the network accessibility perspective and also the security state of your applications that run on those instances. Amazon Inspector assesses applications for exposure, vulnerabilities and also deviations from best practices. After running an assessment, Amazon Inspector delivers a detailed list of security findings that is organized by level of severity. With Amazon Inspector, you can install a small software package, and this is called an agent, in the operating system of the EC2 instances that you want to assess. The agent monitors the behavior of the EC2 instances, including network, file system, and also process activity. Still, you are responsible for the security of applications, processes and tools that run on AWS services and remember the security in the cloud. Now let's switch over to AWS Management Console and take a look at AWS Inspector. I am now in AWS Management Console and in order to get started, please click on Services and under Security, Identity and Compliance, please click on Inspector. Now you'll be provided the landing page of Amazon Inspector and let's take a look at what it says. So Amazon Inspector enables you to analyze the behavior of your AWS resources and helps you identify potential security issues. And in order to continue, I will click on get started. So welcome to Amazon Inspector. Amazon Inspector uh, assessments check for security exposures and vulnerabilities in your EC2 instances. And we have here two options like inspector agent is not required and this one inspector agent is required. 
So I will not select the second option and I might say that uh, I have just fired up a EC2 instance. I have applied our security group that we have used throughout the course, so the SG AWS CCP VPC and I will click now run once. So you have chosen to run the following assessments. Check for ports reachable from outside the VPC. The assessment will start now. Pricing is based on the monthly volume usage and I can just click here in order to learn more. But I will not do that. I will just click on OK. And now the assessment is running. Now if you just leave it to run for a couple of minutes depending on how big is your environment, at one point it would say that the analysis is complete. So I will click on recent findings. And we have here some severity levels. So clicking on this one, we'll just rearrange them. Let me just go now to the medium ones. So if I just expand this a little bit, I will see here that this P port, which is associated with SSH, is reachable from, uh, from the internet. I can just expand this line here. And I will see here that the finding is this one, just what I have read earlier. So maybe this is important to, to the client, maybe this is not. It really depends on what is the purpose and what is the goal of that specific EC2 instance. Maybe this is a web server and it should not be open to the internet, to, to everybody in order to connect on port 22 and only to specific IP addresses. So the IP address uh, of the IT administrator. Thank you and see you in the next section. This concludes Module 7, Security in Amazon Web Services. Before sitting the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, please make sure you are comfortable with the AWS security concepts and particularly go through the AWS Shared Responsibility Model. Let's now go over the most important topics covered in this module and the exam hints. So we have started this module with AWS Security Fundamentals and honestly the most important topic is the AWS Shared Responsibility Model. Please make sure you go through the information covered in this URL, so the official page with the shared responsibility model. It will take literally just a couple of minutes, but is absolutely relevant and important for the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. Now moving on, we have talked about the AWS Web Application Firewall. AWS WAF is a web application firewall that monitors connections forwarded to your web application. WAF typically protects web applications from attacks such as cross-site forgery, cross-site scripting and also SQL injection. Deploying a WAF in front of a web application is literally a shield placed between the web application and the internet users. Next we have covered the AWS Shield service. AWS Shield helps you protect against DDoS attacks. We have defined what's a DOS attack or DOS and also what's a DDoS attack. A denial of service or DOS attack is a type of cyber attack in which a hacker aims to make a computer or server unavailable to its users by interrupting the device's normal functioning or behavior. A distributed denial of service or DDoS attack is a DOS attack that comes from many distributed sources. AWS Shield helps you stay protected from DDoS attacks. The last service we covered is AWS Inspector. Amazon Inspector tests your Amazon EC2 instances from the network accessibility perspective and the security state of your applications that run on those instances. Amazon Inspector assesses applications for exposure, vulnerabilities and also deviations from best practices. After running an assessment, Amazon Inspector delivers a detailed list of security findings that is organized by level of security. With that said, please join me in our next and last theoretical module, Module 8, Architecting for the Cloud Best Practices. Thank you and see you in the next module. Welcome to Module 8, Architecting for the Cloud Best Practices. This module provides a brief introduction to AWS Best Practices Architecting for the Cloud. We will start this module by going over a comparison between traditional architectures and AWS cloud computing. Please make sure you are comfortable with AWS best practices when architecting in the cloud before taking the cloud practitioner exam. By the end of this module, I will introduce you several design principles within AWS relevant both in real world scenarios and of course for the cloud practitioner exam. We will cover design principles like scalability, disposable resources, automation, loose coupling and some others too. 
We will wrap up module 8, the last module of the course, highlighting the recommended reading AWS white paper, Architecting for the Cloud Best Practices. With that said, let's get started. In this section, we are going to cover some of the differences between cloud architectures and also traditional environments. So we will start with an introduction. Migrating applications to AWS, even without significant changes, so uh, this is also called lift and shift, so taking your applications as they are of today and moving them to the cloud, provides organizations the benefits of a secured and cost-efficient infrastructure. Architectures need to be changed and get updated, which will lead to immediate benefits like agility and elasticity that are possible and available with cloud computing. Following are the best practices that have emerged as a result of cloud when thinking about traditional computing uh, differences. So the first one, IT assets become programmable resources. In a traditional data center, resources provisioning is done by guessing and making assumptions on the maximum peak load. This results in either idle expensive resources not being utilized or insufficient capacity to handle the traffic. Now this is totally different with cloud computing. You use the right amount of capacity dynamically, scale up or down when needed, pay as you go and only for what you use. AWS services are up and running in minutes. You can use them for as much or as little time as needed with no time limits or constraints. Now, global, available and unlimited capacity with cloud computing. When you deploy your app in the cloud, several best practices should be followed. So the first one is proximity to your end users, compliance or data residency co constraints, costs, and there are some others too. Now, in order to achieve low latency for your applications, you may want to use the Amazon CloudFront Content Delivery Network, and we have covered this uh, in the previous modules too. High availability and fault tolerance for your apps by using the AWS Global Infrastructure, you can deploy it in multiple data centers. So you can use multiple availability zones and also multiple regions. With AWS, there is virtually unlimited capacity to use. You don't have to worry about that. AWS will do the thing for you uh, in the back. Higher level managed services. AWS services are instantly available to use. Compute, storage, databases, analytics, deployment services. Using managed services from AWS help you lower operational complexity and, of course, also the cost. Reducing risk for your project implementations is easy as all AWS managed services are designed for scalability and high availability, and this is a very big, big plus. Now also, let's mention security. With AWS Cloud, governance capabilities that enable continuous monitoring of configuration changes to your IT resources are always on and available. The, this is different than traditional infrastructure, where auditing processes are periodic and manual processes. Solution architects can use quite a lot of native AWS security and encryption features and services, which leads to meeting higher level of uh, compliance and also data protection. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we start our discussion about scalability in regards to AWS design principles. We will start with an overview. So systems that are expected to grow over time need to be built on top of a scalable architecture. Scalable architectures provide the ability to grow your environment when this is needed. So for example, increase in the number of users, traffic throughput increase, and so on. Cloud computing allows virtually unlimited growth, but the underlying architecture must be designed to support this. And you can either scale vertically or horizontally. And we will cover what are these next. We will start with scaling vertically. Scaling vertically means increasing the capacity of your current server as an example. So at, the, at some point you discover that your current server can no longer process the amount of data that is constantly increasing. So as a, as a result, you need to scale or to grow. 
So again, let's have an example. You are running your website on an AWS EC2 instance, and let's say that you're running an A1 uh, medium EC2 instance, which uh, highlights here like a one virtual CPU and two gigabytes of RAM. So this is the uh, the hardware resources that are allocated to an A1 medium EC2 instance. And because you need to grow and you need to scale, um, you will decide maybe to have one of the, the largest EC2 instances in AWS uh, currently. So maybe you will migrate to an M5 24X large, which provides 96 virtual CPUs and a lot of RAM, so 384 gigabytes of RAM. So this is what scaling vertically means. Scaling horizontally now. Scaling horizontally means increasing the number of current resources. And this is like adding more EC2 instances to support your website. This is not always possible depending on the underlying architecture which can or cannot distribute traffic to multiple resources. And we will analyze different scenarios now like stateless applications, stateless components, stateful components and also distributed processing in order to understand more. Let's now start with stateless applications. But first, what does stateless or stateful mean? The key difference between stateful and stateless applications is that stateless applications don't store any data and connections are independent from one another. A, st a stateless application is an application that needs no knowledge of previous interactions and stores no session information. As an example, an application provides the same response to any user with the same input. So no matter how, how many users will try to access like a HTTPS and then the website URL, the first thing that they will get is the landing page. So this is an example of uh, the same response to any user with the same input, like going for that specific URL. Now again, stateless applications, why is this important? Well, stateless applications are a great candidate for horizontal scaling. Simply just add more EC2 instances in order to run your application and terminate EC2 instances when they are no longer needed. The easiest and most popular way to distribute traffic to uh, an EC2 fleet, so an, a fleet of EC2 instances, is through an elastic load balancers. Uh, and we have played quite a lot in, uh, in the course with ELBs. Yeah, they are quite fun and a very, very powerful AWS service. Let's now talk about stateless components. Most applications need to maintain some kind of state information. So web applications need to track whether a user is signed in. This is just an example. Some web applications use HTTP cookies to store data on the client side. Other scenarios require storing larger files. For the second option, Amazon S3 or the uh, Elastic File System could be used. Uh, again, just as an example. Talking about stateful components, well, there are cases where you cannot change all your components in your architecture to be stateless. As an example, uh, real-time multiplayer online gaming, well, users are connected to the same server and low latency and best experience can be achieved this way. Now, this is stateless application, but if you want to map this with uh, horizontal scaling, well, horizontal scaling can be achieved in this case also using what is called the session affinity. And this refers to binding or getting all your connections from a specific user to only a single server. So this can be achieved also. So our last topic, distributed processing. Well, this is similar to breaking a problem into smaller pieces. When a single compute resource cannot process that information because maybe it is too large, right? then the work will be distributed and split into small fragments to more instances. And this use case is absolute common for big data scenarios that are covered in AWS, processing of large volume datasets. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover disposable resources, the second AWS design principle. So what exactly does disposable mean? Well, disposable resources mean temporary resources is available and uh, you can also think of disposable resources as one-time use resources. So you use it when you need it and that's it. Then you terminate it. You don't uh, use it anymore. You, uh, you don't store any information as related to, to them. In traditional data centers environments, you work with fixed resources or servers, and this translates to you as a high upfront cost 
and also a time to production high as well. So what does the time to production mean? Well, let's say that you're running your whole setup in a traditional environment and at some point you need a new server, maybe to grow or just to replace um, a faulty server that you have in your data center. Well, then you will have to raise a PO, so purchase order, and then your, uh, your let's say your financing department will just uh, have a new server ordered at your whatever vendor you're using, so HP or Dell or whatever, right? Then it will take the time to um, to get the server, and when the server uh, will will get to you, then you will have to unpack it, to rack it, to stack it in your data center, maybe to configure also the hypervisor, and you will then be um, in a good position to hand it over to your developers, for example, in order to to start using it. Well, this takes some time, and this is not happening in AWS. With Amazon, you launch as many servers as you need, use them as long as you need them and pay accordingly. So let's start now with configuration drift and immutable infrastructure. Let's talk about these ones. So in a traditional data center, there is something that is called a configuration drift. So configuration changes and software patches can be applied inconsistently and this leads to different configurations and maybe these are also untested on your resources in the data center. You can uh, just end up like having 100 servers and none of them having the same configuration which makes, um, makes it really tough for you in order to manage your infrastructure. Immutable infrastructures, this is something that uh, can solve your previous issue. Instead of patching and modifying initial configuration on your servers, when this is needed, just change the old server with a new one that has the new software packages applied. Now automation. Automation and this is related to infrastructure instantiating. So manually setting up your infrastructure is time consuming and is also error prone. So we are humans and we may uh, do mistakes and actually we do make mistakes. So um, let's say automating your stuff is a great idea and will help you avoid many many possible errors. Now ideally any new environment setup or scaling up existing infrastructure should be done automatically. In AWS you can use what is called bootstrapping and also golden images. So you can use them one by one or maybe both at the same time. Let's start now with bootstrapping. When you launch an EC2 AMI, so an Amazon machine image, the instance starts with a default configuration. Now remember when we configured the EC2 instance to act as a web server? Well, what we did is we connected through the SSH, so right, we were on the CLI with the EC2 instance, and we ran some commands, so sudo su, and then we changed to the root, root user. We installed the HTTP daemon, so we installed the HTTP service, then we started that, then we went to uh, slash var, say, slash www and slash HTML, and we created the landing page, so the index.html. Well, all of these commands can be configured or just can be written there in a bootstrap script, uh, which means that uh, when the EC2 instance will start, then all of these commands will be run in order without having you to type them in. So this is a great thing that uh, you need to do and will help you to, to stay away from errors. Now, when your web server is ready up and running with all security and operating system patches applied, you can then create a snapshot of this EC2 instance. The snapshot, or also called or known as the golden image, may then be used in order to create an Amazon machine image. The AMI could be used, for example, in an auto scaling group so that resources uh, sustaining your app can scale up or down as needed as you will configure in the auto scaling policy. Thank you, and see you in the next section. In this section, we are going to cover automation. So why should I use automation in my environment and what's in it for me? So why should I care? We have briefly touched on this in the previous section. So this brings less manual work, less possible errors, improve your system stability and efficiency. Let's go over some examples of how you can automate your uh, work in AWS. We have talked about briefly, uh, um, so earlier in the course about AWS Elastic Beanstalk. You just upload your application code and provisioning, load balancing, auto scaling and monitoring is done automatically by AWS with Elastic Beanstalk. Now another example, Amazon EC2 Auto Recovery. 
you can just monitor your EC2 instance and if it fails, AWS will create an identical EC2 instance for you. Auto scaling. You can scale your EC2 fleet capacity up or down depending on conditions you define in your auto scaling policy. Another one, the Amazon CloudWatch alarms. You can define alarms that can trigger other actions as well as you configure them, of course. Now the Lambda schedule events. You can just execute a task at a specific time of day or as a result of another thing that happens in your, uh, in your AWS environment. And the last one is AWS OpsWorks um, lifecycle events supports continuous configuration through events. As an example, you update your instances configuration as a result of an event. And that is also called a trigger. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover loose coupling design principle. So what exactly does loose coupling mean? Well, breaking your application into smaller pieces or components in such a way that they are little to no dependent on each other leads to a loose coupling system. So how can loose coupling be implemented? What are the options? And we will explore this right now. Let's talk now about the well-defined interfaces. Communication between the components should be implemented through open source mechanisms. And open source means that these protocols uh, are not developed or created by any specific vendor. They are created by a community and can be used by anyone with no restrictions. Using open source communication interfaces, so again not vendor specific, leads to the possibility of developers to modify and adapt configuration on the fly during or after project implementation. Now let's also talk about service discovery. Implementing loose coupling means that you will have a lot of services that need to either communicate with each other or with other services in your environment. And when I say services, I'm referring to AWS services. There needs to be a way to address or, or call any service in a unique way, loosely, so that no interdependencies are created. As an example, think of load balancers. You can call a load balancer by using the endpoint name, which is totally different than the IP address. So when we tested the, uh, the web server, we just used the load balancer endpoint name which that uh, pointed to the web server itself, so running on the EC2 instance. And again, we have used the endpoint name of the load balancer. Now about asynchronous integration. Asynchronous integration refers to integrations between different services in your infrastructure. And what exactly is asynchronous? Well, if two services can work independently of each other, but together as a system, this means that the system is asynchronous. As an example, service A, let's say that is the SNS, so the notification system, the email, and service B could be the SQS, the queuing system. Or even, even simpler than that, uh, let's think that you are sending an email, so sending an email is service A, and uh, the email is going to arrive at the mail server. The mail server would just send the email to the destination, and this is service B. So, if for whatever reason the, um, the email server is kind of busy and will not send the email right away, well, this, that not, this uh, does not impact sending you the mail. So these are two different uh, aspects of the whole process, sending and receiving the email. The same with uh, this example and the synchronous integration that I've talked about. Now, graceful failure. So graceful failure is also another method to increase loose coupling. When a failure occurs, communication of the failure should be performed into the system and all components should be aware. Rerouting of traffic to healthy services should take place. As an example, Route 53 can reroute client's traffic to healthy EC2 instance that hosts your website. Just that um, it may happen your healthy uh, EC2 instance that regularly hosts your website uh, for whatever reason fails. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we are going to talk about services design principle and it is actually going to be a very, very short section. The main idea is that you should use AWS managed services and migrate to serverless architectures as much as possible. Managed services, which means these services are managed by AWS making your life easier include databases, machine learning, analytics, queuing, email notifications, and even more than that. 
As an example, take Amazon S3. You can store literally any amount of data without worrying about capacity, availability, data replication and actually more. Second topic is serverless. This is the next big thing happening now. Serverless means that you can actually run your application code with no servers. AWS Lambda is the AWS compute service that will run your code on your behalf using AWS architecture. As a bonus, it's even cheaper than traditional cloud computing. With AWS Lambda, you are charged for every 100 milliseconds your code executes and the number of times your code is triggered. Thank you and see you in the next section. This concludes Module 8, Architecting for the Cloud Best Practices. Before sitting the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, please make sure you are comfortable with the AWS concepts related to architecting best practices. Please take the time and go over the white paper, and I'm referring to Architecting for the Cloud Best Practices. It's an easy read and it's really not that long. The white paper is available in the download section at the beginning of the course, so between module 1 and 2, or you can just follow this URL. With that said, please join me in our next and last module, module 9, AWS Account Cleanup. Thank you and see you in the next module. Welcome to module 3, AWS Services High Level Overview. This module provides an introduction and a high-level overview on AWS Cloud Services and it is based on April 2017 AWS White Paper, Overview of Amazon Web Services, indicated as a recommended resource for studying in the official exam guide. We will start and cover first the core and key AWS services like Compute, Storage, Database, Migration, Network and Content Delivery, Management Tools, Security Identity and Compliance, Developer Tool Services, and we will close this first part with AWS Messaging Services. By the end of this module, you will have a good understanding and be able to identify which AWS service can solve a particular task or job, just like you will be questioned during the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. We will wrap up Module 3 after going through the different AWS miscellaneous services that are available under the following categories in AWS Console. Analytics, Artificial Intelligence, Mobile, Application, Business Productivity, Desktop and App Streaming, Internet of Things and Game Development. With that said, let's get started. In this section we are going to talk about AWS Compute Services. So these are the services that will be covered in this section. We will start with Amazon EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud. Then continue with EC2 Container Service, Container Registry, Amazon LightSail, Batch, Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, Amazon Lambda and we will wrap up this section with Amazon Auto Scaling. All of the services can be found under the Compute category in AWS Web Console. So let's start now with Amazon EC2. Now first of all, what's with this name EC2? Well, it comes from the two C's from Compute and Cloud. There you go, two C's and the name Amazon EC2. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, or simply Amazon EC2, is a web service that provides secure, resizable compute capacity in the cloud. So Amazon EC2 makes elastic computing possible. You have full control. You can apply a flexible configuration, whatever you want. It's integrated with most AWS services. It's reliable and AWS guarantees 99.95% availability per year per machine, per Amazon EC2 instance. And of course, this is secure and inexpensive. Simply put, the Amazon EC2 is the virtual machine offering infrastructure as a service from Amazon or AWS. Let's continue now with EC2 Container Registry. Amazon Elastic Container Registry, or simply ECR, is a fully managed Docker container registry that makes it easy for developers to store, manage and deploy Docker container images. Amazon ECR hosts your images in a highly available and scalable architecture, allowing you to reliably deploy containers for your applications. Now, EC2 Container Service. Amazon ECS, or Elastic Container Service, is a highly scalable, high-performance container orchestration service 
that supports Docker containers and allows you to easily run and scale containerized applications on AWS. Now ECS is the AWS service that helps running and scaling applications in Docker containers. So I just keep on saying containers, 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 but maybe you're new to the game. So what is a, a container actually, right? Now think of a container as another form of virtualization. Now maybe you have heard of virtual machines. These allow a piece of hardware to be split into different VMs or virtualized so that the hardware power can be shared among different users and appear as separate servers or machines. On the other hand, the containers virtualize the operating system, splitting it up into, let's say, virtualized compartments to run container applications. Now, how does it work? So this, this refers to Amazon ECR and ECS. So Amazon Elastic Container Registry integrates with Amazon ECS, the container service, and the Docker CLI, allowing you to simplify your de development and production workflows. Now, you can easily push your container images to Amazon ECR using the Docker CLI from your development machine and Amazon ECS can pull them directly for production de um, uh, deployments. As you can see on your screen now, this is just a diagram made available by AWS. Now, let's continue now with Amazon LightSail. So, what, what is it and what's the purpose of it? Now, Amazon LightSail is the easiest way to get started with AWS for developers who just need virtual private servers. LightSail includes everything you need to launch your project quickly. So that would be a virtual machine, storage, SSD based, data transfer, DNS management for name resolution to IP and a static IP for low predictable price. Now, for example, if you start up Amazon LightSail in uh, AWS console, you first select the platform, either Linux or Unix or Microsoft Windows, and then you select a blueprint. So either application plus the operating system or only the operating system. In this case, I have selected WordPress 503-2 version, and I will literally have a WordPress uh, blog site or whatever I want to, to choose to use it very, very, very fast. Let's continue now with Amazon Batch. So again, maybe this is something new for, for you as a terminology. Batch jobs are jobs that can run without user interaction. Batch processing is for frequently used programs that can be run with minimum, uh, minimal human interaction. So this refers to, let's say, scripting. You have like 10 jobs, 10 things that you do recurrently, daily, or maybe, I don't know, let's say a couple of, uh, couple of times per day and you decide that you automate your uh, your job or your daily tasks and this refers to uh, batch uh, jobs now aws batch uh, enables you to run hundreds of thousands of batch computing jobs on aws so this is a very very powerful tool if you want or need to automate your work aws batch dynamically provisions the optimal quantity and type of compute resources and I'm referring to CPU, so the processor and memory, the RAM, based on the volume and specific resource requirements of the jobs submitted. Very, very nice and interesting, uh, let's say, service from AWS. It's Elastic Beanstalk. AWS Elastic Beanstalk helps you deploy, monitor and scale an application quickly and easily. You can simply upload your code written in Java, .NET, PHP, Node.js, Python, Ruby, Go, and Docker and run it on servers like Microsoft IS, Apache, and some others too. Elastic Beanstalk automatically handles the deployment from capacity provisioning, load balancing, and auto-scaling to application health monitoring. So even that. As an example, when you go in AWS console, and you launch the Elastic Beanstalk, create a web app in this example. So I enter the name, this is a test app. I'm now selecting uh, the platform, so I have my code written in Java. I will upload my code, it's a zip archive, and I just click on create application, and that's it. So it will just grow the application or shrink it, depending on the traffic load and uh, the configuration that I will apply. Amazon Lambda. 
very very nice we will uh, definitely talk more about it in the in the core services and uh, the key services so module uh, three and four aws lambda lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers very powerful service from aws you pay only for the compute time you consume there is no charge when your code is not running so you only pay when the code is run by, a, by uh, AWS Lambda. Just upload your code and Lambda takes care of everything required to run and scale your code. Fantastic. As an example, here is the code. I can test it in the uh, Amazon Lambda console. I click run and I see the result. In this case is the simple hello world. Uh, let's say printing the hello world to, to the end user. But anyway, this is... Uh, basically how you test your code before uh, running it production in Amazon Lambda. Now auto scaling. This is the AWS service that I have talked about in the in the Black Friday example. AWS auto scaling can increase the number of Amazon EC2 instances during traffic demand spikes to maintain performance and decrease capacity during traffic silence time for cost reduction. AWS Autoscaling can also help to ensure you are running the desired number of EC2 instances. So for example, I want to make sure that I always run at a minimum three EC2 instances because let's say um, I have the application deployed in a region that has three availability zones and I want to make sure that I have at least one EC2 instance in each of the availability zones. So you can scale up or down automatically the configuration the configuration of EC2 instances based on your desired configuration. Thank you for your time and see you in the next section. In this section we will cover AWS storage services. Now we will talk about the simple storage service or S3, Amazon Elastic Block Store or EBS, Amazon Elastic File System or EFS, Amazon Glacier and we will just wrap up this section with AWS Storage Gateway. Storage services are covered in storage category in AWS console. Let's start with Amazon S3. The name S3 comes from the three S's in simple storage service. So there you go, Amazon S3. Amazon S3 is the AWS object storage service that stores and retrieves any amount of data. So please pay attention, this is object storage service, which means that you will not store operating system files. You will store documents, pictures, videos, and so on, but not operating system files. Amazon S3 is designed for 99.999, so 11 nines durability. And durability means that your information will not be lost. Amazon S3 is simple to use. It's scalable. You don't have to care about uh, if your information, um, let's say, uh, can go inside Amazon S3 or maybe it's too big. No. Amazon S3 is literally infinite, so you can store as much or as little as you want. It's secure, it, pro it provides 99.99 availability per year. It's definitely low cost. You can easily migrate data into or out of S3. And large integration with other AWS services um, is provided. And as you will see in the core section, we will cover S3 uh, also with some examples. It is easy to manage. When I say that you can easily migrate data into or out of S3, I want to also note that data coming into S3 is free, but data leaving S3 will, uh, will come with some uh, price, uh, let's say, charges. So you'll have to pay when you take data out of S3. Let's continue with Amazon EBS or Elastic Block Store. Amazon EBS provides persistent block storage volumes for use with Amazon EC2 instances in the AWS cloud. So this is the, um, the type of storage that you will use in AWS in order to create volumes or partitions or, or um, maybe you know it in, uh, in uh, let's say with this terminology, in your, um, in your machine. So on your laptop, on your uh, desktop, you have uh, maybe multiple partitions. You have the C drive if you're, if you're using Windows for, for Windows operating systems and some other partitions uh, for different files and documents that, that you store. So this is the equivalent Amazon EBS Elastic Block Store that you will use in AWS. 
Amazon EBS offers high performance volumes, 99.999 availability for each EBS volume, encryption for data at rest and in transit, which means data on your EBS volume uh, will be encrypted and also data that is traveling between different EC2 instances, for example, will also be encrypted. Um, EBS also offers access management, which means you can define who can access what. And also snapshots are available, so you can create point-in-time snapshots for your EBS volumes and store these snapshots in S3 for durability. Let's continue now with Amazon EFS or Elastic File System. Amazon EFS provides simple, scalable file storage for use with Amazon EC2 instances in the AWS cloud. Storage capacity is elastic as you add or remove files from the file system and you only pay for the space your files and directories use. EFS file system can be mounted on single or multiple EC2 instances allowing Amazon EFS to provide a common data source for workloads and applications running on more than one EC2 instance. The next storage service is Amazon Glacier. Once the data is stored in Amazon S3, it can be automatically moved into lower cost, so even lower cost, longer term cloud storage classes like Amazon S3 Standard Infrequent Access or IA and Amazon Glacier for archive, uh, archiving purposes. Amazon Glacier is a secure, durable and extremely low cost storage service for data archiving and long term backup. Amazon Glacier provides three options for access to archives from a few minutes to several hours and honestly also pricing is different with, uh, with these options. So the last one is AWS Storage Gateway. AWS Storage Gateway is a hybrid storage service that enables your on-premises applications to seamlessly use AWS Cloud Storage. Applications connect to the service through a VM, so virtual machine, or even a hardware appliance. The gateway connects to AWS storage services such as S3, S3 Glacier, S3 Glacier Deep Archive, Amazon EBS and AWS Backup, providing storage for files, volumes, snapshots and so on. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will talk about AWS database services. So we will talk about RDS, Amazon Aurora, Amazon DynamoDB and Amazon Elastic Cache. These services are covered in the database section under um, AWS console. First, let's start with an introduction to relational databases or SQL. So maybe you're new, so I thought it's a good idea to start with this. First of all, now, what is a database? A database is just a location to store and retrieve data. Think of Microsoft Excel. Microsoft Excel is a great example. Think of spreadsheets in Excel where information is stored in columns and rows, right? Now, relational database, databases can use the information from multiple tables and combine it. And this is like creating relations between tables, helping you to create complex database systems. And you will see just in a moment what I mean by this. Now, let's say that we have three tables in Excel. We have the courses uh, table, students one and registration. Now, in the courses, uh, let's say table, we have the course name, math, history and physics with a course ID. In the students, we have three students and also a student ID. And we also have the third registration table. Now, the registration table has a unique field. This is the registration ID number and also has a course ID and a student ID, which are fields derived from the course table and students table. So the registration table will be populated with information from course table and students table, which these tables represent input data for the registration table. And these are the relations or relationships that are created between tables. Now let's talk about um, the Amazon RDS or Relational Database Service now that we have an idea of what RDS means or Relational Databases. AWS Relational Database Service or RDS makes it easy to set up, operate and scale a relational database in the cloud. It provides cost efficient and resizable capacity while managing time consuming database administration tasks, 
freeing you up to focus on your applications and business. Amazon RDS is fast and easy to administer, highly scalable, available and durable, inexpensive and secure. Now, for example, if you go to AWS console and go to the RDS section, when you start your configuration, you first have to create the database. So select what kind of database you want. The Amazon Aurora is the AWS offering. And then you have some others as well. So MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, Oracle, and even Microsoft is SQL Server. Let's continue now with Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora is a MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible relational database engine that combines the speed and availability of high-end commercial databases with the simplicity and cost effectiveness of open source databases. AWS Aurora is highly scalable and I'm referring to being able to grow up to 32 CPUs, virtual CPUs and 244 gigs of RAM. It is highly available, providing 99.99 .99 availability, highly secure because you can encrypt the data at rest and also in transit through SSL, so secure uh, socket layer. It is MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible and it is fully managed by AWS. So you don't have to worry about managing it, patching it and so on. You just have to use it if you may choose to do so. Now let's talk also uh, about the uh, NoSQL databases or non-relational databases. So how are these different than the previous one, the RDS, Relational Database Service? With relational databases, you need to have the database structure defined before you consume data or you insert data into the database. What I mean by this? Now look at the three tables, the courses, students and registration. Where can I insert, for example, the student phone number? The field is not available, so you have to define a new column and start populating the database with new information as required. So with the relational databases, you first have to define the column and then populate the data. But with NoSQL databases or no non-relational databases, this is no longer needed. With NoSQL databases, you are given the flexibility to use data and insert it in your database as you go without prior defining the column, as I said as in uh, the previous example. An example of NoSQL databases is using key value pairs. What I mean by this is that there are actual, actually more types or more flavors of NoSQL databases and this is an example, so one of the options, a key value uh, pairs. So you define the key, in this case let's say it's the course name and the value can be math, history and physics. You define also another key, student name and you have another value, Mary or John or Gabriel. And also now you have the phone number. So you add it as you go. You don't need to uh, define it before working with the, with the NoSQL database. Course, student, phone number, address. Now, NoSQL databases are widely recognized for their ease of development, functionality and performance at scale. Amazon DynamoDB. So Amazon Dynamo, DynamoDB is a fast and flexible NoSQL database service for all applications that need consistent single digit millisecond latency at any scale. So you can literally scale very, very almost to infinite to say so. Amazon DynamoDB is, um, is fast. So again, single digit latency, highly scalable. It is fully managed by AWS. No worries about uh, operating system patching and so on. It is flexible, so it supports multiple NoSQL database types. It is event-driven programming. You can integrate it with AWS Lambda and flexible user access control. And I mean that it, uh, it integrates with Identity and Access Management or IAM. Now, Amazon Elastic Cache. AWS Elastic Cache is a web service that makes it easy to deploy, operate and scale in-memory cache in the cloud. The service improves the performance of web applications by allowing you to retrieve information from fast, managed, in-memory caches instead of relying entirely on slower disk-based uh, databases. Amazon Elastic Cache supports two open source in-memory caching engines, just that you know, and their names are Redis and Memcached. Thank you and see you in the next section.
In this section, we will cover AWS Migration Services. So we will cover AWS Application Discovery Service, Database Migration Service, Server Migration Service, AWS Snowball, AWS Snowball Edge, and we will wrap up this section with AWS Snowmobile. These services are covered in Migration and Transfer category under AWS Console. So let's start now with AWS Application Discovery Service or ADS. AWS ADS can help you plan application migration projects by automatically identifying applications running in your on-premises data centers, their dependencies and performance profiles. So it's actually an inventory tool in order to see what you actually have, what you currently have in your on-premises data center so that you need what uh, so that you know what you need to move in the AWS cloud. Now, AWS ADS collects configuration and usage data from servers, storage, and networking equipment to develop a list of applications, how they perform, and how they are interdependent. Next on our list is AWS Database Migration Service. AWS Database Migration Service helps you migrate databases to AWS easily and securely. The source database remains fully oper operational during the, the migration, minimizing downtime to applications that rely on the database. So keeping the original to say so database fully operational during the migration until it's done is crucial and it's absolutely important. AWS database migration service can also be used for continuous data replication with high availability. Now what data replication means is that the actual data that you have on your database, you will copy it and create a replica. So you'll have uh, the same amount uh, of information, the same actual information in another location. And this means that you're replicating the data. Uh, by doing so, you will achieve high availability, meaning, meaning that in case the, let's say, primary database fails, the information will be available in a second location. So the same with availability zones and regions. This is the same concept, which is a uh, high availability. Now let's continue with AWS Server Migration Service or SMS. AWS Server Migration Service is an agentless service which makes it easier and faster for you to migrate thousands of on-premises workloads to AWS. AWS SMS allows you to automate, schedule, and track incremental replications of live server volumes, making it easier for you to coordinate large-scale server migrations. Now, let's talk about Snowball. AWS Snowball services are AWS data transport solutions that use secure appliances to transfer large amounts of data into and out of AWS. I want you to think of uh, the Snowball as extremely large USB sticks. Really large, I mean. You use AWS Snowball services when the time it takes to uh, transfer data between on-premise data center and AWS, so in or out to AWS, it's insanely big, huge, and the goal is to minimize the data migration time. Let's start with AWS Snowball and you can see how it looks on your screen now. AWS Snowball is a petabyte scale data transport solution that uses secure appliances to transfer large amounts of data into and out of AWS. So what is a petabyte? What well, a petabyte is 1000 terabytes. The use of Snowball addresses common challenges with large scale data transfers, including high network costs, long transfer times and security concerns. Data transfer with Snowball is simple, fast, secure, and can be as little as one-fifth the cost of high-speed internet. So it's actually also a good choice from the price perspective. Now the Snowball Edge. AWS Snowball Edge is a 100 terabytes data transfer device, and again you can see it on the screen, with onboard storage and compute capabilities. You can use Snowball Edge to move large amounts of data into and out of AWS. And he, here you can see also a comparison between Snowball and Snowball Edge. Snowball, just let's compare just the, the storage capacity. Snowball comes in two uh, options, 50 and 80 terabytes, while the Snowball Edge is 100 terabytes in size. The last one is AWS Snow Mobile. 
Yes, it's actually a truck. Here you have it on your screen. AWS Nobile is Hexabyte scale data transfer service used to move extremely large amounts of data to AWS. So one exabyte means 1000 petabyte, which means 1 million terabytes. And that is really, really huge. You can transfer up to 100 petabytes per snowmobile, secure, fast, and cost effective. Thank you, and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS networking and content delivery services. So we will go through Amazon VPC, Amazon CloudFront, Amazon Route 53, AWS Direct Connect and we will wrap up this section with Elastic Load Balancing. Services are covered in Networking and Content Delivery section under AWS Console. So let's start now with AWS Virtual Private Cloud or VPC. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud or simply put Amazon VPC lets you provision a logically isolated section of the AWS Cloud where you can launch AWS resources in a virtual network that you define. Let's think of AWS VPC as your virtual data center in the cloud because it's just like that. Your VPC, your private data center in the AWS cloud. You have complete control over your virtual networking environment. You can select your IP address range, create subnets, configure route tables and so on. Now let's continue with CloudFront. Also, we have covered CloudFront in Module 2, Introduction to uh, AWS Cloud. Amazon CloudFront is a global content delivery network or CDN service that accelerates delivery of your websites, APIs, video content or other web assets. Amazon CloudFront can be used to deliver your entire website including dynamic, static, streaming and interactive content using a global network of edge locations and regional edge caches. But I think you already know that, right? And you can only you, you pay only for the content you actually deliver through the CDN which is great. Amazon Route 53 or the DNS service from Amazon. Amazon Route 53 is a highly available and scalable cloud domain name system or DNS web service. AWS Route 53 routes end users to internet applications by translating human readable names such as www.example.com into the numeric IP addresses such as 192.0.1 uh, this is because computers use IPs to connect to each other. So for example, one computer when it tries to connect to a web service, so example.com, it doesn't know how to connect to example.com. It will use DNS in order to find out what's the IP address corresponding to example.com and then it will connect to that IP address as in this example 192.0.2.1. Now AWS Direct Connect. With AWS Direct Connect, you can establish a dedicated network connection from your on-premises data center to AWS. This way you can reduce your network costs and increase bandwidth uh, throughput between on-premises locations and AWS Cloud. Now think of the cloud hybrid model where you have some resources in your um, on-premises data center and some of them in the AWS Cloud and you need a high bandwidth, low latency connection between these two. Now this is a great example when you will go for Direct Connect AWS service. The dedicated connection is established using industry standard uh, 802.1Q virtual LANs or VLANs. AWS Elastic Load Balancing. Elastic Load Balancing or simply ELB automatically distributes incoming application traffic across multiple EC2 instances. ELB can handle the varying load of your application traffic in a single availability zone or AZ or across multiple availability zones. It enables you to achieve greater levels of fault tolerance in your applications, seamlessly providing the required amount of load balancing capacity needed to distribute application traffic. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will cover AWS Management Tools services. We will start with Amazon CloudWatch, then continue with Amazon EC2 Systems Manager, CloudFormation, CloudTrail, AWS Config, OpsWorks, Service Catalog, Trusted Advisor, Personal Health Dashboard, and we will wrap up this section with AWS Managed Services. Services in this section are under Management and Governance in AWS Console. So let's start with Amazon CloudWatch. Amazon CloudWatch is a monitoring service for AWS cloud resources and the applications you run on AWS. 
With Amazon CloudWatch, you can collect and track metrics, collect and monitor log files, set alarms and automatically react to changes in your resources. You can use Amazon CloudWatch to gain system-wide visibility into resource utilization, application performance and operational health. I want you to think of Amazon CloudWatch as your monitoring tool and this is for your exam as well. Amazon EC2 Systems Manager Amazon EC2 Systems Manager is a management service. You can automatically collect software inventory, apply operating system or OS patches, create system images and configure Windows and Linux. And by the way, EC2 Systems Manager is simple to use. You simply select the EC2 instances you want to manage and define the management tasks you want to perform. AWS CloudFormation AWS CloudFormation enables you to create and manage a collection of related AWS resources, provisioning and updating them in an orderly and predictable fashion. CloudFormation provisions and manages stacks of AWS resources based on templates you create and model your infrastructure architecture. With CloudFormation, you can script and automate your work, future and recurrent deployments. So for example, if you usually run tasks like create a VPC and then create an elastic load balancer there uh, in order to distribute traffic to several EC2 instances in different avail availability zones. And maybe also these uh, EC2 instances are WordPress uh, websites that also have some relational databases connected. Then instead of going through uh, each of the steps that I've mentioned, you can create a CloudFormation template and literally script your configuration. So when you create the template, you just launch it with CloudFormation and just wait. And your configuration or your, let's say, architecture will be built automatically by AWS. Now let's continue with AWS CloudTrail. With AWS CloudTrail, you can log, continuously monitor and retain account activity related to actions across your AWS infrastructure. CloudTrail provides event history of your AWS account activity, including actions taken through the Management Console, SDK, CLI and other AWS services. Now, key note, AWS CloudTrail equals to logging. So with this AWS service, you, you will have logs available in order to see what, uh, what's happening with your uh, services in your account. And with CloudWatch, you gain monitoring in your AWS account. Next service is AWS Config. AWS Config is a service that enables you to assess, audit and evaluate the configurations of your uh, AWS resources. With AWS Config, you can monitor and record your AWS resource configurations and review changes in configurations and relationships between resources. AWS Config simplifies compliance auditing, which is also very, very important, security analysis, change management and operational troubleshooting. Now, some of the AWS, um, let's say miscellaneous management tools, not that they're not important, but really, really not important for the cloud practitioner exam. Anyway, you should know uh, what it is. Use this chef to automate how servers are configured, deployed and managed across your EC2 instances. AWS Service Catalog allows organizations to create and manage catalogs of IT services that are approved for use on AWS. Trusted Advisor provides real-time guidance to help you provision your resources following AWS best practices. AWS Managed Services automates common activities such as change requests, monitoring, patch management, security and backup services and provides full lifecycle life cycle, uh, services to provision, run and support your infrastructure. And the last one is AWS Personal Health Dashboard. This service provides alerts and remediation guidance when AWS is experiencing events that might affect you. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS Security, Identity and Compliance Services. We will start with AWS Identity and Access Management or IAM, continue with Key Management Service, AWS Shield and AWS WEF, Amazon Cloud Directory, AWS Directory Service, Amazon Inspector, AWS Organizations, AWS Certificate Manager, and we will wrap up this section with AWS Cloud HSM. 
Services in this section are covered under Security, Identity and Compliance section in AWS console. Let's start now with AWS IAM. So AWS Identity and Access Management enables you to securely control access to AWS services and resources for your users. With IAM, you can create and manage AWS users and groups and use permissions to allow and deny their access to AWS resources. Using Identity and Access Management, you can control who can access what resources, when is this possible and how. AWS Key Management Service AWS K, uh, KMS or Key Management Service is a managed service that makes it easy for you to create and control the encryption keys used to encrypt your data. AWS KMS is integrated with different AWS services to help you protect data used or stored by these services. Also, KMS is also integrated with CloudTrail in order to provide logs of what encryption keys are being used. Let's continue now with security services. AWS Shield. AWS Shield is a managed distributed denial of service or DDoS protection service that safeguards web applications running on AWS. But maybe you're not aware of DOS and DDoS. A denial of service or DOS attack is a malicious attempt to overwhelm an online service and make it unusable, so literally to shut down the service. While a dis distributed denial of service, a DDoS attack, occurs when multiple systems or hackers orchestrate a synchronized DOS attack to a single target. And you can protect from this kind of attacks, DDoS attacks, with AWS Shield. AWS WAF AWS Web Application Firewall or WAF is a web application firewall that helps protect your web applications from common web exploits or attacks. You can use AWS WAF to create custom rules that block attack patterns such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting and others. With AWS WAF you can also define which traffic to allow or block to your web application. Now Amazon Cloud Directory Amazon Cloud Directory enables you to build flexible cloud-native directories for organizing hierarchies of data along multiple dimensions. Now maybe you're thinking what are directories? So directories store information about users, groups and devices and IT administrators use them to manage access to information and resources based on these attributes, users, groups and devices. Amazon Cloud Directory is used for cloud uh, cloud scale deployments of this kind. Now, on the other hand, AWS Directory Service is going to be used for smaller deployments. So, you should use AWS Directory Service for Microsoft Active Directory, either standard or enterprise edition, if you need an actual Microsoft Active Directory in the AWS cloud. Some of the features support it Active Directory aware workloads or AWS applications and services such as Amazon Workspaces and Amazon QuickSight, also LDAP support for Linux applications. So the takeaway for this uh, service is that AWS Directory Services equals Microsoft AD. Some of the other miscellaneous services. So Amazon Inspector is an automated security assessment service that helps improve the security and compliance of applications deployed on AWS. AWS organizations allow you to create groups of AWS accounts for multiple accounts centralized management. AWS Certificate Manager is a service that lets you provision, manage and deploy SSL TLS certificates for use with AWS services. So this is some kind of a, a certificate authority, so a CA. AWS Cloud HSM is a cloud-based hardware security module HSM, that enables you to easily generate and use your own encryption keys on the AWS cloud. And this is different than using the KMS, the key management system, when you rely on the AWS, uh, let's say, service in order to generate the encryption keys. With Cloud HSM, you can use your own encryption keys. You can securely generate, store and manage the cryptographic keys used for data encryption such that they are accessible only by you. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will cover AWS Security Identity and Compliance Services. We will start with AWS Identity and Access Management or IAM, continue with Key Management Service, AWS Shield and AWS WAF, 
Amazon Cloud Directory, AWS Directory Service, Amazon Inspector, AWS Organizations, AWS Certificate Manager, and we will wrap up this section with AWS Cloud HSM. Services in this section are covered under Security, Identity and Compliance section in AWS Console. Let's start now with AWS IAM. So, AWS Identity and Access Management enables you to securely control access to AWS services and resources for your users. With IAM, you can create and manage AWS users and groups and use permissions to allow and deny their access to AWS resources. Using Identity and Access Management, you can control who can access what resources, when is this possible and how. AWS Key Management Service AWS K, uh, KMS or Key Management Service is a managed service that makes it easy for you to create and control the encryption keys used to encrypt your data. AWS KMS is integrated with different AWS services to help you protect data used or stored by these services. Also, KMS is also integrated with CloudTrail in order to provide logs of what encryption keys are being used. Let's continue now with security services. AWS Shield. AWS Shield is a managed distributed denial of service or DDoS protection service that safeguards web applications running on AWS. But maybe you're not aware of DOS and DDoS. A denial of service or DOS attack is a malicious attempt to overwhelm an online service and make it unusable, so literally to shut down the service. While a dis distributed denial of service, a DDoS attack, occurs when multiple systems or hackers orchestrate a synchronized DOS attack to a single target. And you can protect from this kind of attacks, DDoS attacks, with AWS Shield. AWS WAF AWS Web Application Firewall, or WAF, is a web application firewall that helps protect your web applications from common web exploits or attacks. You can use AWS WAF to create custom rules that block attack patterns such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and others. With AWS WAF, you can also define which traffic to allow or block to your web application. Now, Amazon Cloud Directory. Amazon Cloud Directory enables you to build flexible cloud-native directories for organizing hierarchies of data along multiple dimensions. Now, maybe you're thinking, what are directories? So, directories store information about users, groups, and devices and IT administrators use them to manage access to information and resources based on these attributes users groups and devices amazon cloud directory is used for cloud uh, cloud scale deployments of this kind now on the other hand aws directory service is going to be used for smaller deployments so you should use aws directory service for microsoft active directory either standard or enterprise edition if you need an actual microsoft active directory in the aws cloud some of the features support it active directory aware workloads or aws applications and services such as amazon workspaces and amazon quicksight also ldap support for linux applications so the takeaway for this uh, service is that AWS Directory Services equals Microsoft AD. Some of the other miscellaneous services. So Amazon Inspector is an automated security assessment service that helps improve the security and compliance of applications deployed on AWS. AWS organizations allow you to create groups of AWS accounts for multiple accounts centralized management. AWS Certificate Manager is a service that lets you provision, manage, and deploy SSL TLS certificates for use with AWS services. So this is some kind of a, a certificate authority, so a CA. AWS Cloud HSM is a cloud-based hardware security module, HSM, that enables you to easily generate and use your own encryption keys on the AWS Cloud. And this is different than using the KMS, the Key Management System, when you rely on the AWS, uh, let's say, service in order to generate the encryption keys. With Cloud HSM, you can use your own encryption keys. You can securely generate, store, and manage the cryptographic keys used for data encryption such that they are accessible only by you. Thank you, and see you in the next section.
In this section, we will cover AWS Developer Tools services. We'll go through code commit, code build, code deploy, code pipeline, and we will wrap up this section with AWS X-Ray. Services covered in this section are under Developer Tools in AWS Console. So let's start now. AWS Code Commit is a fully managed source control service that makes it easy for companies to host private Git repositories. AWS Code Build is a fully managed build service that compiles source code, runs tests, and produces software packages that are ready to deploy. Code Deploy is a service that automates code deployments to any instance, including EC2 instances and instances running on premises. Code Pipeline is a continuous integration and continuous delivery service for fast and reliable application and infrastructure updates. Code Pipeline builds tests and deploys your code every time there is a code change. And last one, AWS X-Ray helps developers analyze and debug distributed applications in production or under development. With X-Ray, you can understand how your app is performing, so you can identify and troubleshoot the root cause of performance issues and errors. Thank you, and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS messaging services. Specifically, we will go through Amazon Simple Queue Service or SQS, Amazon Simple Notification Service or SNS, and Amazon Simple Email Service or SES. These services can be found in AWS Console under Application Integration and Customer Engagement sections. So let's start now. Amazon Simple Queue Service or SQS is a fast, reliable, scalable, fully managed message queuing service. Using SQS, you can send, store, and receive messages between software components. Amazon Simple Notification Service, or SNS, is a fast, flexible, fully managed push notification service that lets you send individual messages or to large number of recipients. The last service is Amazon Simple Email Service. Amazon SES is a cost-effective email service. With Amazon SES, you can send transactional email, marketing messages, or any other type of high quality content to your customers. You can also use Amazon SES to receive messages, call your custom code via an AWS Lambda function or publish notifications to Amazon SNS. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will go over AWS Analytics services. Now services covered in this section, Amazon Athena, Amazon Elastic Map Reduce or EMR, Amazon Cloud Search, Elasticsearch Service, Kinesis, Redshift, QuickSight, Data Pipeline, and we will wrap up this section with AWS Glue. Services covered in this section can be found in AWS Console on uh, Analytics, let's say, category. And let's start now with the different miscellaneous analytics services. First, Amazon Athena. It is an interactive query service that makes it easy to analyze data in Amazon S3 using standard SQL uh, syntax. You point to your data in S3, define the schema and start querying using standard SQL. Amazon Elastic MapReduce EMR provides a managed Hadoop framework that makes it easy, fast and cost effective to process vast amounts of data across dynamically scalable EC2 instances. So this refers to big data framework. Amazon Cloud Search is a managed service in the AWS cloud that makes it simple and cost effective to set up, manage and scale a search solution for your website or application. Amazon Elastic Search service makes it easy to deploy, operate and scale Elastic Search for log analytics, full text search, application monitoring and quite even more. Now let's start with Kinesis and its variants. Amazon Kinesis is a platform for streaming data on AWS, offering powerful services to make it easy to load and analyze streaming data. With Kinesis, you simply collect, process and store data continuously. So let's start with the first one, Kinesis Firehose, which means you simply collect, I said, right? So Amazon Kinesis Firehose is the easiest way to load streaming data into AWS. You can capture, transform and load string data into Kinesis Analytics, S3, Redshift and Elasticsearch service, enabling near real-time analytics with existing businesses. The next two variants, so Kinesis Analytics, is the easiest way to process streaming data in real-time 
with standard SQL without having to learn new programming languages or processing frameworks. And the last one for storing data, Kinesis Streams. Amazon Kinesis Streams can continuously capture and store terabytes of data per hour from hundreds of thousands of sources. Let's continue now with Amazon Redshift. Redshift is a fast, fully managed petabyte scale data warehouse that makes it simple and cost effective to analyze all your data using your existing business intelligence tools. So please know that or retain that Amazon Redshift is simply a data warehousing service. Amazon QuickSight is a fast cloud powered business analytics service that makes it easy to build visualizations, perform ad hoc analysis and quickly get business insights from your data. And this is something that you would use probably for your C-level executives. You can create with QuickSight stunning visualizations and rich dashboards. Now the last two services, AWS Data Pipeline is a web service that helps you reliably process and move data between different AWS compute and storage services, as well as on-premises data sources at specified intervals at your own convenience. The last one, AWS Glue, is a fully managed ETL service that makes it easy to move data between your data stores. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS Artificial Intelligence Services. So Amazon Lex, Amazon Poly, Amazon Recognition, and we will wrap up this section with Amazon Machine Learning. So services covered in this section can be found in AWS console under Machine Learning category. So let's start with Amazon Lex. Amazon Lex is a service for building conversational interfaces into any application using voice and text. Lex brings automatic speech recognition or ASR for converting speech to text and natural language understanding to recognize the intent of the text. Amazon Polly is a service that turns text into lifelike speech. Polly is an Amazon artificial intelligence or AI service that uses advanced deep learning technologies to synthesize speech that sounds like a human voice and this is really powerful. Amazon Recognition is a service that makes it easy to add image analysis to your applications. With Recognition, you can detect objects, scenes and faces in images. Amazon Machine Learning is a service that makes it easy for developers of all skill levels to use machine learning technology. Amazon ML provides visualization tools and wizards that guide you through the process of creating ML models without having to learn complex ML algorithms and technology. Thank you for your time and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS Mobile Services. AWS Mobile Hub, Amazon Cognito, Amazon Pinpoint, and the last section, AWS Device Farm. So these uh, services can be found in AWS console under Customer Engagement and Mobile Categories. So let's start with AWS Mobile Hub. AWS Mobile Hub provides an integrated console experience that you can use to quickly create and configure powerful mobile app backend features and integrate them into your mobile app. Amazon Cognito lets you easily add user sign up and sign in to your mobile and web applications. With Cognito, you also have the option to authenticate users through social identity providers such as Facebook, Twitter or Amazon. Amazon Pinpoint makes it easy to run targeted campaigns to drive user engagement in mobile applications. Pinpoint helps you understand user behavior, define which user to target, determine which messages to send, schedule the time to deliver the messages, and then track the campaign results. The last service, AWS Device Farm, is an application testing service that lets you test and interact with your Android, iOS, and web applications on many devices at once or reproduce issues on a device in real time for testing purposes. Thank you for your time and see you in the next section. In this section, we will cover AWS application services. We'll go through AWS Step Functions, Amazon API Gateway, Amazon Elastic Transcoder, and we will wrap up this section with Amazon Simple Workflow Service or SWF. These services can be found under the AWS console in networking and content delivery application integration and media services categories. So let's start with Step Functions. Building applications from individual components that each perform a discrete function lets you scale and change applications quickly. Step Functions provides a graphical console to arrange and visualize the components of your application as a series of steps. 
Amazon API Gateway handles all the tasks involved in accepting and processing concurrent API calls, including traffic management, authorization and access control, monitoring and API version management. Amazon Elastic Transcoder is a media transcoding in the cloud. You can convert or transcode media files from their source format into versions that will play on devices like smartphones, tablets and PCs. The last service, Amazon Simple Workflow Service or SWF, makes it easy to build applications that use Amazon's cloud to coordinate work across distributed components. SWF tracks the state and coordinates tasks of background jobs of your applications. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we will go over the AWS Business Productivity Services. So the services are Amazon WorkDocs, Amazon WorkMail and Amazon Chime. These services can be found under the AWS console in end user computing and business applications categories. With Amazon WorkDocs, users can comment on files, send them to others for feedback and upload new versions. Users can take advantage of these capabilities using the device of their choice, including PCs, Macs, tablets and phones. Another similar product from Google, for example, is Google Docs and you can work with Google Docs in the cloud, in Word, in Excel, PowerPoint and so on. Amazon WorkMail is a secure managed business email and calendar service with support for existing desktop and mobile email client applications. So this is similar to Gmail for example, right? Now the last service is Amazon Chime. Amazon Chime is a communications service for online meetings. You can use Amazon Chime for online meetings, video conferencing, calls, chat and to share content inside the and outside your organization. And probably the most popular one would be Webex from Cisco as an alternative. Thank you for your time and see you in the next section. In this section we will go over AWS desktop and app streaming services. So only two services covered in this section, Amazon Workspaces and Amazon App Stream 2.0. You can find these services under AWS console in end user computing category. Amazon Workspaces is a fully managed, secure desktop computing service that runs on the AWS cloud. You provide your users access to the documents, applications and resources they need from any supported device. And this is basically the AWS VDI service alternative. Amazon App Stream 2.0 is a fully managed streaming service that allows you to stream desktop applications from AWS to any device running a web browser. Other examples in the industry would be Citrix or Microsoft AppV, Google App Streaming and others as well. Thank you for your time and see you in the next section. In this section we will cover AWS Internet of Things or simply IoT services. So we will cover AWS IoT platform and the two services AWS Greengrass and the AWS IoT Button. These services can be found in AWS console under Internet of Things category. AWS IoT is a managed cloud platform that lets connected devices easily and securely interact with cloud applications and other devices. AWS Greengrass is software that lets you run local compute messaging and data caching for connected devices in a secure way. With AWS Greengrass, connected devices can run Lambda functions, keep device data in sync and communicate with other devices securely. The AWS IoT button is a programmable button, so it is actually a piece of hardware. This simple Wi-Fi device is, is, is easy to configure and it's designed for developers to get started with AWS IoT, AWS Lambda, Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon SNS and many other services without writing device specific code. Now you can literally configure button clicks to do whatever you want, to count or track items, to call someone, to start or stop something let's say to open the garage door, to order pizza and many, many other interesting things. Thank you and see you in the next section. In this section we go over the AWS Game Development Services and it is actually a single service in Game Development category in the AWS console. The name is Amazon GameLift. Amazon GameLift is a managed service for deploying, operating and scaling dedicated game servers for session-based multiplayer games. Amazon GameLift makes it easy to manage server infrastructure, scale capacity to lower latency and cost, match players into available game sessions and defend from DDoS attacks. Thank you and see you in the next section.
This concludes Module 3, AWS Services High Level Overview. So congrats for your progress on the course, you have learned quite a lot in these first three modules. You created your free tier AWS account and installed useful software on your PC. You have gone through the introduction to AWS Cloud Computing and learned about regions, availability zones and edge locations and also about the different AWS management interfaces. Before sitting the real cloud practitioner exam, please make sure you know the different AWS core services and what was the task these services were designed to solve. You should at least be prepared to answer different questions that are related to the following service categories. Compute, storage, database, migration, network and content delivery, management tools, security, uh, identity and compliance and messaging services. All slides are available for download in their respective section if you want to use them while reviewing the AWS services covered in this module. In the next two modules, we will start to deep dive on each of the core AWS services with a real hands-on and practical approach, so please be ready to use your AWS account extensively. With that said, please join me in our next module, Module 4, AWS Core Services The Backbone, where the course gets really, really hands-on and a lot of fun. So let's get started. In this section, we will clean up your AWS account so that we make sure you will not be charged for any AWS services that you may have left running in there. So now let's switch over to AWS Management Console and get started. All right, I have logged into AWS Management Console and remember that almost everything that we have configured is related to our VPC. So let's check our VPC first. So services and then I will just go down to networking and content delivery and I will just click on VPC. Here we can see our VPC, our own created VPC and also the default one. So let's go on and click on VPCs and I will see here my AWS CCP VPC. Now if I just click on this one and go to actions and say delete VPC, it says that it is unable to delete this VPC because different resources are tied to this VPC. And I have here uh, EC2 instance and also some network interfaces defined here. So what we need to do actually is go to AWS. So this is the landing page and I'll just navigate to EC2, so Elastic Compute Cloud. And I'll go into running instances with this one only being selected. It may differ um, from what you currently have, but you get the point. So you have to delete everything that it says there in the VPC. In my case, I have only this one, so I'll just click on Actions and Instance State and go to Terminate. And I will click Yes, Terminate in order to validate my choice. It said that I also have some, um, some interfaces there. So let's now go over anything that is covered in EC2. So Instances, it's here. I have no other instances. Volumes, let's see if we have any other. So this one is in Use. Let's try to go and detach volume yes detach it is not being uh, detached right so it's it, it is related to our ec2 instance that is currently being terminated so this one should disappear once the instance is terminated and deleted now if i go to elastic ips i don't have anything here this is great network interfaces this is something that um, the vpc was complaining about so I can see here in security groups is this one and for the VPC. So it says that it is the same VPC. All right. So I will select both and say detach and force detachment. Yes, detach. And again, let's go over the load balancers. I believe we should have at least one here. So we have this application load balancer. I will just click on actions and then say delete and yes, delete good any target groups we have the target group one this so this is selected click on delete and then yes to confirm let's go down launch configurations do we have anything here we should have because we have played with auto scaling groups so i have this one and the name was web server launch configuration so this is selecting then i will just say delete launch configuration and yes delete 
it cannot be deleted because it is attached to this specific uh, auto scaling group so now let's go to auto scaling group and i will say that actions and this is delete and yes delete it is now being deleted and let's see if we now can delete the uh, the launch configuration and yes and yes so we are good here great systems manager no we're fine so let's go over again and take a look in vpc and let's see if now it's complaining or not so if i go again into vpcs and i will try to delete my first one here and let's say so it is complaining about this specific network interface so i'm taking the name and i will just go again to the landing page of aws and go to ec2 and search for network interfaces and it is saying so it is saying that this is the one so i'm searching yes this is the one security groups description rds network interface good so now we'll have to go to the RDS databases, so services, and then just go back, the, go down here to RDS, it's under database, and let's see if we have any databases here. And if I click on databases, I see this one and the status is available. So do not uh, forget to also delete your RDS database. I am selecting the, the, the database, go into actions, and, they, and then say delete, delete me, and delete. And let's refresh now. It is saying deleting. And if you go back to EC2, let's get back to EC2 and go down to network interfaces. So here is the network interfaces. And let me just say detach and force detachment and yes, detach. No. So I will just wait for a couple of minutes in order for the RDS database to be uh, to be deleted. And afterwards, I should be able to... Um, to delete this network interface as well now let's do a refresh on the database it still says deleting let me just try again and delete the the network interface so going to ec2 and then going down to network interfaces it says here that no interfaces um, are available so deleting the rds the rds instance actually deleted everything here in ec2 great now what else have we used so let's get to aws landing page we have also uh, used im so identity and access management and you can just leave it here it will not be um, charge you anything but it is also a good idea to delete everything here so that you have a clean account when you start just using the uh, the platform so now let's get back to the vpc itself so going to the recently visited services i should now see again the two vpcs so clicking on the number I will select my VPC and then go to actions and delete VPC. So are you sure you want to delete this VPC and I'm providing the identifier and also the name? Deleting this VPC will also delete these objects associated with this VPC in this region. Yes, I really want to delete everything. I want to leave my account clean. So click on delete VPC and everything is being deleted by AWS on your behalf. The VPC was deleted, close and the page should now be updated. So now, what's next? Well, two exam tests are ready in order to test your knowledge. 65 questions each of the tests and 100 uh, minutes in order to complete that. And this is just like in the real exam. Exam tests should be used as a learning tool also. And this means that uh, you can just go over and over the test until you master everything that is included there. Please make sure that you take the time and complete each of the tests with no interruption. So I'm referring to a quiet place, no phones, emails, and anything that can distract you. Well, good luck! Thank you, and see you in the last module of the course. Right after you finish these two tests, we will just book your exam. Good luck again! Alright, so it's now time to book your exam. The starting point, https aws.amazon.com slash training. So let's start right now. Alright, so this is the landing page of aws.amazon.com slash training. In order to continue, just click on get started. Now, if you don't have an account on the AWS training page, you'll have to create one now. I will click on certification. 
and now I will just click on go to your account. Clicking on this one will just redirect me to certmetrics.com. From here only single step, schedule new exam and your exam is the first one uh, on the list. So AWS certified cloud practitioner exam. So PSI or, or person view, which either of the two suits you best. Good luck with your exam. Hello and again welcome to AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Training Bootcamp. In this first section of the course I would like to provide you a brief overview on the course content so that you can understand more what topics are covered in each of the course modules. We will also briefly touch on recommended study guidelines so we will talk about the AWS white papers. We will start with module 1 the course introduction and talk about the AWS certifications currently available, an overview and also recommended path if you choose to go for multiple AWS certifications. Very important we will talk about next about the um, AWS certified cloud practitioner official exam blueprint. So what is the, the format of the exam and what are the expectations from AWS side when you will sit the real exam. We will also create an AWS free tier account for you so that, so that you can practice every single topic in the course. And we will wrap up this module, module 1, by installing some software on your Mac on, and also Windows operating system. Now we will continue with downloading the course slides and white papers. So just after module 1, you can download all 400 plus course slides and also the white paper, so the recommended reading. And why is this important? And I will show you right now. Also download useful files, code and, uh, and AWS policies that we will use throughout the course. So now let's get back to AWS white papers. Alright, so I'm now on AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner official exam page. The important fact, exam resources. If you just click on download the exam guide, you'll be provided this specific document. And again, scrolling down to exam preparation, you have here a list of AWS white papers that you should read before sitting the exam. Now the first one, Overview of Amazon Web Services White Paper. The recommended reading addiction is from April 2017. And if you click on White Paper, you'll be provided the December 2018 White Paper. And why is this important is because this White Paper is 88 pages long. Now if you take a look of the Overview of Amazon Web Services April 2017 White Paper, you'll see that this one has 48 pages long. So I just assume that you'd uh, just want to read what is needed for the exam and not more than that so that your time is really uh, efficiently used. So my advice is that you go into the download section of this specific uh, section just between uh, module 1 and module 2 in the course and download the white papers as they are highlighted in the official exam guide. Alright, so now let's just continue. Next is Module 2, AWS Cloud Introduction. So we will talk about cloud computing, what is cloud computing, also the advantages of AWS Cloud Computing, and we will move next to AWS Global Infrastructure, Regions, Availability Zones, and Edge Locations. We will wrap up Module 2 after talking about AWS Management Interfaces. So really, how can we interact with the AWS Cloud Platform through Management Console, CLI, SDKs? But anyway, we will talk more in that specific module. Module 3, AWS Services High-Level Overview. This module covers a high-level overview on most important AWS services. And this is based on AWS White Paper Overview of Amazon Web Services April 2017, as it is presented in the recommended reading list. It may seem dry, it is PowerPoint-based, but it is what it is, and it is important for the Cloud Practitioner exam. It is easy to consume, though, so sections vary in length between one and up to around five minutes in general so um, you may just uh, mix this module so sections in this module with other sections in the course if you just i don't know think it would be better for you but please do not skip it it is important for the exam content is covered by category as it is available in aws management console so some examples now compute services story services database services networking and content delivery and more than that as you will see in this module module three now continuing on with module 4, AWS Core Services, the backbone. Now in this module, we literally deep dive into AWS and I believe you will like it really, really much. For every topic covered, we will first lay down the foundation from a theoretical perspective 
and then move on to AWS Management Console or the CLI, so command line interface for hands-on labs. We will first create a billing alarm in order to monitor our potential spending in AWS and continue with AWS core services like the following. So Identity and Access Management or IAM, Virtual Private Cloud or VPC, Elastic Compute Cloud EC2, Security Groups, Elastic Block Store or EBS, and wrap up module 4, the core services module, with simple storage service or Amazon S3. Module 5, AWS Key Services, following the same approach as module 4, first understanding the technology, what it does, what problem does it solve and why it was even invented. And of course, then we move on to hands-on labs. AWS Key Services covered in this module, Route 53, AWS CloudFront, Application Load Balancers, and also auto scaling, relational database service or RDS, AWS Lambda, AWS Elastic Beanstalk, CloudFormation, and also simple notification service or SNS and CloudWatch. In module 4 and module 5, we also cover information related to billing and pricing. So, module 6 will just wrap up the discussion around billing and pricing. We will start with fundamentals of pricing, cost optimization through EC2 reservations, AWS cost calculators, AWS Trusted Advisor. And we will also talk about the AWS support plans as indeed these type of questions appear in the exam. We will move on to module 7, security in AWS. It is going to be a pretty short module, but it is covering important information for the exam. So we will start with an introduction to AWS security and talk about also the AWS web or web application firewall, shield and also the firewall manager. We will wrap up this module with AWS inspector. Module 8, AWS Architecture Best Practices. This module is based on AWS White Paper, Architecting for the Cloud, AWS Best Practices, and I'm referring to the February 2016 edition. This module covers AWS Best Practices from the architecture perspective. So topics covered in this module include, for example, design principles as related to the scalability, automation, loose coupling, and more than that. Module 9, AWS Account Cleanup. In this section, we will clean up your AWS account. So with AWS, you pay as you use the service. When the service is not being used, you will pay nothing. So we will delete resources and stop every running AWS service in your AWS account so that we will not get charged for nothing. Right, Module 10, Final Exam Tests. It is time to test your knowledge and potentially learn even more. Two full practice tests in this module, 65 questions, each of the tests, 100 minutes in order to complete that and an 80% passing score. Anyway, in the exam you'll have like a 70 something, 70 uh, in the real exam passing score and I'd like to wish you good luck. We will wrap up the course after we cover exam booking in module 11. So we will talk about what portal to use, so where to authenticate and do what, what is the exam code. What are the options? And you will see that you have two options like PSI or Person View Exam Test Centers. So thank you and see you in the next section.